In a realm where the enigmatic witches exist, harnessing unfathomable powers, society had labeled them as the embodiment of demons, enter our protagonist, Chen Yen, a modern engineer thrust into the depths of a medieval era, inhabiting the body of a noble prince. Driven by an unyielding determination, Chen Yen resolved to unite cutting-edge industrial advancements with the mystical prowess of the witches, envisioning a formidable realm and a witch harem. The tale commences with a peculiar sensation, Chen Yen felt a pair of hands beckoned and whispered into Chen Yan's ears, waking up him from slumber. Wake up, your highness. Groggily, he pried his eyes open, confronted by a bewildering haze of confusion. Perched upon a chilling, metallic seat, in his very own eye, sees a strange landscape, small wooden and brick buildings, suddenly, a torrent of memories flooded his consciousness, connecting the dots with a startling revelation, he now inhabited the body of Roland Wimbledon, the fourth prince hailing from the illustrious Grey Castle. Ushered into a world where the proclamation of the fight for the throne decree loomed large a decree devised by Roland's own father, signifying a perilous struggle to determine the rightful heir to the kingdom's coveted throne. In Grey Castle, the monarch, Roland's father, devised a momentous challenge to ascertain the worthiness of his five offspring as potential heirs. Each of them was entrusted with a distinct territory, where they would undertake the arduous task of governance for a span of five years. With this crucible of rule, the monarch will choose the successor. Embracing his new identity as Roland, our protagonist soon realized that this was no mere real-time strategy video game. The playing field was far from level, as the initial conditions and circumstances for each contender were not equal. And thus, we are introduced to Roland's siblings, the eldest prince, endowed with unparalleled martial prowess, stands as a towering figure of physical strength, yet oftentimes his brawn surpasses his wit, earning him the reputation of a muscle-headed warrior. The second prince, on the other hand, possesses boundless wealth and resources, granting him a position of immense influence. However, beneath his opulent facade lurks a sinister nature, weaving a web of deceit and cunning that sets him apart from his siblings. The third princess emerges as a formidable force, her military acumen and commanding presence surpassing all expectations. With an untamed ferocity burning within her, she is a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield, leaving no room for weakness or compromise. The youngest princess radiates brilliance and intellect. Her mind is a wellspring of knowledge and astuteness. Lastly, we encounter Roland, the fourth prince, whose character has embraced a life of indulgence and recklessness. Who loves courting death, he finds solace in the pursuit of pleasure, leaving many to question his commitment and capability to seize the throne. He found himself assigned to a desolate border town, a place so forsaken that even a bird would refuse to relieve itself there. It was an underdeveloped, sparsely populated town plagued by poverty, where excrement was carelessly strewn about. Roland instinctively covered his head, fully grasping the wretchedness of his predicament. Before he could complete his thoughts, elderly man implored Roland to initiate the execution. Taking a survey of his surroundings, Roland noticed a gathering of people in the central square, all fixated on a particular spot. It was the gallows, a medieval contraption reserved for the punishment of criminals. A figure wearing a grimy gray shirt and a hemp robe, hands bound behind her back, was unmistakably female with her slender frame, raised chest, and flowing linen hair, billowing in the wind. Roland's mind recoiled at the inhumanity of the situation, struggling to fathom how anyone could believe in such absurdity. Release that witch. Roland's voice reverberated with conviction, shocking his minister, his guards, and the town's residents. In an attempt to downplay his outburst, Roland feigned fatigue, suggesting a postponement of the execution to another day. Unexpectedly, his trusted knight, Carter, stepped forward, vehemently opposing Roland's decision. With the witch's identity already confirmed, Carter argued that she must be put to death, fearing that other witches might attempt a rescue. Roland couldn't help but internally scoff at the sight of a knight, whose arm dwarfed the torso of an average person, cowering before girls half his size. Resolute in his stance, Roland turned away, declaring that it would be wiser to lure out more witches, enabling them to capture them all at once. Without further explanation, he retreated to his dilapidated castle, closing the door behind him and releasing a weary sigh. It dawned on him that he must have died from overworking and been transported to this unfamiliar world. 
With time, Roland managed to overcome his initial fear of the unknown, took a deep breath, and accepted his identity in this new world. Eager to uncover more about this mysterious world, Roland embarked on a quest for knowledge. Later that day, accompanied by Carter, his trusted chief knight, Roland descended the stairs of the border town's prison, all the while, Carter persistently warned of the peril posed by a witch. However, Roland couldn't resist taunting his own knight, playfully questioning how the formidable Carter could possibly be afraid of a mere girl, eventually, they reached the lower level of the prison. Within a cramped cell enclosed by sturdy metal bars, a young woman huddled in a corner, clad in the same worn and tattered gray shirt. As she stood up and locked eyes with Roland, he felt a blush creeping onto his cheeks. The young lady possessed a captivating beauty, her eyes a serene shade of light blue, resembling a calm and undisturbed lake. No trace of fear, anger, or hatred tainted her gaze. Summoning the courage to approach her, Roland requested that she come closer, eager for a closer examination. However, Carter swiftly positioned himself in front of Roland, adamantly forbidding the girl from drawing near. He reiterated his warnings about the inherent danger of a witch. Unperturbed, Roland tapped Carter on the shoulder, urging him to calm down. Turning his attention back to the young woman, Roland kindly asked to hear her story. With a soft voice, she introduced herself as Anna. She explained that her father had worked in the local mine, which tragically collapsed, leaving him trapped inside. Seizing the opportunity, a fellow miner attempted to steal the valuables from her father's possession. However, this act of greed was witnessed by a neighboring couple. In a fit of rage, the thief brandished a pickaxe, assaulting the couple. But just as he sought to deliver a fatal blow, Anna's witch abilities wakened, and she unleashed a deadly power, incinerating the thief, they proceeded to rescue Anna's father from the collapsed mine, and in a desperate plea, Anna begged the neighbor not to report her as a witch. Roland inquired how she ended up here and it was revealed that her own father had reported her to the authorities. Carter, upon hearing Anna's confession, once again implored Roland to carry out her execution. Yet, Roland's curiosity was piqued, and he remained intrigued by the extent of the witch's powers. Anna's reaction was unexpected. She burst into laughter, mocking Roland and questioning his desire to witness the so-called powers of the devil. Undeterred, Roland stood firm and insisted on witnessing her abilities firsthand. Anna wore a locket that supposedly contained and seal of a witch's power. Surprised by Roland's audacity, she stared directly into his eyes and warned him that his curiosity might lead to his demise. Before Anna could finish her sentence, Roland reached out and forcefully tore the locket apart. The bewildered expression on Anna's face mirrored her astonishment as Roland discarded the broken locket, urging her to demonstrate her power once more. Within seconds, the cell filled with warmth as flames ignited beneath Anna's bare feet. Bursting forth in a dazzling display of light, the sight left Roland in awe. He struggled to comprehend what he was witnessing, was it chemistry, advanced technology, or true magic? Anna, now standing before the melted metal bars, began to burn the robe still bound behind her back. She raised her hand and approached Roland step by step. At that moment, the flames dissipated, leaving behind only smoke and the scent of burnt metal. Roland finally confirmed the existence of magic in this world. He felt no fear or trepidation, instead, he was filled with boundless excitement, contemplating the myriad possibilities that Anna's powers held, steam engines, steel smelting, iron casting, and the creation of modern tools. Anna gazed at him, asserting that she had satisfied his curiosity and implored him to end her life. Observing the vulnerable yet resilient girl, scarcely clothed, Roland removed his jacket and placed it over Anna's shoulders. Extending his hands, he confidently announced his decision to employ her. Having witnessed Anna's extraordinary power, Roland's mind raced, contemplating the second law of thermodynamics, which stated that the entropy of the universe would always increase over time in an isolated system. However, in this world infused with magic, such problems could easily be overcome. Even more impressive than the invention of the perpetual motion machine, Roland's decision to hire a witch left Barov in a state of utter shock. Unwilling to provide a detailed explanation, Roland immediately instructed Barov to draft an employment contract and arrange living quarters for Anna. 
As they left the prison, the minister persisted in trying to convince Roland of the dangers posed by witches, warning him about the risks involved. Roland interrupted the minister, expressing his view that witches were not demons or monsters. He pointed out their lack of resources, money, and an army, and emphasized the need for witches to compete with his siblings. Roland urged people to abandon their prejudice against witches. The minister was astounded by Roland's impassioned speech. Roland then requested that the minister bring Anna to see him. Meanwhile, Anna was being attended to by two maids who bathed and dressed her in a work outfit. Anna felt a bit shy upon seeing the unfamiliar attire, but she resolved to put it on. Outside the residence, a maid guided Anna toward Roland. Roland and Carter stood before a wooden shack they had built for Anna to practice smelting. Shortly thereafter, Anna arrived, clad in her new outfit. As Roland beheld Anna with her long, silky hair and radiant appearance, a beautiful bloom in his eyes, he felt a slight blush creeping onto his cheeks. Roland was certain he had made the right decision. He deemed the typical worker's outfit too mundane and the magician's robes too cumbersome, but the maid's uniform was perfect for Anna. Curious about why Roland was treating her so well and going as far as signing a contract with her, memories flashed through Anna's mind, reminding her of how terribly she had been treated after others discovered she was a witch. Roland extended his hand once again, confidently stating his disbelief in such nonsense. He expressed his trust in Anna and her abilities. Something ignited within Anna's gaze as she placed her hand atop Roland's, promising to assist him and learn how to control and harness her powers. Inside the wooden shack, steam filled the room as Anna practiced controlling her abilities. With each failure, flames would erupt from her feet, expanding and enveloping her entire body. Suddenly, in a mishap, Anna lost control of the fire, causing her clothes to be singed once again. Just then, a loud knock resounded, followed by Carter and the minister sprinting towards the shack, reporting the presence of demonic beasts as discovered by a patrolling squad. Everyone, including Anna, was filled with shock and concern. However, Roland remained perplexed, questioning, what are demonic beasts? From now on, we will refer to the minister by his real name, Barkov frankly opened the door and reported to Roland informing him, the month of the demon is coming soon. The month of demon? Roland thought for a moment, slowly remembering this phrase, but still confused, Roland looked towards Anna, Anna seemed frightened, and from the look of her, Roland recognized the seriousness of the situation. Barkov then explained that the month of the demon occurs during winter time after the first snowfall. The sun would become faint and dim, then the gates connected to hell within the mountain will then open. Unfortunately, the border town does not have the capability to defend, thus the residents of the border town must migrate to the nearest stronghold, which is the Changdu stronghold. Barkov also reassured Roland that his safety will always be a priority. Roland asked Barkov if he have seen the gate of hell before? Barkov frankly replied, it's impossible for an ordinary person to see it, the Long G mountain is impossible to climb over, and going near the mountain will also be influenced by the evil aura, causing nausea and potentially making a man goes mad and lose its consciousness. Unless. Barkov paused. Roland asked him to go on, Barkov looked at Anna then said, unless that person is a witch, only witches can see the gate of hell, because they are already infected. After hearing what Barkov said, Roland wasn't pleasant but continued asking about the demonic beast. Because this was also the first time Barkov had been to the border town, he had not seen any demonic beasts before and thus can't answer most of Roland's questions. After gathering the basic info, Roland started to organize his thoughts, if the residents here need to migrate every year, then it's impossible for the town to grow. Since Changgu stronghold are able to defend against the demonic beast, that means the beasts can be defeated, since they are not invincible, why can't we defeat them here in the border town? Barkov started sweating nervously and frankly told Roland unlike Changji E stronghold, we don't have the big tall walls or the elite troops guided by Duke Ryan. Roland frowned his brows and sneered finally understanding that the border town was built at this exact location for one sole purpose only, that is to be used as an alarm warning the stronghold. If Roland wanted to properly develop the border town, he must have his roots here, he can ignore all obstacles, but he needs the people to stay here. He then ordered Barkov to bring all the local guards, hunters, and farmers to him. Roland added a few conditions, first, 
they must have been living here for more than five years, too, prefer those who have experienced the month of demon, or have fought against the demonic beasts before. After issuing the order, Roland and Anna went to the backyard garden to enjoy some dessert. This was the first time Anna had ever had such an exquisite cake, while Anna is slowly and carefully chewing on the cake, Roland asked Anna to tell him more about the month of the demon. Anna lowered her brow and slowly explained what an average peasant experience is like during this terrifying time. People like Anna and her father would have to start to migrate towards the stronghold transporting their yearly harvest to exchange for food and gold, the stronghold will set up a temporary refugee camp for them to stay in, the length of the demon month may vary, some lasting as long as four months. But the officials in the stronghold told them their harvest is only enough for three months of supplies. Because of the lack of food and supplies, a lot of bullying occurred where weaker people's food would be forcefully taken away, and these people couldn't make it, thus dying. Anna started to tear up, seeing that. Roland reckoned that it must have been very difficult for her. Since her father, before Roland could finish his sentence, Anna told him, his father was still protective of her during that time, a moment of silence between the two. Moments later, Anna lightly said, it was 25 gold, referring to the gold offered as a reward reporting a witch, she then followed up by saying, her father just wanted to continue living. Upon hearing what Anna said, Roland was furious, as he slammed the table, and promised Anna, what she said will never happen here in the border town ever again. He slowly walked towards his office and demanded to see Barkov. Alongside Barkov, there were three men, two of them were guards, and one local hunter, the two guards are the patrol captain in charge of the fire beacon every year. Alarming nearby stronghold about the attack of the demonic beasts, and this hunter, a tall muscular man with blue hair and a giant scar across his face claimed not only he have fought a demonic beast before, but he has also slain two of them. Roland nodded his head and told the three men to introduce themselves one by one. The younger guard was extremely nervous when talking to Roland, probably the first time seeing a prince up close, he stuttered as he spoke, telling Roland that when it started to snow, they will light up the fire beacon in the tower in the north side mine when they see the demonic beast surge past the forest, then sprint back using a secret passway. Roland pointed to the other guard, asking him from now on, he will be the one answering the questions. Asking how they look and whether they can be killed. The other guard was also nervous, seemingly sweating coming out of his helmet but at least he didn't stutter. He then replied by telling Roland that the demonic beasts are just normal animals that were infected by the evil aura, making them unusually mad and aggressive, but they can still be killed, the cavalry team from the Changu stronghold would always be sent out to clear out some of the remnants. Suddenly the hunter stumped his feet kneeling on one of his knees and shouting, they are nothing formidable, he grinned as he proudly said he had killed two demonic beasts before. Even Roland was astonished by the aura given out by the hunter well over seven feet tall. Barkov on Roland's side introduced the hunter, his name is Axe, and the reason why he is this tall is that there's a rumor saying that he possesses the bloodline of the Majin giants. Axe then talked about the two demonic beasts he killed, one was a wild boar species and the other was a wolf species, which can be defined by its origin before being infected by the evil aura, the infected species will gain traits that empower them which makes them quite difficult to deal with, but they are not the real problem, the real problem is the mixed species, as Axe lifted his shirt and showed a massive wound ranged from his shoulders down to his lower torso, covering a quarter of his body. These mixed species are not only ferocious, but they also hold some level of intelligence. Axe encountered one before and was extremely lucky to survive by jumping into the nearby river before he fainted. After getting all the information he needed, Roland stood up and told everyone that he had decided to stay at the border town. Carter and Barkov are shocked, and Carter once again activated his chatterbox, spitting words at the speed of light, informing Roland this decision is too dangerous, he cannot let Roland put himself in such great danger. Roland stopped him, asking what if Roland give him a wall. Carter got a little angry and told Roland to not fool around, building a wall in less than four months is an impossible task. Roland understands it's difficult to let Carter believe what he said, he simply told Carter, don't conclude so quickly, if he doesn't see a reliable wall by the end of three months, he will retreat to the stronghold. After hearing Roland's response, Carter finally rests assured kneeling on the ground and oath his life to protect Roland. Here we are, at the Baishuay port in the Grey Castle, introducing a woman, as a cool ocean breeze blew past her hair, as the sea beats against the shore, a woman wearing an eye patch, dressing like a pirate from One Piece, 
asking his men about the situation of her fleet. The subordinate replied telling her the fleet should return in three days. This assertive woman is Garcia Wimbledon, the third child of the king from the Grey Castle, she has been training and setting up her fleet years before the king announced the provision, her temperament and beauty do not affect her intelligence, training her army long before the provision showed how wise her foresight was. She was able to quickly build up her army with elite soldiers, experienced sailors, and plenty of wealth from the long years of sea exploration. Making her one step before her fellow brothers and sister. Garcia had an evil plan ruled out, sending spies to her siblings and finding an opportunity to assassinate them, it was no surprise that the three siblings were able to find out the spy and killed them, but she was surprised how her useless fourth brother was able to live after swallowing a poison pill. She got a letter from the spy indicating that she saw Roland swallow the poison pill in front of her very own eyes. Here in someone's memory, we see Anna sitting on a field surrounded by goats, and pastor-dressed men walking towards Anna, asking what book Anna is currently reading, this man is Anna's teacher, his name is Carl Van Bait. Then, the memory shattered into pieces like a mirror. Followed by Carl in a crowd, witnessing the hanging of Anna, this caused massive anxiety and stress, and Carl is tortured by these scenes every day, slowly deteriorating his mind. Carl wakes up, in his office, sweat-soaked his clothes. We found out that the reason why he is in this small border town is that the officials at Grey Castle substituted out the stone materials out of greed, causing a new theater building to collapse, causing more than three dozen deaths. They made the association where Carl worked in taking the blame, Carl's eyes turning red, holding his fist tight, a flame of hatred burning through his body, wondering why is a pure soul like Anna is hanged. In the story, Roland told Barkov to swap out Anna with a death penalty criminal to trick the residents that it was Anna whom Roland hanged, since they had the criminal mouth stuffed and face covered, no one knew Anna is still alive, including Carl, who thinks that Anna is dead. Back to the story. These terrible humans are out there dancing in money and fulfilling their greed. Carl looks out the window disappointed in this kingdom rotting at its core, filled with inequality, heavy taxation, greedy officials who don't value the lives of its citizens, sending an innocent girl onto the gallows, he questions God, what is true evil? And to knock knock knock, Carl opened the door and sees a little girl crying. The girl is upset and worried, she feels something wrong with her body, and she is afraid that she will end up like Anna, shivering in fear and doesn't know what to do. Something clicked in Carl's head, he frowned his brow, looked at the little girl in her eyes and said he will protect her then patted her on the head. Carl walks on the street, regretting not standing up when his association was blamed, regretting not standing up when Anna is hanged, he cannot have the same thing happen to Nanawa, the name of the little girl we saw earlier. Carl broke his line of thought when he heard someone yelling behind him. He turns around and sees a bunch of people gathering in front of the billboard, Many of them were laughing, sounded like they have just heard the best joke in their life. It was a work notice sent out by Roland, it was a piece of recruitment information, looking for people to build a wall, looking for positions like stone grinders, craftsmen, handymen, and stonemasons. Offering them wages from 12 bronze a day to an astonishing one gold per month. Carl was shocked when he sees the last line of the recruitment, it wrote, people who showed excellence will be awarded the position of the official. Carl thought of a rumor passed around in the border town, which is that Roland has a special personality and extremely dislikes the Holy Church. He recalls what he saw during the execution, Roland showed unwillingness to hang Anna, maybe Roland has a different outlook on witches, this is Carl's last and only hope. On the other side, Carter and Roland are walking and examining the walls, Carter asked Roland how high he wants to build the wall and Roland said he wants the wall to be at least, side note I've converted the measurement from Chinese foot to standardized measurement which is 5 meters tall and 2 meters wide, big enough for 4 people to walk in together. Carter briefly thought about the blueprint of the wall, calculating how long he needs, Carter said, even with the men Roland gave him, he can only finish the project during the next year's month of the demon. The main problem is to ensure the stability of the wall, the stones must be picked and grounded properly. Roland didn't explain much, but said, cement will surprise Carter. Carter wondered what is a cement. Moments later, Carter and Roland arrive at the structure Roland recently built, which is the cement burning room. Roland thinks in his head, knowing the raw material to produce cement is common, and he can find everything in the border town, but the temperature is a crucial step. Roland doesn't remember the exact temperature, and no tools or machines to control the temperature, but 
Before Roland finished his line of thought, the door opens, and heat and steam poured out of the door, Roland told Carter to stay put. Roland walked towards the door, and it stood behind the door, full of specks of dust on her face, and fully naked, Roland handed her his robe and asked Anna how is everything, Anna didn't let Roland down, and showed Roland the product. It's a pile of grey dust, which looks like cement powder, but it still needs to be tested. Anna is unfamiliar with this material. Asking what use it has, Roland listed many uses for cement, like building houses, building bridges, and how a cement house can protect people from the cold and rain, or snow, and is much more durable compared to the houses that average people live in. Complimented Anna for creating such amazing material. Moments later Roland showed his product to Carter and Anna. Carter was amazed by the product and tried to lift the cement, also trying to pry open the crack. After testing the strength of the cement, Roland told Anna and Carter his ambition, he wants to tell the rest of the kingdom that witches are truly the best waifu. Roland moved on to his actual project. After days of hard work, Anna produced many bags of cement dust, alongside the people Roland have recruited, and the project finally on the right track. Roland himself even went out lowering his status to show the residents how to dig trenches, which raised the morale among the workers, and everyone is working very hard. Although workers are motivated, the project is progressing very slowly and the trenches looked worse than a sewer, although Roland used to be an engineer, but not a civil engineer, and he has no idea what to do now. This gives Roland a headache, scratching his head, meanwhile, Barkov came to report a stonemason was recruited, who used to work at the Grey Castle Stonemason Association. Roland recalls it was a famous association, but got disbanded, needless to say, he told Barkov to bring the stonemason to see him. It was later in the afternoon, and Roland have returned to his office, sitting on his side is Anna, she is smiling while reading a book, that frame, looked like a work of art in Roland's eye. Roland was dazed, but soon got interrupted by the voice of Carter, telling Roland that the stonemason is there. While the stonemason was showing his respect, Roland cut him off and got straight to the point, seconds later, the stonemason looked up and saw Anna, he was shocked, and can't believe his eyes, calling Anna by her name, this made Carter and Roland stoned, and extremely nervous. Anna closed the book and looked up after hearing someone calling her, Roland screamed telling Carter to block the door and don't let Carl run away. Carter dashed towards the door, putting both his hands out ready to tackle Carl. Carl suddenly kneeled, still unexpected to see Anna, Carl then started repetitively apologizing to Anna but was very thankful to see Anna is alive. From the look of Carl, Roland is at ease, knowing this person is unlikely to harm Anna, Anna stood up, looking worried, explaining and introducing Carl as her teacher. A few minutes later, Carl calmed down, Roland then asked who Carl is. Carl wiped his tear and followed by introducing himself and how he became Anna's teacher. He also looked into Roland's eye telling him, although he doesn't know why Roland saved a witch, even if it's because Roland wants Anna to serve him on his bed as a concubine it's still better than killing her. Meanwhile, Carl is also thinking to himself, although he doesn't know what Roland truly wants, at least the rumor is right, if he can also send Nanoa as his concubine, Nanoa will also be safe. He then introduced Nanoa, saying she is also a cute and adorable girl, wondering if Roland can also accept her as a concubine. Carl misunderstood Roland's intention to protect the witches, Roland continued by telling Carl, he will call in to see Nanoa if she is really a witch, but he cannot take her away from her original family especially when there's no trace of actual threat from her family, he followed up by telling Carl he misunderstood him, the reason he saved Anna is not what he thought to be, Roland was happy to know another witch is in his town, hoping to not let Carl misunderstood him, Roland decided to tell Carl the real truth. Roland thinks the shenanigan talks claiming witches have the evil power of the devil is nothing but nonsense, Roland will protect them at all costs as long as the witches don't commit any crimes. Roland then brings the conversation back regarding the construction of the walls, although Carl is still a bit speculative, he quickly puts his thought aside, understanding Roland's idea to build a wall to defend against the demonic beasts, Carl then gave some professional advice about the project, so the project begins and Carl is assigned as the leader of the project. The next morning, in the back garden, Roland sat there with a glass of alcohol in his hand, Carter and a young girl slowly approaches, this is Nanoa, she seemed nervous, holding her hands tight on her dress, biting her lips, and shivered as she slowly approaches Roland, looking at Roland with her big crystal eyes, filled with fogs in her eye, asking if she was going to die. 
Nanawa was indeed adorable, Roland looking at her, trying to hold his laughter comforting her that she is not going to die, Anna is living well too, Roland then introduced himself as the fourth prince, Roland Wimbledon, asking Nanawa to introduce herself, realizing she is not going to die, her eyes sparked and fulfilled with happiness, she gladly introduced herself, she is Nanawa Pine, then immediately ran past Roland holding Anna's hand, and started chit-chatting, completely ignoring Roland. Roland took a sip out of his drink and watching the two girls, thinking to himself, Anna is only 17 years old right now, how beautiful will she grow up to be? Seeing the conversation slowly coming to an end, Roland interrupted the two girls, asking Nanawa about her power, after hearing the question, Nanawa got scared again, lowering her voice as she asked if Roland will hang her. Roland assured her that he will not do such a thing, only heinous criminals will be hanged, and he will never do a such cruel thing to an adorable girl like Nanawa, Nanawa nodded, as she continued explaining that she heard the rumor saying the witches are cursed after affected by the devil, but she had never seen a devil before, seeing Nanawa is in a semi-depressed mood, Anna walked up and patted Nanawa, comforting her. Nanawa calmed down and started explaining what happened, she said, about a week ago, she had seen a little bird gets injured and wanted to help the bird, then all of a sudden something came out of her hands, it was in a liquid form, surrounded the bird, next thing she remembers, the bird is all healed up. After hearing what Nanawa said, Roland's heart skipped a beat, he understands the importance of Nanawa's power, in a time where there's no modern medicine, no antibiotics, and no life support, a small wound can lead to infection and later death, Roland might have just found an amazing treasure. Roland immediately ordered Carter to bring him a live chicken, Roland then asked Nanawa, whether she still thinks her power is still evil after knowing her ability to heal animals, Nanawa looked up and told Roland her teacher said witches can do things ordinary people can't do, but it's a trap set by the devil, then followed up saying while holding three fingers up, she swears that she had never seen a devil. Roland stated that he believes everything Nanawa said, but the devil thing is nothing but a lie told by the holy church, and her teacher is also a victim, deceived by these lies. Nanawa asked why would the church lie to its people? Roland shook his head, as he understands how religion works back on earth, a similar thing happened in history as well, there isn't a proper answer, just purely for one's sole benefit, moments later, we heard Nanawa holding her hands together, as her face turns red, she lightly said your highness, please be gentle, it will hurt, Roland smiled then replied it's alright, it will be done in a quick moment. Hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. Nanawa nervously whispered to Roland, please be gentle, I don't want it to be painful. Roland grinned and replied, don't worry, it'll be over very quickly, meanwhile, poor Carter was struggling to hold on to a screaming chicken that was flapping its wings like crazy. It was as if the chicken was auditioning for a role in a horror movie. As Roland began to make his move, Nanawa clenched her teeth, preparing for the worst. But just as she was about to scream, the chicken let out a blood-curdling screech with its feather flying everywhere. Nanawa stretched out her tiny arms toward the injured chicken, using her special powers to heal it. Within seconds, the chicken went from looking like a sad sack of feathers to being so energetic, it seemed like it was on steroids. The little guy was bouncing around like it wasn't a chicken, but a majestic eagle soaring through the skies. Hours had passed, and the poor chicken had been put through the ringer with various tests and procedures. Its little body was now cold and lifeless, cradled gently in Carter's warm arms, as Roland concluded that Nanawa's ability can recover damaged parts of the body, but her power can not grow out a new limb, but a limb that has been reattached to the body can be healed completely, nor can she bring the dead back to life. After the conclusion was reached, Roland ordered Carter to take the chicken back to the kitchen. Nanawa stood off to the side, tears streaming down her face. She bit her lip, trying to hold back her emotions after witnessing so much today. Roland noticed that Nanawa was still feeling a bit down after the earlier events, so he had an idea to cheer her up. He invited her to a delightful picnic, Nanawa's eyes lit up with excitement as she saw the table overflowing with delicious dishes. Full of various desserts as she took a seat at the table, Nanawa couldn't help but feel like all the sadness from earlier had vanished into thin air. She was surrounded by good food, good company, and good vibes. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, Carter escorted Nanawa out of the residence. Nanawa was beaming with joy and even waved goodbye to Roland, promising to see him again tomorrow. Anna, who was standing beside Roland, couldn't help but wonder why he didn't try to convince Nanawa to stay. After all, she was a fellow witch. 
Roland looked towards Nanoa as she walked away, a small smile playing on his lips. Nanoa still has her family, he said softly to Anna. For now, they don't know about her powers. Anna looked down at her feet, as she knew how difficult it was to keep one's witch abilities a secret from loved ones, but the moment they knew, they will always turn in the witch to the holy church, it's only a matter of time. Roland noticed that Anna seemed a little down, so he asked if she missed her father. Without hesitation, Anna declared that she didn't. Roland felt a pang of sadness at the thought, biting his lips unsure of what to say next, Roland quickly changed the topic. From now on, Nanoa will be coming over often, he said. Hopefully every day. I have the intention of training her powers. Roland stood tall and spoke with a determined tone. I promise you, Anna, that as long as I'm here, all witches will be treated equally and live like normal people, he declared. I know we can make this day come, and I won't rest until we do. Ever since Carl took over the project of building the wall, Roland found himself with more free time on his hands. He spent his afternoon sipping tea with Anna and Nanoa, watching as they practiced their magical abilities and honed their skills. At first, Roland felt a bit guilty about not being more involved in the wall project, but as he watched Carl and his team work tirelessly day after day, he realized that he could trust them to get the job done. Barev barged into Roland's office in a state of panic. We've got a big problem, your highness, he exclaimed, sweat beating on his bald forehead. We've been spending way too much money on recruiting handymen and craftsmen. Our finances are running dangerously low. Roland leaned back in his chair can't help but feel helpless, as he is also poor, scratching his head, desperately trying to find an idea. As Barov observed the fourth prince, he couldn't help but marvel at how much Roland had changed since their time at the Grey Castle. Back then, Roland was nothing but a notorious playboy with a terrible reputation and no sense of being a noble. Barov had only come to this small border town because the king had promised him the position of official finance minister. However, when Roland arrived in the town, he started offending every noble he came across, and people would often ridicule him. But everything changed when Roland saved that witch. Barov couldn't believe how much Roland had transformed since then. He was a different person altogether. Roland was so focused on solving the town's financial problems that he didn't notice the bewildered expression on Barov's face. After a few moments of silence, Roland explained that he had been studying the town's problems and had come up with a plan to improve the income. Barov was still in shock, but he realized that Roland was serious and had a genuine desire to help the people of the town. As Roland continued to explain his plan, Barov couldn't help but wonder if Roland was possessed by a devil. But then he remembered the time when Roland had touched a locket that has the power to disperse any demonic power within him. As they walked through the empty pier, the ambassador couldn't help but shake his head in disappointment. Looks like the border town is still struggling, he muttered to his secretary. But their surprise grew as they noticed the lack of ore in the yard. Where have all the shipments gone, the secretary wondered aloud. Their curiosity was piqued and they decided to pay a visit to Roland in his castle. As they made their way there, they speculated whether the border town had found a new trading partner. The ambassador couldn't help but feel a little uneasy about the situation. He had planned to monopolize the trading route, but with the fourth prince's recent actions, it seemed that his plans would no longer be successful. As they approached the front gate of the border town, the ambassador couldn't help but feel a sense of apprehension. Will the fourth prince surprise him? Roland invited the ambassador to a welcome dinner, but instead of the usual silverware, they were presented with two wooden sticks. The ambassador was a bit confused, never having used chopsticks before, and watched as Roland deftly picked up his food with ease. Trying to copy him, the ambassador focused heavily on trying to pick up a cherry tomato, but just as he was about to succeed, Roland suddenly asked him a question, causing the ambassador to jump and launch the tomato high up in the air. Roland then asked the ambassador what he thinks about the chopsticks, as chopsticks are much easier to obtain than silverware, and his people no longer have to worry about diseases entering their mouths due to them always eating by grabbing the food. The ambassador couldn't help but feel impressed by the fourth prince's intelligence. 
Roland continued by telling the ambassador due to a cave-in, they can't harvest anything from the mines until the next year. The ambassador followed by asking what about the harvest from the past two months. Roland told him that the harvest is not enough to feed his people and reminded the ambassador what happened during the month of the demon two years ago. Roland leaned forward and looked directly at the ambassador, his eyes filled with conviction. We need to find a better solution, he declared. We can't keep relying on the same old methods that have failed us in the past. The ambassador neither agreed nor declined, but instead dished out a half-baked plan. He suggested that the noble families lend an extra month's worth of food, and Roland's people could pay them back slowly next year. Roland was not having it. He shook his head in disappointment and exclaimed, the Willow Town was willing to use their gold royals to purchase anything, including Roland's ores, while also selling food at market value. Roland gave the ambassador a piece of his mind. He gave the ambassador a once-over and said, I don't think you have any authority to make decisions for the noble families. The ambassador was at a loss for words, his mind racing with memories of his father. He had tried to convince his father that the fourth prince will not use ores for grains and bread and they shouldn't rip them off. But his father had just sneered and called the fourth prince a pig, saying he understands nothing. Roland had hit the nail on the head. The ambassador couldn't even convince his own father, let alone the other five families. But he wasn't going to let Roland walk away without a fight. He raised three fingers and offered a price even higher than what the Willow Town had offered. He pleaded with Roland. Let me go back to Changu stronghold and try to convince the other families. I'll bring a new agreement back with me. But as he spoke, his voice trailed off, and he seemed less confident by the second. It was as if he knew deep down that he was fighting a losing battle. The ambassador was still trying to convince Roland to stick with Changu stronghold, the Willow Town is too far away, especially during the month of the demons. It's just too risky, and it's easy, something dangerous to happen, the words slipped out of his mouth before he even realized it. As he accidentally threatened the fourth prince. Roland couldn't help but chuckle at the ambassador's continued attempts to convince him to work with Changu stronghold or Willow Town. You know, I have no intention of becoming a refugee, he said, shaking his head. I'm not leaving Border Town. He then boldly proclaimed, one day, Border Town will be the new border for the kingdom. He even went as far as to invite the ambassador to come to see the massive wall they were building in the North Slope. The ambassador was left in a state of shock, slowly remembering how his own family and other nobles had ridiculed the fourth prince for his wall-building project. A wall, you say, he asked, still trying to wrap his head around the idea. In his mind, he starts seeing why everyone is calling him a psycho and don't take him seriously. As Roland entered his residence, he was startled to find a shadowy figure sitting on his bed. The figure congratulated Roland on his negotiations with the ambassador, but Roland's senses were on high alert as he started running towards the exit. Suddenly, the girl in a cloak tossed a dagger between Roland and the door, blocking his escape. Despite her threatening gesture, the girl claimed she had come in peace to have a conversation. Roland cautiously asked for her identity, the girl stood up and said she doesn't have a name, but her sisters call her Nightingale, as she kneeled on the ground and vowed respect to Roland, for protecting and taking care of the witches. Roland scratched his head, trying to make sense of the situation when he noticed the badge on the Nightingale's cloak. It was unmistakably the emblem of a witch association. As they spoke, the tension grew palpable, but Roland couldn't help feeling a bit of admiration for the Nightingale's boldness. She had been following him for a week and apparently knew about Nanoa and Anna. This terrified Roland as he had no idea someone had been watching him this close as Roland was still showing signs of aggression, so Nightingale decided to take matters into her own hands. She shed her cloak and invited Roland to take a closer look. As she revealed her true appearance, Roland was taken aback. She had stunning golden blonde hair, piercing purple eyes, and a svelte figure that could make any man weak in the knees. As Nightingale tapped the edge of the bed, inviting Roland to come closer, he couldn't help but feel a mix of curiosity and caution. But seeing that Nightingale didn't seem to pose any immediate danger, he cautiously sat closer to her. Suddenly, Nightingale grabbed Roland's chin with her fingers and tilted his head towards her, admiring his confidence with a playful smirk on her face. Nightingale couldn't help but admire Roland's boldness in the face of witches like her, 
and as she leaned in closer, Roland's face turned beet red. But the playful moment quickly turned serious as Nightingale revealed her true intentions, to take Nanawa and Anna away. Roland immediately jumped up and shouted a resounding no. He insisted that they were safe and happy in Border Town and that he would do everything in his power to protect them. After all, there's no place safer than the Border Town. Nightingale insisted that she will bring them back to the Witch Association, where they can find comrades, she shivered as she talked, but Roland immediately cut her off and revealed the real situation they are in, they have no fixed camp to stay, as they are constantly running away, hiding from other people. Despite their harsh living conditions, Nightingale continued to plead her case, Roland argued that they won't survive long like that, with no water, no food, no warm shelter, and the month of the demons also arriving. But something clicked in Roland's mind as he remembered that Berov once told him that the purpose of the witch association is to gather all witches and look for the holy mountain. Roland questioned Nightingale on this matter, but Nightingale refused to answer. Roland's mind raced as he tried to come up with a solution. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in his head, and he had a brilliant idea. He proposed to Nightingale that they invite all of the witches to Border Town for the months of demons. Not only would they have a safe place to stay, and once the month was over, they could continue their search for the holy mountain. Nightingale's excitement was quickly replaced by a sense of worry as she reminded Roland that his people might not be as accepting of witches as he is. She cautioned that once exposed, the church would come looking for them, Roland, frustrated by the situation, clenched his fist's frustration as he realized that there was no quick solution to change the perception of witches in the minds of his people. And the fear of witches is deeply ingrained in the hearts of many. Nightingale dropped a bombshell, revealing that Nanawa and Anna are approaching the Age of Awakening, causing Roland to be taken aback. Nightingale then shifted her tone and asked Roland if he knew the reason why the witches are viewed as the incarnation of the devil. Roland was puzzled and replied that he had no idea. Nightingale went on to explain the terrifying fate that awaited Nanawa and Anna as they approached their 18th birthdays. Every year during the months of the demons, they would suffer excruciating pain as the devil within them ravaged their bodies. The pain was unbearable, like being ripped apart from the inside out. Those who were strong enough could recover after a few days, but for those who were not, their bodies would twist and contort into grotesque shapes before finally dying a painful death. This is the reason why people view the witches as the incarnation of the devil. Roland then questions what happens after the coming of age, Nightingale explained that once they reach the coming of age, their power will become stable and increase substantially, with the possibility of creating a new branch of magic. Roland was in a tight spot. On one hand, he needed Anna and Nanawa's help for the months of the demons, but on the other hand, he couldn't risk their lives. So he let the girls make the final decision. Nightingale nodded in appreciation of Roland's democratic approach. Anna was resolute in her response, I'm staying here, she declared. Both Roland and Nightingale were taken aback. Don't you understand the danger you're in? Nightingale pressed on, telling that she is much safer in the witch camp. Anna turned her gaze towards Roland, a determined look in her eyes. She spoke from the bottom of her heart, saying that she didn't care about going back to the academy to learn with other children like Nanoa, nor did she care about living a normal life. All she wanted was to stay by Roland's side, no matter what. With determination in her eyes, promising that she will not be devoured by the devil and she will prevail over it, Nightingale let out a deep sigh, seeing that she wasn't able to convince Anna, she decided to stay in hope to help out Anna if she ever needs help. But Roland was afraid that she will keep stalking him for the entire winter, she once again warned Anna of the danger within her and her own experience when she struggled at the edge of death countless times and seen her comrades die in front of her, and ensuring Anna that if she doesn't endure through it, she knows how to deal what happens after. As she retrieved her dagger from the wall, she vanished into the thin air, Roland was amazed by the nightingale's power, almost as if she was a natural-born assassin. Roland gently placed his hand on Anna's head and spoke in a soothing tone, it's time for you to rest now, Anna. Anna gazed at Roland with a loving look and quietly called him a fool. Roland stood tall in the midst of the border castle, his voice booming with authority as he shared his plans for the future. As he announced the negotiations with the ambassador, he made it clear that they had hit a dead end. He claimed that just like two years ago, the ambassador refused to budge an inch. 
Roland's heart was heavy as he reminded the people of the tragedy that had struck Border Town back then. Over 20% of its residents had perished in the merciless grip of winter, leaving countless families shattered and broken. The air was thick with grief as people remembered their lost loved ones, their eyes brimming with tears. He questioned if everyone are prepared to lose their loved one again, the crowd was hopeless and crying for the prince to save them. Roland cleared his throat and shifted his tone to a more confident and upbeat one. He declared to his people that he would not abandon them and that they deserved better than the terrible deal that the Changdu stronghold had offered. He reminded them how they supposed to trade two months worth of war in exchange for a half year's worth of food, but instead, Chang Ji's stronghold only gave them two months of food, the anger and frustration within the crowd were palpable. But Roland quickly assured them that he had found a solution. He had traded there or with merchants from Willowtown and had secured enough food to feed everyone through the harsh winter. As the crowd began to applaud and cheer, Roland stopped them, notifying them of urgent information that they will no longer be accepted into the Chang Ji stronghold. So they must spend the winter at the border town. This struck the crowd like a bolt of lightning, as people shiver in fear what they have to face next, but Roland reassured them that they are now building a firm and stable wall that will protect them. Roland wanted to make a bold statement and show that the demonic beasts were not as frightening as people believed them to be. In his opinion, these beasts were just like any other wild animal found in the forest, but with greater strength. They lacked intelligence and could not scale walls. He posed a question to the people once more, asking whether they wanted to cower in a refugee camp and perish due to starvation, or stand up for their loved ones and protect the border town under his leadership. As Roland's words echoed through the border town, the locals erupted in cheers that could rival a rock concert. They pledged to fight for their highness with a fervor that could light up the night sky. Meanwhile, in the halls of Changdu Castle, a gaggle of nobles gathered to mock Roland's decision. They chortled at the thought of their walls being nothing but mud and pebbles. The duke cut in with a booming voice and turned his gaze to Petrov, the ambassador. Petrov was caught off guard, but he gathered his wits and began to speak. The duke leaned in, eager to hear what the ambassador had to say. Petrov had originally planned to keep the ore monopoly by buying it at a measly 30% below market price. But to his surprise, Roland had a different plan up his sleeve. Roland was determined to expand their horizons by seeking new trade partners and offering the ore at a jaw-dropping 50% below market price. Roland also intended to manufacture his own iron tools. But that wasn't the end of it. The Duke's eyebrows rose with interest, and he urged Petrov to continue. Petrov had more to say. He believed that if the border town could successfully defend against the month of the demons, it would be a great victory for Changdu stronghold. But he also predicted that Roland wouldn't be staying in the border town forever. With the fight for the throne decree only lasting five years, it was only a matter of time before the Changdu stronghold could take over the much more prosperous border town and expand its territory. With a wise nod, Petrov advised the Changdu stronghold to send aid to Roland and help him build up the town's defenses. After all, a strong border town would benefit them all in the end. The Duke couldn't help but grin, impressed by Petrov's insight. He nodded in agreement, but his expression soon darkened. He rose from his seat with a scowl, making it clear that he didn't care about the welfare of the border town. However, he made it abundantly clear that no one, not even the prince, should dare to lay a finger on his border town. The next day, Roland summoned Carter to see his latest invention. It was a steam engine, a marvel of engineering made possible with the help of Anna's deft hands. As an engineer himself, Roland was smitten with the fascinating machinery that sparked the first industrial revolution. But Carter was skeptical. He had his reservations about this strange new contraption. Roland just grinned mischievously and poured some water into the tank. Then, he asked Anna to heat it up. Within a few minutes, the water started to boil and the engine roared to life. The connecting rods started moving and the wheels began to turn. In mere seconds, it reached its maximum velocity. As they beheld the steam engine in action, both Anna and Carter were left stunned by its sheer power. Carter couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling it gave him. He knew it took 15 long years to train a knight, but this machine could be built in less than a week. It didn't need food, 
and it wasn't afraid of the cold, hunger, or even arrows, swords, and spears. Carter couldn't help but question himself. With a machine like this, is there even a need for a knight anymore? Roland was beyond thrilled with the steam engine. It was the missing piece he needed to make his next move. As night descended, he made his way back to his residence, only to find Nightingale sitting on his bed, holding the blueprint of the steam engine. She was in awe of Roland's intelligence in creating such a powerful machine. Roland couldn't help but wonder how Nightingale had managed to get her hands on the blueprint, as it had been locked away in his desk. But Nightingale's curiosity about the machine was palpable, so Roland began to explain its potential uses. He told her that it could move ores, drain water, and smell iron, in short, it was useful in any task that required strength. Nightingale's mischievous grin widened as she said she will bring the steam engine blueprint back to the Witch Association, before Roland could even respond, Nightingale swiftly tucked the blueprints into her shirt and in exchange pulled out a secret letter delivered by a pigeon, however, she was able to intercept it, as Roland's eyes darted across the letter's contents, his emotions morphed from shock to a sense of utter betrayal. The words on the parchment were like a slap to his face. Roland's maid, Tyre, had received a sinister letter that instructed her to eliminate Roland during the dreaded months of the demon. This was not Tyre's first attempt, and the letter made it clear that failure again was not an option. Roland furrowed his brows as he tried to remember more about Tyre. He recalled that the previous fourth prince had a peculiar penchant for slapping Tyre's cakes, Nightingale, suggesting that the letter could be from one of his siblings. Wondered if Roland needed her help. Roland let out a deep sigh and asked Nightingale to get to the bottom of the matter. Nightingale, in turn, stood up, raised her hand, and vowed, then asked the blueprint to be her reward. The next morning, Carter burst into Roland's office, looking pale and flustered. He delivered the grim news that Tyre, Roland's trusted maid, had died the previous night. She had apparently fallen from the balcony of her room, and there were no signs of struggle or forced entry. Carter suggested it might have been a tragic accident. Roland told Carter to have the head maid arrange for the funeral, then turned his head to talk to an imaginary figure beside him. Suddenly, a thick fog materialized in front of him. As the mist cleared, a hooded figure emerged. She looked visibly upset and informed Roland that she had failed to obtain any information from Tyre. She dropped the bombshell that Tyre had taken her own life with a poison hidden within her teeth upon seeing Nightingale's appearance. Roland was taken aback by the revelation. He had never expected Tyre to resort to such a drastic measure. As Nightingale searched through Tyre's room, she was surprised to find a family letter addressed to Tyre. Although she couldn't decipher its contents, she couldn't shake off the feeling that it held a crucial clue. The letter addressed Tyre as Big sister. And made repeated mentions of the sea. Nightingale knew that Roland's two brothers were located inland and would not have access to the ocean. This realization made her suspect that the letter could be linked to the third princess. Roland's mind raced as he tried to connect the dots. He knew that the third princess had always harbored a grudge against him. Was not beyond the realm of possibility that she had taken Tyre's family hostage and forced her to commit the heinous act of assassination. It doesn't matter if Roland wants to fight for the throne or not, these things are likely to keep happening in the future, Roland's line of thought was quickly interrupted by the hot air breathing onto his ears, as Nightingale whispered that someone is here, then she vanished into a mist of fog. As Barov entered the room, a worrying expression appeared on his face as he delivered the news to Roland. He carefully selected individuals who had volunteered to fight during the months of demons, had finally passed the rigorous filtering process, and were ready to be examined. Roland was overjoyed to hear this news, and he eagerly prepared to examine the volunteers. Before they left the office, Barov posed a crucial question to Roland. Was he sure about taking these people to defend the border town? Roland didn't quite understand the implication of this question until he laid his eyes on the ragtag group of volunteers before him. It was clear that they were not seasoned warriors, but rather, they were ordinary folk who had answered Roland's call to arms. Some of them were emaciated and weak, and it was evident that they had not had proper meals in days. Roland's mind raced as he surveyed the group of volunteers before him. He couldn't help but be reminded of the stark reality of this world, the productivity was abysmally low 
and many ordinary people struggle to even put food on the table, let alone maintain a strong physique. Upon seeing the worrying look on Roland's face, Barov recommended hiring professional mercenaries instead, with no hesitation, Roland declined, he insisted to use the residence. Roland gazed out at the sea of people gathered in front of him, feeling a surge of excitement and determination. He knew that if he was going to build a strong military, it had to start with the people themselves. And that meant instilling in them the discipline, endurance, and strength needed to defend their kingdom against any threat. As he looked down at the people, Roland knew that training them to wield swords wasn't enough. They needed to be strong, agile, and disciplined, with the ability to work together as a team. So he told Carter to get them into formation and start running. As the sun reached its zenith, Roland, Barov, Carter, and Axe marched in front of the assembled residents. Carter furrowed his brow, unable to comprehend why Roland was subjecting the men to hours of mindless standing. Roland went as far as rewarding them with a precious egg for the simple task, Carter, however, remained skeptical, clearly, Carter doesn't understand that simple posture was a crucial component of modern military training. Roland waved his hand and told Carter to continue to train the men the same way until he received the finalized training routine. Roland was no fool. He knew that transforming his ragtag group of men into Spartan warriors in a mere two months was a pipe dream. But that didn't mean he couldn't instill a sense of discipline and unwavering obedience in his troops. To Roland, there was nothing more crucial than the ability to follow orders without question. Individual strength was important, of course, but it paled in comparison to the power of a united military. As the cart full of tantalizing food and the coveted extra egg came into view, the crowd erupted into a frenzy of anticipation. Like a swarm of locusts, they surged forward, eager to claim their share. But Roland was not about to let chaos reign. With a commanding voice, he demanded that the people form four orderly lines and approach the cart one by one. Anyone who dared to break the rules would be unceremoniously shoved to the back of the line. To the amazement of all, the unruly crowd fell into line with surprising ease. Within minutes, they were neatly arranged into four orderly queues, their eyes glued to the food that lay just ahead. After a hearty lunch, Roland gave the order for his men to rest and then set off for the camp where the patrolling soldiers were stationed. He put Axe in charge, assigning him the task of teaching the troops how to set up a proper tent. Carter was concerned about Axe's background after all, he hailed from the Sand Nation, far from the shores of Grey Castle. But Roland had made it clear that loyalty and merit were the only things that mattered. To him, everyone was his people, regardless of where they came from. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, Roland sat back and surveyed his handiwork. Before he lay the final training plans, a carefully crafted blueprint for turning his ragtag band of men into a disciplined fighting force. Two things stood out to Carter as he poured over the document. Every day at noon, the men were to run around the border town until sunset. If they succeeded, they would earn an extra egg at their next meal. And after dinner, they were to attend Carl's Academy for education and training. Carter was puzzled by this last requirement, but Roland simply yawned and explained that a strong army couldn't simply be good at fighting. They needed to be civilized and educated. The following afternoon, Roland trudged wearily towards his office. As he pushed open the door, he was greeted by Nightingale, who looked genuinely concerned about his well-being. But before he could even say a word, she pointed towards the breakfast spread on the table, announcing that she had already eaten half of it while it was still piping hot. Roland couldn't help but chuckle at her impish grin. Has no one taught you about respecting royalty? He quipped, recalling how seriously Nightingale had taken etiquette the first time they had met. Without missing a beat, Nightingale stood up and presented him with a proper bow. But she knew that Roland didn't really care about such tedious formalities. Roland was almost taken aback by how well Nightingale seemed to understand him. Roland let out a weary sigh, his gaze shifting from the plate of half-eaten breakfast to Nightingale's eager expression. If you are hungry then eat all of it, I can always ask the kitchen to prepare something else. Nightingale's eyes lit up at the mention of food, and she eagerly picked up the remaining bits of toast and eggs. As she munched on the food, she couldn't help but ask, what's with all the ice on you looking to purchase, she thought Roland is looking to make some cold beverages. 
Roland's lips twitched into a mischievous smile as he glanced at the note lying open on the table and told Nightingale that he has plans to make ice cheese. Nightingale's eyes widened in excitement at the mention of a new culinary adventure. Roland's thoughts raced as he considered his next move. Although he knew that Nightingale was not his enemy, he couldn't fully trust her yet. With so little information about her, he couldn't reveal everything he knew. He continued working on his draft for the next project, firearms. Unlike the steam engine, firearms didn't require as much technological understanding, but they could still be incredibly dangerous in the wrong hands. Roland knew that he couldn't afford to have the manufacturing methods leaked. Roland was taken aback by his latest discovery, one that left him both fascinated and apprehensive. It appeared that the nobles had been using nitre, a crucial component in the production of gunpowder, to cool their beverages. And to make matters worse, they had given it the absurdly elegant name of Ison. Roland turned his head towards Nightingale, his curiosity piqued by the mention of the Witch Association. With a tentative voice, he asked if the association also trained assassins, wondering if there was more to Nightingale's past than she had let on. As soon as he mentioned the association, Nightingale's expression turned melancholic, and she lowered her voice, telling Roland that they were a pitiful group of people who had come together out of necessity. She had joined them two years ago, seeking refuge and a place to belong. Roland's next question was one he had been hesitant to ask, but he couldn't help but wonder if Nightingale had worked for anyone else before him. He questioned if others were willing to take in witches like her. Nightingale's mood shifted, and she grew quieter, her eyes downcast as she spoke. She mentioned that she would have been killed if she hadn't been useful but didn't elaborate further. Roland urged her to continue. Nightingale let out a nervous smile, her discomfort palpable. She didn't want to talk about her past but assured Roland that she hadn't worked for anyone in the last five years and understood his concerns. Roland couldn't shake off the feeling that there was more to her story, but for now, he let it be. After five long days of hard work, Roland finally completed the first flintlock. The firearm was a true marvel of engineering, but he knew that the real challenge lay ahead. He intended to use his steam engine to mass-produce the parts and barrels needed for the guns, but it soon became apparent that the machine was not quite up to the task. Everything else still had to be made by hand, which slowed down the production process considerably. With his mind racing, he calculated that he could only produce four flintlocks at the current rate before the month of the demons. As Roland proudly presented his latest invention, Carter's eyes widened with curiosity. He couldn't help but marvel at the weapon's strange and unfamiliar appearance, wondering how it could possibly stand up against the monstrous demons. Roland's answer was simple yet surprising. He planned to handpick the most skilled hunters in the border town and form them into a specialized squad, whose primary weapon would be the flintlocks, at the mention of hunters, Carter's brow furrowed in confusion. Why hunters and not the patrol squad, he asked, Roland hesitated for a moment, memories of the patrol squad's recent struggles flashing through his mind. But he was unsure if they had what it takes to wield his new invention effectively. Later that night, as the patrol squad member, Brian struggled to fight for his life against the enemy in the dark and filthy sewer beneath Roland's castle. The clanging of swords echoed in the narrow tunnel as he fought against the scar-faced assailant, who threatened him with the same fate as his former squadmate, Grey Dog. Despite the danger, Brian was determined not to let the enemy enter the castle and harm his town. With a burst of strength, he disarmed the scar-faced attacker and thrust his sword into his chest, leaving the enemy stunned at the fact that he had been defeated by a mere patrol squad member. Brian sneered in defiance, reminding the enemy that while they wasted their time drinking and gambling in the bars, he and Grey Dog were training hard to protect their town. He will not let these people who were sent by the Changu stronghold cause disaster in the border town. Brian charged forward but just as he was about to strike the final blow, another enemy emerged from the shadows and plunged a dagger into Brian's body, causing him to collapse in pain. With each passing moment, the situation in the sewer grew direr. Patrol after patrol arrived, drawn by the sounds of the scuffle until a small army had amassed. Despite the excruciating pain coursing through his body, Brian knew he had to act quickly. With a shuddering breath, he yanked the dagger from his wound and hurled it towards the nearest torch. The sewer was plunged into darkness in an instant, the only sound the hiss of extinguished flames and the panicked shouts of the patrols. Brian stumbled back to the granary, 
his body racked with pain from the dagger wound. He knew that this was the place the enemy was targeting, and without the precious supply stored here, the border town would be left with no choice but to flee to Chang Ji's stronghold. Roland had given them so much hope and progress, and Brian was determined to protect it all. Suddenly, the door to the granary was kicked open with a deafening crash. Brian was seized by his collar and flung to the ground, resigned to his fate. But just as the intruders closed in for the kill, Nightingale descended from the rafters with a wicked grin. In a blur of movement, she dispatched the attackers with ease, leaving them lying motionless on the ground. The morning sun cast a somber light on the granary, where Carter was surveying the aftermath of the brutal attack. Eight corpses lay scattered about the room, seven of which belonged to former members of the border town's patrol squad. The last was an unknown assailant, in Roland's office, the young prince seethed with anger over the brazen invasion of his castle. He turned to Nightingale and thanked her for her timely intervention. Without her warning, he might have been among the dead. The skilled witch smiled wryly, assuring him that even without her, the intruders would have been no match for Anna. Roland's anger gave way to a wry grin as he offered Nightingale a position as his personal shadow guard, promising a generous salary of two gold royals per month and other great benefits. Nightingale wavered, her heart torn between loyalty to her fellow sisters in the Witch Association and the promise of a new life free from persecution. Despite her hesitation, she stood firm and refused to abandon her comrades. Roland, impressed by Nightingale's unwavering commitment, extended a generous offer. He implored her to gather her sisters and bring them to the border town, where he was overseeing a complete reconstruction of the community. With his watchful eye and a steady hand, Roland vowed to provide a safe haven where the witches could roam the streets without fear of discrimination. Nightingale was deeply touched by Roland's unwavering compassion, yet she remained skeptical of his abilities. She insisted that she needed to witness Roland's success firsthand before entrusting him with the task at hand. Roland, undeterred by his initial failure to recruit Nightingale, was even more determined to achieve his goals. Roland inquired whether Nightingale had successfully escorted Nanoa to safety. As it turned out, Nanoa had been assigned to treat a man covered in blood, a task that had left her shaken and afraid. Roland probed further, seeking Nightingale's perspective on the incident. After carefully considering the details of the event, Nightingale advised Roland that it was unlikely to be connected to his siblings. She believed it to be the work of an amateur schemer, unlike the skilled and cunning made tire. Two suspects had been captured alive, and Nightingale reassured Roland that he would soon have the answers he sought. As she spoke, Nightingale casually picked up the teacup from the table and took a sip, her demeanor calm and composed despite the gravity of the situation. Her words were measured and confident, reassuring Roland that she had a firm grasp of the situation. As the noon sun shone down on them, Carter and Roland made their way toward a small, nondescript room. Roland pushed open the door to reveal a man swathed in bandages, his face and body hidden from view. As soon as he saw Roland, the man tried to rise, his movements agitated and uneasy. With a gentle nod, Roland urged the man to relax, assuring him that he already knew the truth about what had happened. He praised Brian for his bravery and selflessness, calling him a true hero. Brian's face crumpled as he recalled his fallen comrade, tears streaming down his face and his body shaking with emotion. Roland reached out to comfort Brian, his hand settling gently on the brave man's shoulder. He promised that Brian's friend would receive a burial befitting his courage and sacrifice. But then, Roland delivered the news that the scar-faced culprit had been sentenced to death by hanging, inviting Brian to attend the execution in three days. But Brian hesitated, his expression pained and uncertain. He spoke of the scar-faced man's noble status and the fact that nobles could often use their wealth to atone for their crimes. He is afraid that killing Scar-Face may anger other nobles from the Changdu stronghold. With a resolute tone, Roland asserted that the Scar-Faced man may be distantly related to a noble family, but he held no title or land to speak of. Furthermore, he had attempted to invade a prince's castle and burn their food supplies, putting the lives of over 2,000 residents of the border town in peril. Such crimes were unforgivable and warranted the harshest of punishments, death, by hanging. As he spoke, Roland's eyes gleamed with steely determination, his conviction unshakable.
He turned to Brian, his voice softening as he urged the brave man to rest and recover from the trauma of the recent events. Roland promised that a proper conferring ceremony will be organized for him once the month of the demon had passed. Brian's eyes widened in shock and amazement upon hearing of the conferring ceremony, his gaze fixed upon Roland's unwavering expression. Roland met his gaze with a firm resolve, letting the weight of his words sink in as he spoke. With a steady voice, Roland informed Brian that the Brave Patrol would henceforth become his personal knights, entrusted with the sacred duty of defending the border town and its people. At the city wall, Axe, with his imposing presence, commanded the daily training of the border town's soldiers. His voice boomed loud and clear, echoing across the training ground, as he barked out orders for the men to stand at attention. With a swift and practiced movement, the soldiers aligned themselves in perfect formation, their spears at the ready. As the fourth prince approached, Roland descended the stairs with a sense of trepidation, uncertain of what to say to these men who stood before him. His mind raced with questions, pondering over the best course of action. With a deep breath, Roland stepped forward and chose a young blonde soldier addressing the soldiers with a clear and commanding voice. With a radiant grin, the illustrious figure inquired about the well-being of the young lad. From his past experience gleaned from the news, he knew the expected response. Not tired and doing well. However, to his amazement, the youngster unexpectedly collapsed and kneeled to the ground, tears streaming down his face. The boy was so overjoyed that he was at a loss for words. The other soldiers in the vicinity were awestruck to witness the Royal Highness himself descending to observe their training, overwhelmed with a sense of pride and admiration. Roland extended his hand towards the youthful soldier, imparting a message to him that kneeling was not necessary for his presence. With a beaming grin, the lad complied, rising to his feet with unbridled enthusiasm. Roland was elated to observe the strides they had made in their training regiment, as evidenced by their elevated energy levels, attributable to proper nutrition and rest. Turning his attention to the young soldier, Roland inquired if he had any novel ideas or suggestions that could further enhance their training, emphasizing that he was always open to hearing feedback. The young soldier hesitated momentarily, understandably apprehensive about conversing with the fourth prince. After taking a deep breath, he mustered the courage to speak his mind, stating that their forces were insufficient in number. In the event of a demonic beast assault, they were only capable of defending a mere third of the wall. The murmurs of agreement from the surrounding soldiers served as a testament to the veracity of his words. Roland raised his hand to quell the cacophony of voices, signaling for everyone to quiet down. Turning his attention back to the young lad, he asked for his name, to which he learned that the soldier's name was Vanner. Roland expressed his admiration for Vanner's keen observation skills and concurred with his opinion regarding the inadequacy of their forces. Axe, who was nearby, affirmed Roland's statement by noting that demonic beasts lacked the intelligence to organize and were akin to wild beasts. Having established the veracity of Vanner's concerns, Roland unveiled his plan. Given that the wall spanned an impressive 600 meters, they would divide their forces into three groups, with obstacles set up in between each group. The obstacles would compel the beasts to run around them and concentrate in specific areas, where the soldiers would be lying in wait for them. Axe voiced his trepidation regarding the proposed plan, citing the inherent risks of engaging with only spears and arrows. Roland, however, appeared unperturbed, and with a sly grin, he began to divulge a new and secret weapon. In the distance, not far from the city wall, a massive explosion erupted from a nearby forest, sending flames soaring into the air and causing the ground to tremble. Dust and pebbles rained down upon them as Roland reveled in his excitement, anticipating the success of the new weapon. Carter and Axe were awestruck, unable to comprehend the sheer magnitude of the weapon's power, likening it to the thunder of the gods themselves. As Roland approached the massive dent in the ground, measuring half a meter in depth and ten meters in width, he couldn't help but feel exhilarated at the sight of the explosive power of gunpowder, which seemed to be the best friend for all Ice Sky protagonists, nearby the unfortunate bunnies that had been tied up near the explosion site their body cold and unmoving. Axe, visibly thrilled by the newfound power of the weapon, eagerly inquired if they could be mass-produced. Roland let out a sigh, acknowledging the harsh reality that it wouldn't be possible by the time the month of demon arrived. However, he remained optimistic, predicting that they would have amassed a stockpile of 20 to 30 such weapons by then, which he was confident would suffice to see them through the ordeal. 
From Nightingale's unique perspective, the world appeared to be nothing but shades of black and white, a concept that may be hard for others to comprehend. However, this allowed her to break free from the mundane constraints of everyday life and move about freely. Within the mist, cardinal directions were mere abstract notions that held no bearing on her movements. Instead, she followed the ever-shifting lines that guided her path, enabling her to float effortlessly through walls and solid objects. Nightingale's ability to perceive the world differently also allowed her to see the intricate flow and ebb of magical power within witches. With a keen eye, she could discern the strength and brightness of Anna's magical core, which radiated with a powerful aura that impressed even Nightingale. To Nightingale's astonishment, Anna was not only aware of her existence but greeted her with open arms. Emerging from the mist, Nightingale revealed herself with a smile. Anna was practicing her abilities in her pajamas and was delighted to see Nightingale. With a bright grin, Nightingale invited Anna to share some of her delicious fish cakes. Nightingale advised Anna to wash her hands before eating, but Anna simply used her flames to purify her hands, leaving Nightingale in awe of her precise control over fire. However, Nightingale knew that the more powerful an ability, the more pain one must endure during demonic torture. As Anna savored the delectable fish cake, Nightingale couldn't help but express her concern for the young girl's safety. With a worried expression etched on her face, she delicately broached the subject of Anna's future. She questioned whether Anna truly wished to remain in the border town, cautioning that many dangers were lurking in the harsh winter months ahead. Nightingale implored Anna to consider the comfort and safety of the Witch Association, where she could be surrounded by like-minded individuals who would welcome her with open arms. Anna didn't respond to Nightingale's inquiry directly, but instead, she posed a question of her own, where did Nightingale hail from before joining the association? Nightingale's response was that she lived in a bustling metropolis in the east, not too far from the capital. However, Anna didn't stop there and inquired whether Nightingale was happy in her previous life. At the mention of her past, a jolt of memory coursed through Nightingale's mind. She recalled being confined in chains, treated no differently than a lowly animal. The pain she endured caused her to shiver uncontrollably as she wondered what prompted Anna to ask such a loaded question. Anna proceeded to recount her own harrowing tale, where she was sold to the church by her own father for a paltry sum of 25 gold royals. Overcoming her trepidation, Anna gently placed her hands atop Nightingale's and shared how Roland had come to her rescue, freeing her from the confines of her bleak existence. The mere thought of her new life here filled Anna with an inexplicable sense of happiness. As Nightingale listened in awe, Nightingale went on explaining that despite what Anna thought, she is still trapped in this castle, and the rest of the populace still harbored an abhorrent disdain for witches. However, Anna's unwavering faith in Roland's vision for change surpassed any fears or misgivings she may have harbored. Fixing her crystalline gaze directly upon Nightingale's, Anna posed a poignant question, where did Nightingale find more fulfillment? in the witch association or here. Without missing a beat, Anna professed her own sense of spiritual home in this very border town where she now resided, alongside her unwavering trust in Roland's promise of bringing transformative change to this land. If the holy mountain that the witches dreamed of was Nightingale's peaceful home, Anna believed that she had found her own holy mountain right here, in the company of Roland and the inhabitants of this humble town. Just as Nightingale was about to reply, the door suddenly flung open with a thunderous crash. In walked Nanoa, tears streaming down her ashen face. With wild desperation in her eyes, she flung herself upon Anna, her body trembling with fear. In a frantic and nervous tone, Nanoa begged for Anna's assistance, her words spilling out in an incomprehensible rush. Meanwhile, in Roland's chambers, he was in the midst of a delightful dream, surrounded by his bewitching harem. Suddenly, his reverie was rudely interrupted by Nightingale, who yanked him unceremoniously out of bed. Her face twisted with anger, Nightingale relayed the alarming news that Nanoa's father had arrived and now knew of his daughter's true nature as a witch. Roland was stunned by this revelation, his mind racing with countless questions. He scrambled to get dressed and made his way down to the meeting room. As he entered, he was confronted by a white-haired man with bulging veins popping out of his face. The man demanded the return of his daughter, his voice laced with a venomous fury. Nanoa cowered before the white-haired man, who ranted and raved that his daughter was not a witch and that accusations were nothing but nonsense. Roland and Anna exchanged a meaningful look, silently acknowledging that they were on the same page. 
Suddenly, a bright spark of flame ignited in Anna's palm, causing the man to recoil in shock and fear. As the flames grew more intense, Nanawa's tears flowed freely as she begged Anna to stop. The white-haired man was at a loss for words, his anger turning to confusion as he demanded to know what was happening. With a friendly smile, Roland stepped forward and urged the man to calm down. He explained that there had been a misunderstanding and suggested that they have a real talk to clear things up. Gradually, the white-haired man's anger dissipated as Roland patiently explained that Nanawa had come to the castle to train her magical abilities, not because he was into lowly. <coughs> Roland's words hung in the air as he explained the precious value of Nanawa's healing abilities. He implored Nanawa's father to allow her to stay in the border town to assist in the upcoming battle against the demons, but the man shook his head firmly. Apologizing for his refusal, he explained that he could not bear to put his daughter in such grave danger. Roland persisted, reminding the man of Nanawa's grandfather, a valiant knight who had passed down his title to Nanawa's father. As he spoke of her grandfather's courageous exploits leading troops against the demonic beasts, Nanawa's father's demeanor shifted. His eyes lit up with pride and reverence as he eagerly recounted his father's heroic past. As Roland took notice of Nanawa's father's unconventional attire, he couldn't help but notice the rough calluses on his hands, evidence that he hadn't been idle like most of the other nobles. Roland's keen eye for detail allowed him to deduce that Nanawa's father has not forgotten about his father's legacy. As the conversation continued, Roland spoke of the Pine family's current struggles under the iron grip of Duke Ryan's tyranny. Despite their former glory, they now faced immense difficulty in reclaiming their rightful place in society. Nanawa's father was taken aback by Roland's accurate assessment of the situation, rendered speechless by the young lord's astuteness. With a sudden spark of inspiration, Roland invited Nanawa's father to stay in Bordertown and lend his strength to the fight against the demonic beasts that terrorized the surrounding lands. In return, Roland promised to reward him with a valuable piece of land. Nanawa's father rose from his seat, his expression filled with a mixture of determination and fear. While he was eager to join Roland's cause, his concerns for his daughter's safety still weighed heavily on his mind. His skeptical nature left him questioning whether Bordertown truly possessed the power and strength to fend off the relentless hordes of demonic beasts. Nanawa's father trembled with fear as Roland laid out the harsh reality of their situation. He spoke of the looming threat of the church and their insidious spies, who had infiltrated every corner of Chang Ji's stronghold. Should they discover Nanawa's closely guarded secret, their fate would be sealed, with no hope of escape or salvation. Roland's words hung heavy in the air, each syllable laden with the weight of impending doom. He assured Nanawa's father that he had a plan, one that would ensure the safety of his beloved daughter. With steely determination, Roland vowed to have a boat ready at the dock, standing at the ready once their mission fail. Nanawa and Anna would be the first to depart. As Nanawa's father listened to Roland's proposal, he was struck by a feeling of unease. Yet he could sense something different about the notorious fourth prince, something that set him apart from the other nobles and royals he had encountered in his life. Taking a deep breath, he made the difficult decision to place his trust in Roland, hoping against hope that his faith would not be misplaced. With a change of tone, he vowed as a knight and swore to fight by Roland's side. Moments later, after saying farewell to Nanawa and her father, Anna pouted and asked why Roland will say that, with a determined voice, she claimed that she will be going nowhere. In Roland's office, Barov burst through the door, his face wrought with anxiety. He delivered the grave news that the ongoing training of their soldiers and the production of weapons had taken a substantial toll on their finances. If they continued on this path, they would surely run out of funds long before the months of the demon came to a close. Roland rubbed his temples wearily, acutely aware of the dire situation that faced them. With a heavy heart, he instructed Barov to draw the necessary funds from his own coffers, Barov remained unconvinced, his concern for Roland's safety palpable. Yet Roland remained resolute, determined to see his plans through to the end, no matter the cost. He assured Barov that he would be the first to leave should their mission fail, and urged him to attend to his duties with renewed focus and vigor. As Barov departed, Roland slumped onto his desk, overcome with a sense of despair. He couldn't believe that he had managed to drain his resources completely. In the midst of the fog, Nightingale appeared, materializing from the swirling mist. 
She leaned against Roland's desk, a mischievous grin on her face as she questioned his earlier words to Barov. Roland could feel his cheeks flush with embarrassment. Nightingale's eyes brimming with concern for Anna's well-being. She urged Roland to spend more time with her, fearful that her time may be running out. Yet Roland remained steadfast in his belief that Anna would emerge victorious against the demonic forces and trusted in Anna's own words that she will not prevail against the demonic torture and will surely survive. Nightingale couldn't believe Roland's unwavering trust in a witch as she continued to say a witch who had been cursed by the devil. Roland met her gaze evenly, a determined glint in his eyes. He refused to be swayed by her words, declaring that he trusted Anna just as much as he trusted Nightingale herself. The room fell into an awkward silence as Nightingale struggled to come to terms with Roland's unwavering words. She shifted her weight from one foot to the other, unable to meet his gaze. As the weight of Roland's conviction began to sink in, Nightingale felt a faint blush creeping up her cheeks. She cleared her throat and stammered out a few words, as if she was a lie detector, admitting that Roland isn't lying. As the tension in the room dissipated, Nightingale found herself drawn to Roland's window. She peered out into the darkening sky, watching as snowflakes began to drift lazily down from the heavens. Her heart quickened with a sense of foreboding as she realized that this was the first snowfall, signaling the month of demons is arriving, her eyes darted back to Roland, a silent acknowledgement passing between them. Without a word, they both knew what needed to be done. As Roland approached the training field, the sound of gunfire echoed through the crisp winter air. Axe stood at the shooting range, his eyes locked onto the target in front of him. Roland approached him with a stern expression, eager to assess his progress. Axe turned to face Roland, his face breaking into a confident grin. With a nod of his head, he assured Roland that he had been practicing diligently and had mastered the flintlock as per his instructions. As Axe gazed down at the powerful weapon in his hand, he felt a deep sense of respect for the man who had given it to him. He vowed to never disappoint Roland and to use his skills to defend their land against the demonic beasts that threatened to overrun them. Roland turned to Carter and inquired about his progress. Though Carter's skill with the new weapons was commendable, his concerns about their slow production rate were valid. Roland acknowledged the difficulty of pioneering the age of fire weapons but reassured Carter that more weapons would be crafted in due time. Roland strode purposefully to the city wall, flanked by Axe and Carter, two of his most trusted soldiers. As he gazed out over the expanse of land beyond the wall, his mind was consumed with thoughts of the impending demon invasion. The trio arrived at the city wall where Roland was greeted with a chorus of bowed heads from the assembled soldiers. As Axe reported that no demonic beasts had been sighted yet, Roland breathed a sigh of relief. The first snowfall usually meant a lull in activity from the beasts. However, their respite was short-lived when a soldier on the wall shouted a warning. A lone figure had appeared. Panic spread among the soldiers, and some suggested sounding the alarm. Roland, calm and collected, reminded them of their training and urged them to use proper judgments. Gradually, the men regained their composure and lowered their bows. Roland exhaled a weary breath, acknowledging the grueling drill was necessary to instill discipline in his troops. The soldiers stood in unison, intently watching as the cunning fox crept closer to the fortress walls. Suddenly, the beast leaped forward, its eyes fixed on the towering barrier. Axe, quick to react, alerted Roland of the creature's possible intentions to vault over the defenses. Carter, ever the valiant protector, positioned himself in front of Roland, poised to strike. Without hesitation, Axe drew his bow and let fly an arrow, piercing the beast's sinewy body in a lethal shot. As Roland surveyed the lifeless body of the beast, his inquisitive mind kicked into gear. The ebony hue of the creature's blood piqued his interest, and the realization that witches could withstand the aftermath of the awakening only deepened his fascination. His curiosity now stoked, he made a mental note to explore the enigmatic mountain in the near future. Roland turned to Axe and queried him about the consequences of being bitten by a demonic beast, to his relief, Axe assured him that death was the sole outcome, and not a ghastly transformation into a zombie-like fiend in some otherworldly ice sky. Roland's mind raced with a daring idea, consuming the flesh of the fallen beast. However, before he could vocalize his plan, Carter's voice boomed out, vehemently opposing Roland's suggestion. The thought of consuming infected meat was not just unappetizing, 
but also perilous to their survival. Axe supported Carter's warning with the grim fact that any hounds fed on the tainted meat would always die. Roland's heart sank at the realization of the opportunity lost, and he let out a wistful sigh. As the troops were conducting their regular patrols, a sudden report came in about an injured individual from the perilous North Slope mines. In a frenzy of activity, Roland made his way to the hospital where he was met with the sight of Nanoa, a young girl trembling with fear as she backed away from the wounded miner. Nanoa's father, a beacon of calm in the chaos, rushed to his daughter's side to offer solace and support. Drawing on her inner strength, Nanoa steeled herself and approached the injured man. With a deep breath, she summoned forth her latent ability, unleashing a blinding flash of light that left her father in awe. The injured man, now miraculously healed. Brian on the side also said it was Nanoa who saved his life, and showed his gratitude towards Nanoa. Moments later, the injured man slowly regained consciousness, his mind muddled with confusion and disbelief. He pondered whether what had just occurred was merely a vivid dream. Roland, ever the reassuring voice, assured him that it was indeed real and that he had been brought back from the brink of death by none other than the extraordinary Nanoa and her amazing ability. The man recoiled in shock at the mention of Nanoa's ability and let out a gasp. A witch! Aren't all witches demons? Nanoa's father, bristling with anger at the man's words, sternly rebuked him. He reminded the man that it was Nanoa who had saved his life and that a demon would never deign to aid a human in such a manner. Realizing his grave mistake, the man sprang out of bed and fell to his knees, pleading for Nanoa's forgiveness. With tears streaming down his face, he expressed his deepest gratitude towards the young girl for saving his life. As Roland made his way back to his residence, he was met with the sight of Nightingale perched on his bed, her eyes glazed with concern. She feared that Nanoa's ability would be discovered and that the young girl would never be able to lead a normal life. Before Nightingale could say another word, Roland interjected with a sense of urgency in his voice. He reminded Nightingale that the border town was small and that the Holy Church's influence was limited. He believed that now was the perfect time to build trust in witches and that they needed to seize this opportunity before the dreaded month of the demon arrived. Roland was confident that if they could show the people that witches were not demons, they could slowly begin to break down the walls of fear and prejudice that had been erected against them. As Roland handed Nightingale a glass of wine, he spoke with confidence, assuring her that everything was under control. The heavy snow that covered the path leading to Chengdu's stronghold and the control they had over the shipping ports ensured that no news of the border town could reach the outside world. With three months, they had ample time to make a change. Roland reminded Nightingale of the miner who was saved by Nanoa earlier that day. The miner, once afraid of witch power, now believed that Nanoa was an angel of revival. Roland saw this as an opportunity to boost morale and plant a seed of change in people's hearts, especially in the new army he was building. Nightingale gazed at Roland with a loss for words, she stared at Roland's eye, feeling a bit fascinated also with a mixture of curiosity and admiration and couldn't help but ask him what was driving him to take such bold steps in support of the witches. Roland looked at her with a serious expression and spoke in a firm voice. Because I believe that witches make the best waifu. <coughs> Roland leaned forward, his eyes shining with determination. Because I believe that everyone deserves a chance to live freely, hoping one day, even witches can live freely in his territory. Roland's speech had left Nightingale stunned, her eyes fixed on him in awe. After a long silence, she averted her gaze and began apologizing for the lies she had told him earlier. Nightingale explained that her fellow witches in the association had been wandering around for too long, and they simply wanted a safe place to stay, even if it was a castle like his. Roland was initially confused by her words, but then, as if a sudden realization had struck him, he understood that Nightingale was offering to bring the other witches to his castle. He felt a surge of excitement. Nightingale was in awe of Roland's grand vision for a world where everyone, including witches, could live together. However, she still had concerns about the repercussions of bringing the witches to the border town, he feared that this could potentially make Roland enemies with the church. Roland, on the other hand, remained calm and collected. He assured Nightingale that the church would not go to extreme lengths just to punish him. He knew that they wouldn't dare to provoke the royal family. As he walked towards the window, Roland emphasized the importance of starting small and building from there. 
he believed that they needed to start from the border town and gradually gather enough forces to take down the church. Eventually, Roland envisioned creating a kingdom where all people, regardless of their origins, could coexist in harmony. This was not just limited to Greycastle, but the entire world. One day everyone will know that witches are truly the best waifu. Under the cover of darkness, a thundering of hooves echoed through the night as a group of mounted men thundered towards Grey Castle. Among them was a towering figure with a distinctive scar etched into his face, none other than Gerald Wimbledon, the first prince of the kingdom of Grey Castle. As they approached the castle gates, a sudden flare lit up the sky from within the walls. Undeterred, the first prince ordered his men to press forward and make their way inside. With a loud clanking, the chains holding the heavy castle doors began to descend, allowing the prince and his men to breach the castle's defenses. The air was thick with tension as the first prince drew closer to his ultimate goal, the throne of Grey Castle. As the first prince strode through the grand entrance, he was met with a respectful bow from a handful of ministers, eagerly awaiting his return. The prince acknowledged their greetings with a gracious smile but wasted no time in getting to business. He inquired if the guards had been replaced as planned, to which the ministers hesitantly admitted that there had been some issues with the scheme. However, the prince remained unfazed, his unwavering confidence a testament to his unwavering determination. He issued orders to secure the entrance with all available personnel, keeping his trust in the two guards who would accompany him. As the first prince strode towards the king's residence, his thoughts were momentarily overtaken by fond memories of his childhood spent playing with his younger siblings. But a sudden glint of steely determination replaced his wistful expression as he approached the imposing doors. He knew he was about to break the king's rules and seize the throne by force. As he stood before the grand chamber, a faint odor caught his attention. The scent of blood hung in the air, an ominous omen of what was to come. His minister informed him that a maid was called in by the king and she had seen them switching the guards and that she had been dealt with accordingly. The first prince finds what the minister said to be extremely odd, as he knew his father hasn't touched a woman ever since his mother's passing, the first prince's resolve only hardened, knowing that there was no turning back now. With a deep breath, he pushed forward and entered the room. As the first prince pushed open the door, the metallic scent of blood assaulted his senses. His gaze swept across the room, settling on the bed where a gruesome sight awaited him. The sheets were soaked with crimson, evidence of a heinous crime committed within these very walls. Reacting on instinct, the first prince drew his sword with a sharp metallic ring, preparing for the worst. But what he saw next left him utterly bewildered. Standing beside the bed was his own brother, the second prince, and in the center of the room lay the king, a dagger piercing his chest, his lifeless eyes staring off into nothingness. Rage and confusion swirled within the first prince as he struggled to make sense of this horrific scene. His brother's hands were stained with blood, a damning sight that left no doubt as to who was responsible for this heinous act. The first prince's mind raced as he tried to come to terms with his brother's betrayal. He felt a seething anger deep within his chest, branding the second prince as a demon from the depths of hell. The second prince simply sneered in response, as if daring the first prince to judge him. He knew all too well that his brother had been provided with the same advantages he had, and that he too would have taken the same path if given the chance. Caught in a trap he never saw coming, the first prince struggled to regain his composure. He knew he was at a disadvantage, and that the second prince had planned this all along. But to his surprise, his brother revealed that he had no intention of killing him. The reason for his treachery was simple, he didn't want to wait five long years to face the third sister's powerful army. She had been building her forces long before the contest for the throne was even announced, and the second prince saw this as the perfect opportunity to take over Grey Castle without the need to build an army from scratch. With a fierce determination burning in his eyes, the first prince saw an opening and charged at his treacherous brother, intent on avenging their father's murder. But before he could get close, guards rushed in, their spears piercing deep into his flesh and bringing him down in a painful heap. The second prince stood over his fallen brother, a cruel smirk twisting his lips as he declared that the first prince would face trial the following day. Accused of leaving his own territory and assassinating the king, the first prince was helpless as he struggled against the guard's tight grip. He threatened to expose his brother's plot to the world, but the second prince merely chuckled, revealing a small vial of potion that would render anyone who drank it completely mute. 
The first prince's heart sank as he realized the depth of his brother's depravity. He had underestimated the second prince's cunning. With a twisted grin, the second prince declared that he would be returning to his territory that very night, intent on preparing for his ascension to the throne before news of their father's death could spread throughout the kingdom. His speech was filled with false sorrow and crocodile tears, but there was no mistaking the gleam of ambition in his eyes. As he spoke, the memories of their childhood flashed before the first prince's eyes, a bitter reminder of the happiness they had once shared. The sound of their laughter and the sight of them playing together felt like a distant dream, shattered like a mirror. As the first prince was dragged away, the minister approached the second prince, bowing his head in submission to the new king. The second prince assured him that their agreement would be upheld, but a sly grin twisted his features as he produced a small pill and handed it to the minister. The minister hesitated, sensing that something was amiss, but before he could protest, the second prince pressed the pill into his hand, coercing him to swallow it. With a shiver of fear, the minister realized that the pill would make him obedient to the new king, ensuring his loyalty and preventing any possible betrayal. As the other occupants vacated the chamber, the second prince approached the cold frigid cadaver of his father, his contorted visage betrayed the emotions within him, and a sudden recollection transported us back to the king's last moments. It was then that the second prince divulged his elder brother's return and his plot of desire for the throne. Only to be met with a burst of chilling laughter and a shocking display of self-harm. Before the prince could fathom this confusion response, the king lunged at himself with a dagger, plunging it into his own chest, it was all so surreal, and the second prince couldn't shake off the feeling that something was amiss. The prince had no time to react nor stop the suicide, yet a disconcerting sensation lingered in the back of his mind can't shake off the uneasy feeling of the entire situation. It has been a mere week since the ethereal snow graced the land, enveloping it in a thick layer of frosty white. Roland, standing in his office couldn't help but ponder the longevity of the piece. As he savored the flavor of his tea, his gaze darted over the tranquil landscape from his office. Thankfully, the steam machines in the mines had been fixed, and the soldiers manning the walls were successfully warding off the singular demonic beasts attempting to breach their walls, Roland breathed a sigh of relief and began plotting the economic growth of the border town. However, his reprieve was cut short by an urgent alert ringing out from the distance. Carter, his aide, rushed into the office, a hint of panic in his voice, spotting a large horde of demonic beasts outside of the wall. In the northern slope of the border town, a menacing horde of demonic beasts amassed outside the protective walls. The soldiers stationed at the forefront stood at the ready, but their jaws dropped at the sheer number of ferocious creatures that loomed before them. Vayner, one of the soldiers, clutched his weapon tightly, his mind racing with the memory of his initial enlistment, tempted by the promise of delicious eggs in his lunch. And now, here he was, thrust into the thick of battle against these demonic beasts. Without warning, an infected ox charged forward, its eyes aglow with a feral intensity, and its hooves pounding the earth with a deafening fury. The force of the infected ox's charge reverberated through the walls, leaving them quaking in its wake. The sheer power of the beast had left a sizable dent in the wall, before the soldiers could even inspect the lifeless ox, a pack of infected wolves pounced, using the fallen creature as a springboard to breach the defenses. Axe, the seasoned commander, acted swiftly, barking orders to position the spear squad. The expertly trained soldiers assembled with precision, their spears aimed toward the snarling wolves as they lunged forward. The sharp tips of the spears pierced the creature's flesh, but one still managed to breach the line of defense. Without hesitation, Axe raised his flintlock, expertly aiming and firing, the bullet piercing through the wolf's skull with deadly accuracy. But amidst the chaos, Vayner's attention was drawn to a fellow soldier writhing in agony on the ground. The man's stomach had been ripped apart by the wolves' razor-sharp claws, and blood gushed out in torrents. One of the soldiers turned to Vayner for guidance, but he was rendered speechless and stunned, unable to process the ghastly scene before him. At that moment, Roland and Carter made their way to the northern slope, their eyes widening at the sight of the demonic beasts ravaging the walls. Carter's commanding voice echoed across the battleground, urging the soldiers to stay calm and adhere to their training and procedures. Vayner took a deep breath, steadying himself as he ordered two of his men to carefully transport the wounded soldier to the treatment site, he then rallied the rest of his squad, instructing them to hold their position and prepare for the next wave of attacks. 
Roland was impressed by the soldiers' composure but their collective resolve was soon tested further as a strange creature appeared on the horizon. It was a twisted fusion of a massive two-headed wolf and a tortoise with green, spiky shells. The soldiers unleashed a volley of arrows at the bizarre beast, but the projectiles harmlessly ricocheted off its armored spikes, Roland quickly called upon his elite flintlock squad to take up the position, but even their explosive rounds proved ineffective against the creature's seemingly impenetrable armor. In a last-ditch effort, Roland ordered Vayner to retrieve the gunpowder. But before he could even finish his command, the monstrous beast lunged itself at the wall and started extruding the wall. Roland knew that the fortification could no longer withstand any more shocks. He immediately bellowed at his men to retreat from the wall. Suddenly, the stonework beneath him disintegrated into fragments. Just as Roland was about to be buried, Nightingale swept in to save the day, deftly guiding Roland to safety away from the crumbling wall. A massive breach now loomed before them, a dark opening in the once impregnable barricade. But just then, Vayner sprang back to the wall, clutching a box in his hand. Axe barked orders at Vayner to set the box alight and place it beneath the demonic creature. Vayner took a deep breath, recalling the steps to use the weapon, and stretched out the ring to quickly place it near the creature. As smoke billowed forth, he sprinted away, warning everyone to take cover and brace for impact. Flames began to flicker, and then, with a massive explosion, the creature was utterly obliterated. But before they could catch their breath and revel in their victory, another wave of demons swarmed the walls. There was a horde of over a dozen demonic beasts charging toward the already breached wall. The soldiers were vastly outnumbered and already gasping for breath. Roland frantically searched for a plan, but their situation seemed dire. Suddenly, the infected boar let out a deafening roar and charged straight through the shielded soldiers, sending them soaring several meters into the air. Just as the boar was about to wreak further havoc, Anna arrived on the scene. She was still clad in her maid outfit, but this time, a witch hat adorned her head. With a steely gaze fixed on the beast, she summoned a massive ball of flame and hurled it toward the charging boar. In a swift attack, the boar was engulfed in flames, writhing in agony. Roland was taken aback to see Anna in this place, for he had expressly instructed her to remain at the treatment site. Brian sprang forward, Prostrating himself on the ground and apologizing for failing to prevent Anna from coming here, Anna had been so fraught with worry for Roland's safety that she could not be dissuaded from coming. Roland had intended to have the others accept Nanoa first, then gradually introduce Anna and Nightingale, but his plans had been thwarted. He swiftly commanded his men to protect Anna, and without a moment's hesitation, the soldiers rose to their feet, brandishing their shields and standing in front of her. Anna intoned a spell summoning a massive wall of flame that engulfed the damaged barrier. With a nod of understanding, Roland took the flintlock from Carter and aimed it at one of the demonic beasts. The sound of the bullet piercing the wolf's flesh seized everyone's attention. Roland raised his hand high in the air and bellowed for all to hear that the wall had been secured, ordering his troops to take up their positions back on the wall and defend it at all costs. A mighty surge of morale swept through the field as the soldiers bellowed with all their might, swearing to stand firm and fight for their highness, and to defend the border town to their last breaths. Following a gruesome hour of combat, only a lone wolf remained standing. The creature bore three arrows protruding from its flesh, but still, it refused to yield. Yet, in a matter of seconds, it too collapsed onto the blood-soaked earth, signaling the hard-fought victory of the embattled border town. The soldiers who stood watch atop the wall erupted into joyful cries, their voices ringing out in unison as they hailed the prince and shouted, Long live the prince, Roland's heart swelled with pride at the sight of his troops working together and triumphing over the monstrous beasts, but he knew that explaining Anna's presence to the soldiers would be a challenge. He feared that the townspeople might once again view her as a demon, especially after witnessing her incredible powers. However, Roland's fears were unfounded, for as the soldiers gathered around Anna, they lowered their heads in a display of utmost respect for the witch who had fought alongside them. It soon dawned on Roland that, while people might fear the unknown, if the power belongs to someone fighting on their side against a common enemy, that fear would give way to gratitude and trust. With both hands outstretched, Roland sought to ascertain Anna's well-being, but to his dismay, he found her deathly pale and unconscious in his arms. In a state of panic, Roland called out for aid. Meanwhile, within the opulent palace of the third Princess Garcia, 
the news of the king's tragic demise finally reached her ears. The letter conveyed a grim tale of how the monarch had been slain by the treacherous first prince, before being apprehended by the king's personal guard. The first prince was now sentenced to death by beheading. However, Garcia knew all too well that this was a plot hatched by the conniving second prince, who feared her and her army. The third princess realized that she needed to revise her plans, and so she summoned all the fleet captains to her office with an urgent edict. As her subordinate knelt before her, he addressed her as your highness before swiftly amending it to your majesty, the queen. As a few days went by, a temporary peace settled over the border town. There were no signs of a large horde of demonic beasts that had ravaged the town in the recent past, and all the injured soldiers had returned to their posts, fully healed. The entire town was brimming with high morale, and even Carter had managed to utilize the shell of a fallen beast as a part of the wall's defense. But as Roland made his way towards Anna's room, the hero who had made everything possible, he was greeted with the sad sight of her still lying in a coma after a week. Nanawa and Nightingale sat vigil beside Anna's bed, watching her with worried eyes. Nightingale broke the news that Anna would become of age this midnight, but Roland was concerned about her condition. Would it be safe for her to become of age while in a coma? Sadly, Nightingale revealed that Anna's chances of survival were slim. She explained that becoming of age required immense mental fortitude, and it would be impossible to endure the demonic torture while in a coma. Anna would most likely pass away. During Nightingale's tumultuous and unstable days, she bore witness to the demise of numerous witches. These individuals, akin to Nightingale herself, were regarded as nothing more than slaves and animals. They were hanged, burned alive, and subjected to torture as a form of entertainment for the nobles. Those who managed to flee were left to eke out a living in the wilderness, far from the trappings of human civilization, in the hopes of discovering the holy mountain. However, Anna was unlike any other which Nightingale had ever encountered. For the very first time, she beheld a witch who was cherished, loved, and trusted by countless people. Nightingale gritted her teeth, quivering with a mix of reluctance and solace, as she reassured Roland that even if Anna didn't survive the night, she had already discovered her very own holy mountain. Roland inhaled deeply, inundated with a flood of memories featuring Anna. As Roland stood beside Anna's bed, reminiscing about all the wonderful moments they had shared, Roland held tightly onto Anna's hand, knowing that this would be their final moment together. The snow and cold breeze outside the room only added to the solemnity of the occasion. As the clock ticked towards midnight, Nightingale sensed a sudden change in the air. Anna's body was radiating otherworldly energy, at first, Roland feared the worst that Anna was in excruciating pain. But to his surprise, Anna was calm and composed. Suddenly, the candle flickered and went out, plunging the room into darkness. But just as suddenly, Anna wakes up. A brilliant green flame burst to life in Anna's hand, illuminating the room and casting a strange, eerie glow on everything around them. Roland could hardly believe his eyes as Anna calmly extended her hand, offering him the strange green flame that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Roland watched in awe as Anna's green flame danced between her fingers as if it were alive. With a gentle nod, Anna gave Roland permission to touch the flame, and he reached out hesitantly, amazed when he felt no heat or burn. As Anna continued to control her flames with ease, Roland realized that her becoming of age had awakened a new ability within her. With this newfound power, Anna could control the temperature of her flames, manipulating them at will. The best explanation they could come up with was that Anna had used up all of her magical power during the fierce battle against the demonic beasts. This had somehow reduced the backfire that usually came with becoming of age, allowing her to safely complete the process. Both Nightingale and Roland knew all too well the dangers of being a witch. They were always forced to conceal their magical abilities and pretend to be normal humans. This burden placed a heavy toll on their bodies and often resulted in a backfire during their becoming of age. That's why most witches never made it through this crucial stage in their lives. The discovery they had made was of great significance, and Nightingale knew that she had to bring this message back to the Witch Association. Before she left, she promised to return with all her sisters, hoping that Roland would welcome them with open arms. Roland, however, was hesitant to let Nightingale leave so soon. With the month of the demon still ongoing, he feared for her safety with the demonic beasts still lurking out there. 
but Nightingale understood the urgency of her mission. The sooner she could deliver the message, the more witches would be able to survive the brutal becoming of H process. Barov rushed into Roland's office with urgent news. The ambassador from the Changu stronghold had arrived with a message for Roland. As he entered the conference hall to meet the ambassador, Roland could see the worry etched on the ambassador's face. Carefully reading through the letter, he knew immediately that it was not good news. Scrolling down the letter, Roland's heart sank as he read the cruel announcement of the king's death. Petrel, who was appointed by Duke Ryan, announcing the fight for the throne had ended, the new king of Greycastle would be His Majesty Timothy Wimbledon, Roland's second brother. Roland is informed that he had to return to the capital before the end of winter. Upon returning to his office, Roland couldn't shake off the suspicion surrounding the sudden deaths of the king and the first prince. He needed to act cautiously and wait to see how his two sisters would react before making any moves. Realizing that the kingdom was on the brink of instability, Roland swiftly advised Barov to get their family and relatives out of the capital as soon as possible. He ordered Barov, Carter, and their subordinates to write a family letter which would be sent with an escort to ensure their safe passage. In addition to ensuring the safety of his loved ones, Roland ordered a halt to the export of iron ores and initiated a new wave of recruitment. As Roland pondered his options, his mind raced with possibilities. He knew that if Duke Ryan saw him refusing to follow the king's order, he would likely take it as a sign of rebellion and move to attack the border town. However, Roland saw an opportunity in this situation. He could take advantage of the chaos and use it to launch an attack on the Changu stronghold, expanding his territory and claiming their wealth and population for himself. Roland couldn't help but feel a thrill of excitement as he considered the possibilities. With the right strategy, he will be one step closer to this ultimate goal. As Nightingale stepped into the valley, she was met with a seemingly impenetrable wall of vines blocking her path to the cave. With a flick of her hood, she revealed herself to Leaf, who wore two white bands on her arms, a telltale sign of the two witches who had fallen just days before. Nightingale's heart sank at the sight, as they made their way deeper into the cave. Wendy appeared, sprinting towards Nightingale and taking her hands in a tight grip. Turned out, Nightingale's real name was Veronica, a fact that surprised Wendy, who had been worried about the safety of Anna, the witch whom Nightingale had set out to bring back to the association. Nightingale launched into an explanation of her experience in the border town, sharing the news that the fourth prince was willing to take them in and keep them safe. Despite her enthusiasm, the other witches seemed hesitant to trust a human prince. To convince them, Nightingale revealed that both Anna and Nanoa had already been rescued, even before she arrived. This information, coupled with Nightingale's ability to detect lies, swayed some of the witches. She even showed them the blueprints for the steam machine which Roland had shared with her. But just as Nightingale was gaining momentum, a middle-aged woman from the crowd, whom Nightingale referred to as her mentor, stepped forward and denounced her speech. The woman was clearly unhappy with what Nightingale had said, and the room fell silent as she spoke. Back in Grey Castle, Timothy was presented with a top-quality crystal by one of his knights. The crystal had been confirmed by the Holy Church to be effective and not switched. However, Timothy couldn't shake off the nagging suspicion that witches might have been involved in the king's suicide. He immediately ordered his men to hunt down all the witches in the capital. Nightingale opened her eyes to find herself bound, and she recalled the events that led to her capture. She remembered how her mentor had denounced her speech and urged the other witches not to trust her. The mentor had even gone as far as to claim that Nightingale had been deceived by the humans and that the test of becoming of age was set out by the gods meant to test their physical and mental strength. She believed that those who failed the test were not worthy of seeking the holy mountain. Nightingale realized that it was impossible to convince her mentor, who had a cult-like mentality. Instead of arguing back, Nightingale tried convinced to have her sisters to choose whether they wanted to go but as she was about to speak, she suddenly felt a sharp pain in her leg and realized she had been bitten by a snake. She fell to the ground, helpless and vulnerable. Mentor loomed over her, holding the god's locket that had drained Nightingale of her powers. Mentor accused Nightingale of betrayal and threatened her with punishment, brandishing a hot knife against her throat. Nightingale tried to reason with Mentor, explaining that she only wanted to help her sisters and give them a chance at a better life. 
but Mentor refused to listen and threw the blueprint for the steam machine into the fire, destroying any hope of progress. Wendy let out a piercing cry, demanding that her mentor cease this senseless violence. Wendy sided with Nightingale, believing that everyone deserves the right to choose their own destiny. The air was thick with tension as the group stood in stunned silence, each hesitant to make the first move. Nightingale had committed no heinous act against the association, and so Wendy implored to release Nightingale, eventually, most of the witches came to a consensus, and Mentor's eyes blazed with fury as she raised her blade to strike Nightingale down. But Wendy was not about to stand idly by and watch as her friend was mercilessly slaughtered. With a flick of her wrist, she summoned her witch powers and disarmed Mentor, shattering the locket that had held Nightingale captive. Mentor seethed with anger, and in a fit of rage, lunged at Wendy with her snake, biting onto Wendy's arm, Nightingale swiftly and skillfully, she plunged her blade into Mentor, allowing herself and Wendy to escape the cave and make a break for freedom. Despite their successful escape from the cave, the venom coursing through Wendy's arm had already begun to spread. Nightingale was forced to make a grim decision, she had to amputate Wendy's arm. The wound was hastily bandaged, but Nightingale couldn't stop the bleeding. She knew that the only hope to save Wendy is to ask Nanawa's help back in the border town, but unsure if Wendy can make it there. That was when a sudden apparition appeared behind Nightingale, a bright-haired girl who floated effortlessly in the air. Her name was Lightning, and she had recently joined the association. Lightning believed every word that Nightingale said, and she was curious about the outside world. As someone who had always yearned to become an explorer, she understood the importance of being able to choose one's own fate. Lightning's supernatural ability to fly proved to be a godsend. Nightingale wasted no time in securing Wendy to her back before leaping onto Lightning's own back, setting a course for Bordertown. As they soared through the sky, Nightingale revealed her past and how she met Wendy, it was Wendy who had once saved her from a life of misery. Nightingale had once lived with her family in the bustling city of Silver Light, but when she was just 14 years old, a violent riot caused her parents to go missing, leaving her and her younger brother alone in the world. Her uncle had taken them in, but Nightingale's life took a dark turn when she discovered her witch powers that same year. Nightingale's uncle locked her up and began training her to be an assassin. He threatened her with the safety of her beloved brother, forcing her to hone her skills and carry out his twisted bidding. The uncle ordered Nightingale to sabotage, murder, and poison all of the Glen family's enemies. Years had passed since Nightingale last saw her beloved brother, Hyde. Her heart filled with hope as she finally reunited with him, but his hateful words shattered her to her core. Hyde denounced Nightingale as his sister and proclaimed that all witches should be burned in hell and hanged. Despite the pain of her brother's betrayal, Nightingale persevered. She endured the grueling becoming of age and eventually found the strength to revenge on her tyrannical uncle. It was then that she crossed paths with Wendy, whose infectious smile slowly began to heal Nightingale's broken heart. Guided by Wendy's unwavering support, Nightingale found a new purpose. It was a cruel twist of fate that Mentor had become so extreme, brainwashing all of the other witches in the association. Roland and Anna were engrossed in their work, tending to the intricate inner workings of the steam machine. However, their concentration was broken by a thunderous crash as lightning landed with a jolt, the impact echoing throughout the workshop. Roland paced back and forth, his mind racing with possibilities. Could it be that the association had been attacked and only the three of them managed to escape? His thoughts were interrupted as the door creaked open and lightning emerged, reassuring Roland that everyone was fine. As they conversed, lightning couldn't help but smile at the caring nature of Roland, who proved himself to be a true prince who valued the lives of witches. She then revealed that most of the witches in the association didn't believe Nightingale's story, and even she had been skeptical at first. After some exchange of jokes, Roland returned to his residence, where Nightingale greeted him in her pajamas. Her curvaceous figure and temptatious position left Roland feeling like a raging bull, wondering if fate had finally smiled upon him. Suddenly, Nightingale stood up, slowly approaching Roland with a serious look in her eyes. She dropped to one knee and swore under her name as Nightingale and Veronica an oath of loyalty to Roland, pledging to become as both the shield that fends off all demons, 
and the blade to pierce through the darkness until her very last breath, as long as Roland will promise to treat the witches with kindness and care. Roland grasped the gravity of the Witch Association's failure to support Nightingale. This made Nightingale look to Roland as a beacon of hope to lead the witches, Roland yearned to collaborate with Nightingale as an equal, but the people of this world have yet to understand the values of equality, peace, and liberty. Determined to do what was right, Roland took up the dagger and embraced the loyalty that Nightingale offered him. As a symbol of the night's ritual, Roland tapped Nightingale's shoulder three times, completing the solemn ritual. As the night wore on, Roland and Nightingale made their way back to Wendy's quarters, clutching a contract in hand. They arrived with a proposition, Wendy could work for Roland and stay in Bordertown. This was an urgent matter for Roland, for the longer they waited, the more precarious the situation became. Roland was determined to uncover a path for all witches to safely become of age without facing the malevolent tortures of demonic power. The following morning, Roland shared his theory with the others. He posited that witches were akin to vessels, holding an ever-increasing amount of magical power within them as they grew older. This energy would accumulate until it reached a threshold that surpassed the body's capacity, causing damage and distress. During the dreaded month of the demons, this power would surge to unprecedented potency. However, Anna was an exception to this rule as she trained her abilities relentlessly and expended all her power during the battle before becoming of age. This resulted in her falling into a deep coma, but she emerged from it unscathed. Roland pledged to create a safe haven for witches to freely unleash their powers. Under his leadership, no one would dare to arrest or harm them. Both Wendy and Lightning had already signed the contract, eagerly anticipating Roland's next order. To their surprise, Roland simply smiled and instructed them to keep practicing their abilities until they could wield them at the same level as Anna and Nightingale. Roland requested that Wendy and Lightning demonstrate their powers. Lightning soared into the air with graceful ease, while Wendy expertly manipulated the wind. Nanawa turned to Anna with a thoughtful expression, remarking on the profound changes she had noticed in Nightingale's demeanor since the last time she had met Roland. Nanawa talked about Nightingale's tone and the soft expression in her eyes when around Roland, Anna seemed oblivious to what Nanawa is trying to convey to her. Struggling to comprehend the meaning. The peaceful atmosphere was abruptly shattered by the sound of an alarm ringing in the distance, signaling the imminent arrival of demonic beasts. Roland sprang into action, hurrying to the wall to meet up with Axe. Though no beasts were visible, Axe pointed to a hybrid creature in the distance, a four-eyed lion with formidable wings and razor-sharp fangs protruding from its jaws. It was the same hybrid that almost got Axe killed a few years back, as the beast slowly advanced toward the wall, Axe ordered his men to prioritize Roland's safety. But to everyone's surprise, the hybrid creature abruptly came to a halt just a few meters away from the wall, its intentions unclear. In the blink of an eye, the hybrid beast sprang into action, leaving the ground and soaring through the air with incredible speed. Roland shouted orders to his men to fire upon the beast, but it was too quick, and let out a deafening roar that knocked everyone off balance. The creature then lunged at the wall, choosing the weakest point of its defenses. Roland's worst fears were realized when Axe warned that the beast had breached the wall and was heading toward the residential area. Without a moment's hesitation, Roland ordered his squad to follow him while leaving a reserve force to guard the wall. Roland quickly realized that he had underestimated the intelligence of these beasts. This particular hybrid had likely spent years observing and learning how to spot weaknesses in defensive infrastructure, having previously attacked the Changbu stronghold. A piercing cry reverberated in the corner, causing the men to hasten toward the source. It was one of the residents who had fallen prey to the ravenous beast. Roland incensed at the sight of the bloodstains on the pristine snow, suddenly emerged from the shadows. The creature ambushed the squad from an unexpected building, pouncing on a hapless soldier who had no time to react. Amidst the pandemonium, the soldiers were unable to discharge their flintlocks. Axe swiftly ordered a few men to ascend to higher ground and shoot at will. One soldier took aim and fired, the bullet narrowly missing the ferocious creature. The shot caught the beast's attention, providing Axe with an opportunity to close in on it. 
He aimed his flintlock at the creature's head and fired, the bullet piercing its brain. The monster succumbed to the attack, as extra bullets sealed its fate. In the frigid northern region of Grey Castle, within the Hermes line of defense, a colossal wave of demonic beasts converged on the wall, attempting to breach its imposing height. Among the thrones of friends, a worm-like hybrid scaled the wall with effortless agility. Within moments, it had successfully penetrated the fortification, its cavernous maw unleashing a horde of hundreds, if not thousands, of demonic beasts upon the hapless soldiers defending the wall. The Judgment Army scrambled to retreat, only to find themselves at the mercy of the enemy. With the outer city lost and just a handful of soldiers remaining, their prospects were dire. Suddenly, an eagle-like demonic beast soared through the sky, followed by yet another wave of demonic beasts. The female soldier in charge ordered her men to ingest a pill and prepare for battle. In an instant, a powerful red aura enveloped their bodies, their eyes turning crimson as they entered a berserk state, ready to face their foes. A resounding cry within the walls halted the judgment army in its tracks. A battalion of towering soldiers clad in full black metallic armor, each bearing a cross insignia, emerged from the shadows. A dozen of these black armored soldiers strode past the stunned judgment soldiers, marching resolutely toward the demonic wave. Suddenly, a colossal demonic beast swooped down from above, its claws sharper than the most finely crafted blades. To everyone's amazement, one of the black armored soldiers firmly grasped the creature's massive claw, holding it at bay. Another soldier aimed his spear at the beast and plunged it into its head, killing the monstrous hybrid in a single blow. The emotionless soldiers drew their weapons and charged toward the remaining beasts. In the sky tower of the Holy Church, three bishops watched the battle from afar. From their conversation, it was clear they were unsurprised by the outcome. They revealed that the 1,000 men sent by the four kingdoms as reinforcements had perished on the wall, serving as nothing more than cannon fodder. Despite the losses, the bishops were pleased with the result. To achieve this victory, they sacrificed many of the judgment army and used countless pills. The older bishop named Felon remarked that it was inevitable, citing the holy book, which prophesied that time was running out for them. The holy church needed to unite the entire continent, or else they would face utter destruction. The female bishop Heather sneered and remarked that perhaps their actions were worse than those of the demonic beasts. Even the beasts had more compassion than they did. Felon rebuked her and reminded her not to question the word of the gods. With a hearty laugh, Bishop Heather reassured the elder pastor, telling him not to fret over the matter. She quipped that perhaps the god had a soft spot for the demonic forces. In his heart, Bishop Maine concurred with Bishop Heather's sentiment. He believed that the god of their faith showed no favor to either the human or the demons, rather, the deity only seemed to support those who emerged victorious. Carter, observing from the sidelines, found it strange to witness a member of the royal family attending the funeral of a common soldier with no noble lineage or peerage to their name. Some of the deceased didn't even possess proper names or surnames. However, Roland saw things differently. He had heard that funerals were typically reserved for high-ranking nobles and royalty. Moreover, there had never been a proper funeral in Bordertown where death was an all-too-familiar occurrence, especially during the dreaded Month of the Demons. In such dire times, there was simply no time to mourn the fallen or give them a proper burial, with their remains often laid to rest somewhere in the wilderness. But Roland felt that every life was worth honoring and that every death deserved proper acknowledgement. So, he had taken it upon himself to pay his respects to the brave warriors who had given their lives to protect the town and its inhabitants. It was a small but meaningful gesture, one that the residents of Bordertown would not forget. The idea was to foster a sense of unity amongst the army, to help them understand whom they were fighting for and the purpose behind their battle. Once people began to ponder these things, a newfound sense of purpose was ignited within them. The spirit of the army can be uplifted, and a renewed zeal was born. This was no longer just a mindless conflict but a cause that they could all rally behind. The soldiers now had a clear vision of what they were fighting for and the impact it would have on their lives and the lives of those they were sworn to protect. 
Roland had a grand plan in mind, one that required the production of his first cannon. After the funeral, as he and Aji's grieving widow stood in the distance, two soldiers observed them from afar. One of them expressed empathy towards the bereaved woman who had been left alone to raise two young children. The other soldier reminded his comrade that Roland had fulfilled his promises to them during their enlistment. Indeed, Aji's wife had received Aji's wages and a form of compensation known as a pension. In addition, she would be provided with essential provisions such as food and coal every month. This was a testament to Roland's commitment to his soldiers and their families, further strengthening the morale of his army. Suddenly, Vayner turned around, his keen eyes spotting a shadowy figure in the distance. Meanwhile, Roland made his way to the workshop, where he eagerly inquired about the progress on the barrels for the flintlocks. Anna had good news to report. Everything is on the right track, as Roland showed her the blueprint for the 12-pounder long gun, an intermediary caliber piece of artillery, Anna set to work, expertly extracting molten steel and pouring it into the waiting mold. As the day wore on and the work continued, Roland's gaze lingered on Anna, who was working with great focus and dedication. He couldn't help but be struck by her beauty and grace, and when he noticed the beads of sweat on her brow, he pulled out a handkerchief and tenderly wiped them away. Their eyes met, and both blushed at the sudden intensity of the moment. As the day drew to a close, headed back for dinner, unaware that they were being watched by a mysterious figure lurking in the shadows. Little did they know that this man had just witnessed something shocking, the fourth prince was living with a witch. The spy wasted no time in relaying this information to Timothy. As the spy made his way through the army's training grounds, he couldn't help but sneer at the soldiers as they ran around in circles, seemingly wasting their time and energy. His mind was preoccupied with the strange things he had witnessed in the past week, the sudden appearance of a wall, the existence of a deadly metal stick that could kill hybrids, and the shocking revelation that the fourth prince was living with a witch. The spy's thoughts were consumed by the potential rewards he would receive from Timothy for bringing him this valuable information. Little did he know, however, that Varner had been keeping a close eye on his every move. Suddenly, Vayner's voice rang out, alerting everyone to the presence of a spy in their midst. In a flash, the spy found himself surrounded by over a dozen soldiers. As Bereff sat in his office, he was presented with Roland's latest request to purchase a schooner without the need for a captain or any crew. Bereff scratched his head, perplexed at how he was supposed to transport the boat without any sailors. While he relished his newfound power and authority over all legislation and law, Roland's fanciful ideas often proved to be quite challenging to implement. Bereff's heart sank as he processed the news of yet another spy in their midst. This Carl, or Marmot as he was nicknamed, had been living among them for months, posing as a relative of a border town resident he had killed. The spy was sent by the second prince Timothy, Bereff told his student, to organize the documents, the sentence the spy by hanging, sitting in his chair, Bereff couldn't help but recall the conversation he had with Roland, where he had expressed his concern about the spies sent by other princes and princesses. They were short on manpower to capture these spies, Roland, however, had a plan. He believed that the residents of Bordertown could help them capture all the spies. They were the eyes and ears of the city, telling Bereff to post an announcement, once anyone spotted suspicious activity or person, then report it to the city hall, offering a reward of 15 silver to anyone who reported a spy. Bereff was skeptical, but clearly, it worked. A month had passed in the grand capital of Grey Castle, and not a single one of Timothy's siblings had returned. Frustrated, he turned to one of his ministers, who reported that Roland had sent a letter saying he would return once the month of the demon had ended. But the letter didn't refer to Timothy as, Your Majesty, or, The King. Timothy sneered, not taking Roland seriously. He then asked about his youngest sister, only to discover that she had disappeared along with her housekeeper and two maids after confirming the letter. Timothy knew that Garcia will not comply with his order. As he ordered the minister to tell Duke Joai to attack Garcia, before he could finish his order, a knight rushed in, informing that Duke Joai had been defeated by Garcia's army five days ago and that Garcia had taken charge of Eagle City and declared herself queen. Most of the lords seemed to honor her, 
and to Timothy's shock, the entire southern part of Grey Castle was now completely independent. As Axe and Carter pushed the massive artillery through the streets of southern Bordertown, they couldn't help but wonder why Roland had assigned them to protect it. The cumbersome metal contraption seemed like more trouble than it was worth, and they couldn't fathom why anyone would want to steal it. Meanwhile, Lightning's eyes lit up with excitement as she prepared the artillery for use. As long as there were new inventions for her to tinker with, Lightning was more than happy to work for Roland for free. She meticulously cleaned the bore, ensuring that no debris could cause any problems. Roland turned to the soldiers and began to instruct them on how to use the artillery. First, insert the gunpowder. He said, as he demonstrated the steps. Then add the shell, making sure it's tightly packed in the back. Stab the gunpowder bag and insert the fuse. Roland gave the order for his men to retreat to a safer distance as he lit the fuse on the 12-pounder artillery. In a matter of seconds, the projectile was launched with incredible force, easily piercing through the armor like a hot knife through butter and landing hundreds of meters away. The onlookers were awed by the immense power of the cannon, and Carter couldn't help but express his concern over the weapon's weight and complexity. He pointed out that each 12-pounder would require a team of five or six men to operate. Despite the downsides, Roland remained resolute. He firmly believed that the benefits of the artillery outweighed any potential drawbacks. He told Carter that with just three cannons, he could take out Duke Ryan, he coughed and then said he means the dreaded turtle demon beast. Roland had a brilliant idea to transport the 12-pounder cannon and half of his troops across the river using boats. With Wendy's remarkable gift of controlling the wind, they could outmaneuver the Duke's army by flanking them. But Roland's cunning plan came crashing down when Barov delivered some distressing news. The cost of a schooner was far too high, averaging between 80 to 120 gold royals just for constructing a boat, plus the crew, then it will be at least 200 gold royals, even if they were to use half of the city hall's balance which is just about 300 gold royals to purchase one, they would be unable to pay their soldiers next month. Roland returned to his office, disheartened that no one would sell them a boat without requiring the crew as well. While other towns had the luxury of purchasing a boat alone, it was far too distant for them to travel. But Roland wasn't one to give up easily. In a moment of sheer brilliance, he devised a plan to construct a boat on his own. He pondered over the design, taking into consideration its utility and efficiency. Finally, he settled on building a flat barge. But the dilemma was choosing a suitable material. Wood was not a viable option, and iron was out of the question since he needed it for the gun barrels. After much deliberation, he hit upon a solution. What if he used the leftover cement to construct the ship? He could use wooden planks for the outer shell and allocate metal bars to reinforce the structure. Then he could pour in the cement, which would be cheap, easy to craft, and possess high durability. Roland wasted no time in getting to work. He whipped out his sketch pad and began drawing the blueprint for the ship. To his delight, he managed to construct a makeshift shipbuilding workshop near the lake. Lightning, who happened to be nearby, was intrigued by the new project. She assumed it was a giant bathtub for Roland and couldn't help but chuckle when he revealed that it was a ship. Lightning had grown up on ships, accompanying her father, Thunder, who was the greatest explorer the world had ever known. Wendy was pleased to see Roland and Lightning bonding so well, but her thoughts drifted to the Witch Association, wondering if her sister was doing all right. Meanwhile, in the valley, a group of witches was braving the blizzard as they made their way forward. One of the witches reported a trace of a demonic beast approaching, which filled Mentor's heart with hatred toward Nightingale. The group worked together, with Leaf using her vines to trap the beast and the others depriving it of air, suffocating it in the process. As the sun set, the group decided to set up camp nearby. The Mentor raised her head and spotted a strange city with peculiar structures. They were tall and pointy, and the mentor's eyes glimmered with excitement as she declared that this was the holy mountain. But some of the witches felt uneasy because, according to the ancient books, the holy mountain was supposed to be a breathtaking sight with golden radiance shining all around it. 
Moreover, they saw something crumpled up in the holes, which added to their suspicions. The mentor shouted at the group to keep moving forward, but Leaf hesitated. She knew that she couldn't convince the mentor to change course. As they advanced towards the city, another which fell from her injuries. Despite this, the mentor urged them to keep going, unwilling to let anything stand in their way. As the hours passed, the city didn't seem to get any closer. Some witches suggested setting up a camp for their safety, but the mentor let out a loud cry. She claimed that this was just a test from the gods to determine their mental fortitude, and they couldn't stop there. Suddenly, the witch carrying the mentor on her back realized that the holy mountain had disappeared. Leaf remembered what Lightning had once said, and she knew that they had been deceived. It wasn't the holy mountain, but a mirage. It was a phenomenon that produced a displaced image of distant objects, and everything they saw was an illusion. Even if it did exist, it could be very far away. However, the mentor insisted on continuing their journey. Out of nowhere, a sense of impending doom swept over the group of witches. One of them, sharp-eyed and quick-witted, caught a glimpse of something hurtling towards them with terrifying speed. But before she could even cry out a warning, a spear plunged into her body with brutal force, sending her hurtling several meters away. In the midst of the chaos, malevolent forces emerged. The coven of witches sprang into action, forming a battle formation to fend off the demons. One of the witches summoned a swamp to impede the demons' advance. Undaunted, the two demons rode on the back of their wolf mounts, using them as a springboard to leap toward their prey. With razor-sharp claws raised high, they struck down one of the witches in a swift and deadly blow. The witches fought back valiantly, launching their own magical attacks in retaliation. One witch used a powerful fireball to scorch one of the demons, saving her friend who had been stunned. One leaf trapped one of the demons with her vines, and the other demon hurled a spear in her direction. The spear narrowly missed, the trapped demon then unleashed a surge of electricity from its claws, targeting a group of unsuspecting witches. Before they could even react, all three were struck down, their lives snuffed out in an instant. As the dust settled, the lone mentor stared in terror at the towering, demonic figures that strode towards her. These were the very creatures that haunted her darkest nightmares. With razor-sharp claws glinting in the dim light, the mentor summoned all of her snakes biting the demon, and the snake attack was a veil. But one of the snakes managed to tear the tube connecting to the demon, the demon before her was engulfed in a cloud of crimson fog, killing the mentor in an instant, the demon writhed and convulsed in agony, and soon fall to the ground lifeless, Leaf, who had been watching from a distance, took note of this strange phenomenon. With the knowledge that the tube might hold the key to defeating these monstrous creatures, she picked up a crossbow and aimed it straight at the remaining demon. With all of her might, Leaf aimed the crossbow at the final demon, taking careful aim at the tube that seemed to be their source of weakness. As she released the arrow, time seemed to slow down, and she watched in awe as it soared through the air, its trajectory true and steady. With a thunderous crash, piercing the tube and sending the demon into a final, writhing convulsion before falling lifeless to the ground. Leaf let out a shuddering breath, realizing that the battle was finally over. But as she looked around her, the true cost of victory became all too clear. Her comrades lay strewn about her, their lifeless bodies a haunting reminder of the toll that had been exacted in this brutal conflict. Overwhelmed with grief and despair, Leaf fell to her knees, tears streaming down her face as she cried out in anguish, the sound echoing through the valley like a mournful wail. Back in border town, Nanoa lay in her bed, surrounded by her closest companions. Roland, Anna, Lightning, Nightingale, and her father stood by her side, their eyes filled with worry and concern. With a sense of trepidation, Nanoa looked up at the group and asked the question that weighed heavy on her heart. Am I going to die? Roland spoke up, his voice calm and steady. You will not die, Nanoa. He said, his words ringing with conviction. Nanoa let out a shuddering breath, relieved to hear the group's words of reassurance. Since Nanoa has been using her ability daily, she should be able to go through the process peacefully. Hopefully. Wendy gently tapped on Nanawa's noggin, assuring her that everything would turn out all right. 
Mr. Pine, anxious about his daughter's condition, clutched onto Nanola's hand, pledging to stay by her side no matter what. Meanwhile, Roland and Lightning tried their best to lift Nanola's spirits. Lightning regaled her with tales of daring adventures, while Roland attempted to dazzle her with a coin trick that was simply magical. Nanola's eyes met Anna's, who approached her with a tenderness that warmed her heart. Anna whispered soothing words, promising that everyone would be there for her. A soft peck on Nanawa's forehead sealed the deal. As time marched on, the group lost themselves in time. <sighs> the night passed uneventfully, and even Nightingale, with her keen sense of magic, detected no abnormalities in Nanawa's core. Suddenly, a rooster's crow pierced the air, signaling the arrival of a new day. Roland swept open the curtains, allowing a brilliant shaft of sunshine to flood the room. Nanawa stirred, roused from her slumber by the morning's radiance. The group breathed a collective sigh of relief, ecstatic that Nanawa had made it through the first day of awakening. Wendy's heart swelled with hope as she gazed at Roland. She believed he held the key to a brighter future for their fellow witch sisters and she pleaded with him to spread the word far and wide. Roland's nod of agreement set her mind at ease, he had already been formulating a plan of action. He predicted that once the month of the demons had passed, the townsfolk would be more accepting of witches. He intended to dispatch the news as a form of rumors. He knew all too well that if he openly recruited witches, the kingdom would erupt in chaos. But Roland was nothing if determined. He swore an oath that one day, he would overthrow the church and ascend to the throne. That was when the winds of change would truly sweep across the land, transforming the witch's fate for good. Wendy felt a thrill of anticipation, it was a dangerous, audacious goal, but if anyone could pull it off, it was Roland. She pledged to stand by him every step of the way. As the group of soldiers stood before the frozen lake, their talk revolved around the massive ship that Roland was constructing. The introduction of the cannon had given rise to a new branch, and while the flintlock team had been rehearsing ceaselessly for days, the newly created cannon team had yet to fire a single projectile. Varner couldn't help but ponder the true purpose of the cannon. He weighed the sheer heft of the weapon in his mind, wondering if its only utility was for defending walls against the demonic beasts. However, he swiftly pushed that notion aside, there had to be more to it. And then, as if a bolt of lightning had struck him, he thought of the ship that his highness was building. There had to be a deeper significance to it all. Later that afternoon, on the western fringes of the border town, Axe was busy assembling the cannon team in preparation for its maiden firing. It seemed that there was some friendly rivalry between the team members, likely due to the extra five silver offered to those on the cannon team. Once Roland had finalized the team members, he was eager to move on to the next phase, testing the new concrete ship which he named. Little Town All that remained was to complete the construction of the ship, apply an anti-corrosion treatment, and build a platform for Wendy to control the winds. Wendy had been tirelessly practicing her wind manipulation skills in the garden for days now, and Roland had appointed his most trusted knight, Carter, as the captain of the little town. With a resounding boom, the cannon team successfully fired its first projectile, and Roland knew that a thrilling new journey lay ahead. With the ship finally completed and the crew assembled, Roland had carefully selected his most trusted men to assume positions on the vessel. Carter, the seasoned knight, was appointed captain, Mr. Pine as the messenger, and Lightning as navigator. Lightning was ecstatic at the prospect of testing out the new concrete ship, the likes of which she had never seen before, she was fascinated by how the sail was made out of all types of animal hide. As the crew worked to prepare the vessel, Lightning took her position and shouted, Raise the sail and set sail. However, their lack of experience was immediately evident. Carter had no idea what was going on, and Brian, who had been appointed helmsman, was unsure how to perform a hard right rudder. 
Confused and questioning how many times he should turn to the right, Lightning had to intervene and correct Brian, telling him to turn the helm all the way to the left. Seeing Brian's confusion, Lightning let out a sigh and took the helm herself. As the ship finally sailed steadily, Lightning bellowed toward Wendy, signaling her to unleash her ability. A grin spread across Wendy's face as she positioned herself for the task at hand. Memories of her conversation with Roland flooded her mind, in which he had urged her to keep honing her ability until she can fully control her ability like Nightingale and Anna, however, Wendy had struggled to control her powers before arriving at the border town. In the past, she had only managed to use them to dry meat or sheets. But now, with a determined look in her eyes, she took a deep breath and whipped her wrist, conjuring a powerful gust of wind that propelled the ship forward. The crew gaped in amazement at her impressive feat, marveling at Roland's incredible talent for transforming stones into a seaworthy vessel. As time passed, Lightning's expert guidance helped Brian master the art of steering the ship, much to the crew's admiration. Wendy had been pushing herself to the limit, channeling her magical powers to their fullest extent, but it was taking a toll on her body. She had never used her abilities for such a prolonged period, and now, as the ship drew closer to the shore, she was struggling to keep going. Despite her best efforts, Wendy collapsed, her face turning a ghastly shade of purple, a clear sign of frostbite. Lightning sprang into action, swooping down to scoop up the stricken Wendy from the high tower. Her hair and clothes were frozen stiff, and the crew gathered anxiously around her, checking her condition. Carter wasted no time in giving orders, directing the ship towards the safety of the shore. However, the vessel collided with the river bank, causing everyone to jolt forward. Thankfully, the ship emerged unscathed. Carter urged Lightning to swiftly transport Wendy to the safety of the castle while the rest of the crew stayed behind to gather the sails. The first test of the little town could not be deemed a complete failure, but it was far from a resounding success. Carter concluded that they would need to work on how to keep Wendy warm and work more on their anti-collision. As the snowflakes cascaded down from the leaden skies, a carriage trundled its way into a small town up north. Inside the carriage, a stern-looking pastor who was whipping a young girl. The child's sobs seemed to irritate him, and he threatened her with dire consequences if she didn't quiet him down. The coachman glanced back, silently thanking the heavens for the pastor's intervention. Without him, the poor orphans wouldn't have survived the harsh winter. Moments later, the pastor barked orders at the coachman, instructing him to keep driving. Suddenly, the coachman asked the pastor if the orphans were from the Wolfhart Kingdom. The pastor confirmed that most of them were and that only a few of the orphans would be taken in by the church due to the scarcity of food. He praised the coachman for his hard work and abruptly ended the conversation. The coachman was being paid a princely sum of 20 silver coins for transporting the orphans. Hours later, they arrived at a motel where the pastor greeted two men and asked them to choose a girl. The coachman watched on from the window, knowing exactly what the pastor had planned, but he didn't seem to care. Bishop Main strode into a curious building that resembled a massive naturally formed sinkhole, it was so vast that he always wondered if this was a gift from God, the cathedral was built atop the sinkhole, acting as a symbol of the holy building. Within the sinkhole, and the real heart of the church lay hidden within. After a few moments, Main reached the bottom, where two black armored soldiers from the punishment army guarded the entrance. An officer welcomed Maine at the door, the officer is one of many loyal soldiers who lived here and dedicated their lives to protecting the church's secrets. Maine's destination was the prison area, where the church detained their enemies, criminals, and even innocent people. Upon hearing Maine's arrival, anguished screams and cries echoed throughout the prison. The prisoners pleaded to be released, or even to be put out of their misery. Maine strode towards a gate, which he unlocked before instructing the guard to remain outside. He closed the door behind him and entered the cell, alone. 
As Maine looked at the frail figure imprisoned in the tiny cell, he acted l a pang of sympathy for the man. The man trapped inside had suffered greatly during his long captivity, with his gaunt face and sunken eyes telling a story of neglect and despair. Maine tried to offer some small comfort to the man, telling him that the church had been providing him with the finest meals all made standards in accordance with the king, turned out, the man imprisoned behind the cell was no other than the king of the Grey Castle, Roland's father, Majesty Wimbledon III, but the king's thoughts were not on his comfort but on the fate of his family. He eagerly questioned Maine about the whereabouts and well-being of his children, but the news was not good. The eldest son, Gerald, had been executed by his second son, Timothy, beheaded on charges of treason and assassination of the king, the third daughter, Garcia, had declared independence in the south and declared as the queen and was now locked in a bitter war with her brother Timothy for control of the kingdom. As for Roland, and the youngest daughter Maine had little information to offer. It was clear, however, that the once great kingdom of Grey Castle was in turmoil, with civil war looming on the horizon. As the terrible news sank in, the old king's worn face betrayed his disbelief. He couldn't fathom the legitimacy of the story. Bishop Maine, however, had more to reveal. Bishop Maine said few words, he said. Fight for the throne. One that had assigned each of the king's children a territory and set them against each other, vying for control. At end of the five-year term, whoever came on top will become the new king, Maine revealed that the church had masterminded this scheme, which left the old king with a deep sense of pain and betrayal. Suddenly, the old king's memories came flooding back. He remembered the day of his kidnapping, the day of the church's prayers. They had brought him to a chamber and stripped him of his clothes and his god locket. The church had used a witch to replace him, taking control of the kingdom and building their churches in every town. As the old king tried to process the shocking information, his mind raced with questions. Why would his children turn on each other? How could the church be so cruel as to force them into a fight for the throne? He couldn't understand why they would choose such a violent path when they could have taken over the kingdom slowly and quietly. Tears streamed down his face as he became more emotionally agitated, coughing and struggling to speak. Meanwhile, Maine just looked at the old king, his face twisted in a sneer of disdain. He revealed that the king's children may not be as noble and united as he had thought. The king's third daughter, Garcia, had been secretly building her army for years, with the sole purpose of overthrowing the true successor, Gerald, the first prince, and placing herself on the throne. Maine went on to explain that this wasn't just happening to the old king, it was happening in the other three kingdoms as well. The church was determined to gain total control over the land and eliminate any opposition and completely remove the royal family from their roots and become the sole ruling power of the land. Despite Maine's attempt to comfort the old king with the knowledge that he wasn't alone in his suffering, the truth was crushing. The church's ruthless plan had thrown the kingdom into chaos, pitting families against each other and tearing the land apart. Maine divulged all that the old monarch yearned to know, but the moment had arrived to terminate the king's existence. The withering gaze of the old ruler focused on Bishop Maine's countenance as his voice faded away. With his final breath, he cursed Maine and the entire church, damning them to the fiery abyss and rot in hell. Soon after, the old king succumbed and collapsed onto the cold, hard ground. Unperturbed, Maine's heartless demeanor showed no signs of remorse as he exited the prison cell leaving behind the remnants of the monarch's legacy as if nothing of consequence had occurred. The once mighty ruler had been reduced to a frail. Meanwhile, in the Witch Association's encampment, the witches bore witness to the deaths of two more of their comrades during the becoming of age ceremony. The loss of these two lives only added to the despair felt by those who survived the initial encounter with the demons. With dwindling supplies and no guarantee of survival through the harsh winter, the witches were left feeling hopeless and uncertain about their future. Just then, a figure stumbled into the campsite, bruised and battered, and collapsed onto the ground. It was Leaf the only survivor of the group that had ventured out into the wilderness. She had used her magical abilities to fashion clothing made of plant material, which helped to protect her from the frigid snow and biting wind. Due to the frostbite, Leaf had some of her toes removed. As Leaf recovered from her injuries, her fellow witches gathered around her. 
One of the older girls suggested that Leaf take the place of their mentor and become their new leader, as she was the only one among them with any fighting ability. After a moment of contemplative silence, Leaf agreed with the proposal. But she knew that they couldn't stay in the encampment for long. They needed to find Nightingale. Upon hearing Leaf's suggestion of searching for the Nightingale, the group dispersed in trepidation. They were uncertain whether the Nightingale could be trusted, and whether the border town was as safe as she had claimed it to be. Wendy and the Nightingale might have already met their demise within the town's confines. Leaf declared that she would be the first to assess the situation, while the others would wait outside the town and search for a secure location. If the Nightingale was lying, Leaf would take on the mantle of leadership. However, if Leaf were to perish within the town, Scroll, the eldest girl in the group, would have to step up and take on the leadership role. Although Scroll was hesitant, Leaf reassured her that combat and fighting were not necessary for leadership. She knew that Scroll had the same courage as Wendy, being one of the earliest members of their association. Scroll then inquired about what would happen if the Nightingale's words proved true. After a moment of contemplation, Leaf replied that if Nightingale was indeed telling the truth, then they might have just stumbled upon their true holy mountain in the border town. In the border town, a horde of demonic beasts charged toward the wall with ferocious intent. The well-trained soldiers were unfazed by the onslaught, having battled such creatures many times before. The once thought invincible demonic beasts were reduced to mere savage animals in the face of their disciplined defense. Vayner held his spear steady, ready to pierce the body of an infected wolf charging toward him. With practiced precision, he impaled the beast and sent it tumbling down from the walls. This had become second nature to the soldiers, their movements and instincts honed to perfection through countless battles. The demonic beasts had been relentlessly attacking the walls for the past few hours, yet the soldiers stood firm. Vayner surveyed the men guarding the walls with pride, realizing that in just a matter of months, His Highness had transformed these men into formidable warriors capable of defending against the most fearsome of foes. Once, only the knights from the Changu stronghold had been able to hold off such a relentless assault, but now these soldiers were proving to be equally capable if not much better. In the distance, a menacing hybrid creature appeared, but the men remained unflustered. Everything was proceeding according to plan, as they lay in wait for the beast to fall into their trap. Lightning took up her position, poised and ready for action. Suddenly, a soldier shouted that the hybrid was within range. Roland barked orders, commanding everyone to prepare for battle. Lightning began hurling rocks at the creature, expertly luring it in her direction. The beast was enraged and started chasing after lightning, while Nightingale guided Anna in the shadow dimensions, Anna materialized from a portal, summoning her powers to engulf the beast in flames. In a matter of seconds, the hybrid was reduced to nothing but a pile of dust. Without warning, the other demonic beasts suddenly retreated, bewildered by the unusual turn of events. A soldier pointed to the sky, where the clouds were dissipating, giving way to warm beams of sunlight. This signaled the end of the month of the demons, and the soldiers breathed a collective sigh of relief. Shortly after the decisive victory, Roland stood on a podium, gazing out at his proud soldiers. He announced that the month of the demons had officially ended, and the crowd erupted in excitement and cheers. Everyone was screaming. Long live his highness. Glorifying Roland for his unwavering leadership. Roland then took a moment to praise the bravery and heroism of his soldiers, commending them for their valiant efforts in protecting their town against the demonic beasts. Despite the Changu stronghold's attempts to force the border town into submission through starvation, the town's victory had proven that they could stand on their own. With great pride, Roland announced from this day forward, the first day after the month of the demons would officially be known as Victory Day. A grand banquet and feast would be held in the town to celebrate their hard-earned triumph. Axe lit the ceremonial fire, igniting the start of the celebration. People flooded the streets, dancing and singing with joy, holding hands and reveling in the glory of their victory. The air was filled with the sound of laughter and the aroma of delicious food, as the people of the border town basked in the aftermath of their hard-won battle. 
Roland felt a sense of pride and satisfaction as he gazed upon the lively celebration in the town. He knew that this victory would not only mark the end of the month of demons but also the beginning of a new era for the people of the border town. As the days pass, this Victory Day celebration would become a beloved tradition, a reminder of the town's resilience and bravery in the face of adversity. With a smile on his face, Roland made his way back to his private garden where a feast was waiting for him. The witches, who had played a vital role in the victory against the demonic beasts, were there to greet him. The aroma of the delicious food filled the air, and Roland could not help but feel grateful for the company of a such beautiful group of witches. As the night wore on, the group continued to enjoy their private feast. Anna used her magic to cook the chicken to perfection, while Nanawa eagerly awaited her food. Nightingale displayed her impressive knife skills as she sliced through the beef, earning praise from Wendy. Meanwhile, Lightning indulged in the sweet fruit wine, but Wendy warned her not to overdo it. Roland couldn't help but smile at the camaraderie and joy in the air. Suddenly, Lightning surprised him by sneaking up behind him and planting a kiss on his cheek. Roland blushed furiously, unsure how to react. Lightning explained that in her hometown, it was tradition for girls to take the initiative and kiss the Lord to celebrate a victory. She wondered if Greycastle had a similar tradition. Roland coughed, trying to regain his composure and defuse the awkward situation. He suggested that Lightning was drunk and needed to rest. But Lightning protested, claiming she had never lost a drinking competition before. Roland looked to Anna for help, and she simply smiled, enjoying the lighthearted moment. As the festivities drew to a close, Roland headed back to his residence. He had indulged in some extra drinks, and the inky night sky was illuminated by the faint light of the moon seeping in through the windows. Roland found himself faced with a solitary figure in the hallway. He took a few tentative steps towards her and met her gaze, attempting to reassure her that the events of the evening had been a mere accident. Anna, however, surprised Roland with her response. She wasn't here to interrogate him about what had transpired earlier. Instead, she admitted that, unlike Lightning, it is impossible for her to fathom doing anything so daring in front of everyone. Thus, she waited for Roland. Roland's heart skipped a beat after hearing Anna's confession, the two each took an extra step forward, coming closer together. Roland lowered himself, while Anna tipped her toes. Roland looked deep into Anna's eyes and leaned in slowly. The two could sense each other's warm breath against their face. With a nervous look on both faces, the world around them faded away as they shared this special moment. His lips brushing gently against hers. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, they pulled away from each other, their faces flushed and their hearts beating fast, Anna bid Roland good night and quickly disappeared into the hallway. Late in the night, Wendy leaned against the headboard, flipping through the book in her hand. For her, this was a rare moment of leisure, one that she never would have dared to imagine during her time in the Witch Association. As she start reading the book, she felt odd that it never mentioned anything about the god's name and replaced every successor with just using Pope. It almost felt like one person was involved with everything throughout history, it doesn't make sense, it almost seems like they were deliberately downplaying everything. Wendy said before being interrupted by the sudden appearance of Nightingale. Wendy closed the book and welcomed Nightingale with a gentle smile. Nightingale rubbed her own neck, looking exhausted as she had just walked Nanawa home. Nightingale asked how Lightning was doing and mentioned that she seemed to have had quite a few drinks tonight. Wendy smiled and said that Lightning had fallen asleep as soon as she lay on her bed, muttering and calling for her father repeatedly. After all, Lightning is still just a kid, Wendy added. Nightingale turned to face Wendy and snatched the book out of her hands, telling her that His Highness had said that reading books at night was bad for the eyes. Nightingale then lay down on Wendy's bed and stared at the ceiling. Wendy was quick to pick up on Nightingale's strange behavior and asked if what Lightning did during the festival was the reason for her reaction. Nightingale's face turned slightly red as she stuttered out a denial, but Wendy chuckled and then took on a more serious tone. She reminded Nightingale that their mission was to help Prince Roland ascend to the throne and become the King of Grey Castle. 
Wendy was confident that Roland would rule the kingdom justly and provide a safe haven for all their sisters. However, Wendy also knew that, as a king, Roland would eventually have to marry a daughter of a prestigious duke's family or someone of similar status. Wendy's gaze fell on Nightingale as she said this, reminding her that they were witches and unable to bear children. Wendy's expression turned to one of despair as she explained that witches were born with unimaginable power but at the cost of their ability to give birth. Nightingale understood that this was a fate she would have to accept for the rest of her life. As a group of soldiers cleaned the pavement, some of them reminisced about their mission to defend against the month of demons, which had now been successfully completed. Many were likely to return to their previous work in the mines, but they already missed the thrill of being in the militia and the fat paychecks. Venner, their leader, reassured them that the team would not disband. However, one of the squad members couldn't help but wonder what the point of keeping them around was now that the month of demons was over. Venner's gaze shifted to Roland's residence, a knowing look in his eyes. He knew that they would have their answer tomorrow. The next morning, the sound of the gathering horn brought all the soldiers together. Axe, their commanding officer, stood before them and delivered the news that it was His Highness's decision to reassemble them. He declared that the soldiers had accomplished their first mission successfully, defending the border town against the demonic beasts. After three months and six days of arduous battle, their bravery had been acknowledged by His Highness. From that day forward, the civilian militia would officially become His Highness's personal army. The soldiers cheered and exchanged excited whispers, thrilled to continue their service under His Highness. Axe's words instilled in them a sense of pride and purpose, knowing that their efforts had not gone unnoticed. Axe turned to face the group, his commanding presence radiating as he spoke. Does anyone here want to quit now? He asked, his voice steady and unwavering. One of the men raised his hand tentatively and posed a question. What exactly is a regular personal army? He asked. Does it mean that His Highness will confer a knighthood upon us? Axe paused for a moment, considering his response carefully before delivering it with authority. A regular personal army is a true army. He explained. Their mission is to engage in real military activities, with the sole purpose of protecting His Highness and his territory. Simply put, you will become professional soldiers, training day and night, season after season, to achieve the ultimate victory. Suddenly, another voice pierced through the crowd, questioning the need for a personal army when they were already engaged in military activities. What's the difference? He asked. Axe didn't skip a beat in his response. The difference, he replied, is that there will be more frequent training, a more stringent system, and more rewarding benefits. As soon as Axe mentioned the prospect of more rewards, a palpable buzz of excitement swept through the crowd. People started clamoring to know more, eager to find out what exactly they stood to gain. Axe put his hands together and gazed intently at the crowd, his tone serious and resolute. A professional army will introduce a formal military rank system, he explained. Those who excel in combat will have the opportunity to rise in the ranks, even becoming officers like myself. And with that rank comes a fat paycheck and a land of your own. The group of men was buzzing with excitement and anticipation, but Axe's words served as a sobering reminder of the serious nature of their mission. I want to make it clear. He began, his tone firm and unwavering. The system we will institute must be followed without exception. From this point forward, the rules will be different. Any failures to complete missions, acts of desertion, mutiny, or acts of treason, as well as other violations, will not be tolerated. The men listened attentively, their excitement tempered by the gravity of Axe's warning. The punishment for such violations will be severe, he continued. It will no longer be a matter of losing an egg for lunch. Depending on the severity of the violation, the punishment could range from discharge, servitude, jail time, or even death by hanging. The room fell silent as Axe's words sank in, the men fully comprehending the seriousness of their commitment. Just three months ago, none of them would have even considered staying here, with land, money, and other material possessions seeming meaningless in the face of the constant danger they faced. 
But now, they had made the choice to stay, and the prospect of fighting for His Highness had given them a newfound sense of purpose. Compared to the endless drudgery of mining, spending their days with rocks and stones, fighting for a greater cause felt like the right thing to do. But then, Axe's sly grin broke the tension, and he let out a booming laugh. Make no mistake. He declared triumphantly. You are all now part of His Highness's regular army. The men erupted into cheers and whoops of excitement, slapping each other on the back and exchanging congratulations. Axe wasted no time in getting down to business, quickly announcing the first training of the day, wilderness training. Back in Roland's office, Lightning inquired about the training session for the regular army, while the thick blanket of snow outside the border town persisted. The snowfall had been sporadic for three months and had now accumulated up to knee level. The soldiers were practically crawling in the snow rather than running. The snow that seeped into their boots had melted, soaking their feet. Despite standing in the sun, most people were still shivering from the frigid cold, and the enormous physical effort only amplified the chill, causing many to fall behind. Roland knew that he can't be too hasty and impatient, he need to take his time with the regular army's training. While Lightning and Nightingale were excited to see the new blueprint on Roland's table, the specific organization, rules and regulations, and rewards and punishments are the problems that give him a headache. He had completely forgotten about the military chess that he played during childhood, he simply decided to make up the details himself. After all, he was the creator of the New Style Army, and if the settings were unreasonable, no one would notice. As a result, the first military organization of the border town was quickly formed. The overall framework was composed of corps, division, battalion, company, squad, and soldier. Looking at the blueprint. It was the new bayonet that Roland is looking to implement into the army. Suddenly, the door was knocked and Nightingale quickly evaded into the darkness with lightning. Barif came to inform that a noble from the Changji stronghold would like to meet Roland. Turned out, the noble was Cornelius Baron, who fleet during the month of the demons and returned who had his house demolished as it was hindered the defense of the city wall. And the man is here to demand an explanation. This fat guy looks like a typical villain noble from any anime. As Roland met the fat man, the fat man berated him for allowing the stone masons to demolish his house, ranting that it had cost him a hundred gold. Abruptly, his tone shifted, and he claimed that it had actually cost him 150 gold royals to construct, wildly gesticulating with his finger. Roland's sly grin betrayed his amusement as he asked if the fat man was referring to the house at the southernmost end of the town. The corpulent nobleman nodded vigorously, and Roland locked eyes with him, expressing his regret that it had impeded the passage of his subordinates, but the municipal hall had already made amends for it. The fat man stuttered and asked how much compensation he would receive, to which Roland held up two fingers and said, 20 gold royals. Though the fat man tried to argue that it was too little, he eventually relented, wiping the sweat off his forehead and inquiring where he could collect the money. Roland pretended to look puzzled, as he informed the fat man that the rightful owner of the house had already been compensated. In a fit of rage, the fat man stood up and slammed his hands on the table, yelling that he was the rightful owner. Roland raised an eyebrow and calmly pointed out that he had never seen the man all winter, and therefore, he couldn't claim ownership of the house. The fat man didn't hesitate to retort that he had returned to the Changu stronghold, as he didn't want to face the demonic beasts in this messy place. Roland rolled his eyes, thinking that the corpulent man was a complete idiot, but he kept his voice even as he asked. So you abandoned your lord and fled because you were afraid of the demonic beasts, is that right? As the bombshell dropped, Carter moved forward and pushed the corpulent man back into his seat. Roland rose from his chair and looked down at the corpulent man with disdain, giving him two options, admit that the house didn't belong to him and be let go or confess to deserting his lord and face charges of defection, which carried a death sentence by hanging. Beads of sweat dripped down Cornelius's forehead as he stuttered and ultimately admitted that he had made a mistake and the house didn't belong to him. Roland grinned with satisfaction and motioned to the guard to accompany Cornelis out. But just before Cornelis could leave, Roland halted him and tasked him to deliver a message to all the nobles who had committed the same error as he had. They too had the same two options, 
and if they chose not to accept the second one, they needn't bother returning. Cornelius went silent for a second and forced a smile as he stepped out, but in that instant, as he turned around, Roland saw his gritted teeth expression. Cornelius exited the border town and slammed his hand on a nearby tree trunk, with the guard not around, he released his frustration and anger, cursing at Roland. Just as he is returning to the Chang-Gi stronghold, he brushed past a cloaked figure, it was no other than Leaf from the Witch Association. At first, there was nothing unusual about it. Among the townspeople coming and going, women dressed like this were common. But when a gust of wind blew up the corner of the woman's hood, the fat man felt his heart skip a beat, and the air around him seemed to freeze. She had a rare and stunning head of emerald green hair, and just the momentary glimpse of her face was enough to be considered peerless. Even in the capital city of Grey Castle, she would outshine those so-called princesses and socialites. How could someone like her so beautiful appear in a border town like this he asked himself. As Leaf was about to enter the town, she felt odd to see that people here were much more energetic and happy, even though they had just faced the month of the demons, for a moment, she was more curious about the lord who was governing this place. As she ventured into the bustling town, the castle loomed large on the horizon, an unmistakable landmark that made sneaking in unnoticed an impossible feat. She did not have abilities like Nightingale to conceal her senses and become totally stealthy, so after careful consideration, Leaf decided that it was better to walk into the castle openly rather than hide and sneak around. She had already made the worst-case scenario if Nightingale really betrayed the Witch Association. Although Leaf is confident that she could escape the two guards, but she had a slim chance of escaping from Nightingale, she took a deep breath and strides forward. As she approached closer, the guards quickly noticed her and placed their hands on their sword hilts, shouting loudly at her in rebuke, informing her that this is the prince's residence, and if she requires help, she need to seek help at the municipal building, disregarding their warnings, Leaf took another deep breath and pulled back her hood. As expected she saw the two guards express surprise simultaneously. Before they could recover, she spoke bluntly admitting that she is a witch. As Leaf braced herself for the worst, the guards exchanged a brief glance, but to her surprise, their expressions betrayed none of the expected animosity that most people reserved for witches. Instead, one of them even offered to help her. Despite the rush of excitement, this unexpected reaction ignited in her chest, Leaf kept her composure and spoke in the calmest voice she could muster, requesting to see Nightingale, Anna, or Nanoa. One of the guards turned and disappeared through the gate to report to his superiors. Leaf watched him go, her mind racing with a million possibilities of what awaited her inside the castle walls. Would she be greeted with open arms by her sisters, or would she fall into a trap laid by the guards? Perhaps Anna and Nanoa were nothing more than imaginary figures. But just as she was lost in thought, time seemed to stand still, or maybe it was just a fleeting moment when she heard the voice of Nightingale, she thought she must have misheard. Suddenly, Two familiar figures emerged from behind the door and rushed towards her. Almost simultaneously, she was enveloped in a warm hug. Both of the girls welcomed her home. Leaf's eyes began to well up again, biting her lip as she wiped away the tears that threatened to spill over. With a gentle nod, she hugged both of her sisters. Moments later, Roland let out a deep yawn as he settled back into his office. He had expected Nightingale to walk in any minute, but to his surprise, it was Wendy who entered with a tray of freshly brewed coffee. She explained that Nightingale had gone out to greet the visiting sisters from the Witch Association. Roland nodded absent-mindedly as he took the coffee cup from her, clearly failing to catch on. But as he was about to take a sip, something Wendy said made him freeze. What sisters? He exclaimed, suddenly alert. Wendy hesitated before delivering the devastating news. The sisters had not found the holy mountain, and their journey had been fraught with danger and heavy casualties. Only seven of them had managed to survive. Wendy apologized for acting on her own authority to take the witches in before informing Roland of their arrival. Wendy softly said that all of the witches that came were not combat-type witches, Roland was filled with anticipation. He knew that under the constraints of the god's punishment stone. Witches had limited combat abilities, 
and their area of expertise lay in production. If there were a witch with the ability to produce electricity, the remote border towns could be as bright as day at night or be able to solve the problem of rough processing and enter the era of mass production. Then he'd hit the real jackpot. Then the next step will be becoming the king, marrying witches, achieve modernization, and reach the pinnacle of life. Ah, just thinking about it sends a shiver down his spine. Well, I agree with Roland on this one, do you? Nightingale softly coughed twice, waking up Roland from his imagination, Nightingale and the remaining witches returned to the castle. And Roland had prepared a sumptuous dinner in the castle hall as a welcoming feast. But seemed like this was the first time the girls had seen such a feast and a prince this up close, everyone appears to be very restrained. Roland regained his composure and introduced himself to the newcomers. He welcomed them and hoped they would enjoy the dinner, he also insisted that the girls make themselves at home here. The room was silent, but lightning being lightning, smoothly got rid of the awkwardness and started the feast. Roland took a sip of his wine, while enthusiastically admiring the group of women before him, each with a different style but all beautiful in their own way. This was the greatness of magic. Yo Ram, is that you? After dinner, the prince finally came to the long-awaited segment, the Ability Inquiry. Nanoa helped Roland to gather information about the newcomers and their abilities. Although there isn't anyone with the ability to generate electricity, they were still treasured by Roland, Leaf's first ability can be used to improve fruits and seeds, increasing their yield and growth. Great for the development of agriculture. Scroll, the oldest among the girls, her main ability is an extraordinary memory, which can almost be called photographic memory. At the same time, she has obtained an interesting secondary ability. Books can be temporarily materialized after she has read them. A natural educator. The third witch is named Hummingbird, a short but cute witch, just as her nickname suggests. Her ability is to make objects lighter. By attaching magic to an object, she can significantly reduce its weight, almost to the point of being zero, great for transportation. The fourth witch, who is rare to have a surname, is named Soraya Zoan and comes from a merchant family in the capital city of Grey Castle. She has short curly brown hair and a pair of slender eyes. The freckles on her nose not only do not detract from her overall beauty but also give her a unique youthful vitality. She is 19 years old, and her ability can draw people and scenery she sees or imagines realistically. With her branch ability, Magic Pen, she can draw images like photographs without the need for pigments or paper, basically a human camera. The fifth witch was named Echo, a tall woman with a coffee-colored skin tone and typical sand people features in her eyes and nose. She exuded an exotic feel from her homeland in the far south. Her initial ability after awakening was to mimic the sounds of animals, but as she matured, she became able to imitate any sound with remarkable accuracy. Lily, the sixth witch to be interviewed, is only 16 years old with two ponytails and a doll-like face. She can prevent food from spoiling. She awakened as a witch only a year ago and has become the most popular member of the Witch Association. Without the preservation ability, many foods would spoil and become moldy during their exile. Spoiler alert, remember this girl, her ability is extremely OP. Tell me in the comments section what you think her ability is capable of. Lastly, this rem like girl is Mystery Moon. At the time she walked into the office, she looked very nervous. Nightingale had to comfort her for a while. As it turned out, Mystery Moon's ability was seen as one of the worst in the camp and she was only responsible for some simple manual labor. Plus, she was often scolded by the mentor, which made her act timidly, afraid that Roland would think she was useless and drive her out of border town. Her main ability is to magnetize objects. Before reaching adulthood, her ability was limited to metallic objects, but after becoming an adult, any object in her hands can obtain magnetism. He thanked Faraday, Gauss, Ampere, and Maxwell in his heart for the knowledge that magnetism produces electricity and electricity produces magnetism was a well-known fact to any engineering enthusiast. He knew that a new miracle will soon be happening in the border town.
Roland found that just categorizing witches' abilities simply by combat and non-combat does not make any sense, he then categorizes their ability into three major groups, first is the self-enhancement type like a passive ability and not affected by the god punishment stone. Like scroll's ability for example, second is summoning type, the ability's characteristic is that magical power can leave the user's body and take effect independently and it is not affected by the god punishment stone however, once the ability is activated, the resulting effects are permanent and irreversible. Most of the witches are in this category, the third type is enchantment type. The way of casting magic is through contact with the target, and the conversion process is slow and consumes a lot of magic. It can also be interrupted by the god punishment stone, however, once the conversion is complete, it becomes the inherent property of the object and remains effective even in anti-magic areas. Enchantments also have a limited duration and are not permanent. This applies to the abilities of that mystery moon and hummingbird have. Wendy could sense her sister's unease, so she and Nightingale called everyone to their room and gathered in a circle around the bed. They chatted together to ease everyone's emotions. Nightingale revealed Roland's theories, if the witches use their abilities regularly and regularly utilize their magic they could bid farewell to the agony caused by the demonic tortures. Seeing some of the girls were skeptical, Nightingale then explained that both Nanawa and Anna had proved this theory. As awakening day approaches, as long as everyone uses up all of their magic, it will hardly cause any harm to the body. Wendy stood up, facing her sisters, she claimed that during the days when they were being hunted by the church, they had to hide carefully in the corners of the towns and couldn't use their abilities. As Leaf tried to shake off the chilling memory of the demonic torture she had endured, she was lucky that it was short, must have been because she had been constantly using her abilities to protect herself from the fidging cold. She wrapped her arms around her body and covered her mouth, trying to dispel the shivers that ran down her spine. Wendy, sensing Leaf's unease, reached out and held her hand, offering comfort and warmth. Wendy reassured her. As long as we can be ourselves and use our abilities freely without being seen as demons, any place can be a holy mountain. Echo, the most unfortunate witch in the group, couldn't fathom why Prince Roland was sheltering them. Lily scowled with contempt and suggested that Roland was just like any other noble who wanted to purchase Echo 4. She trailed off and said dismissively. In the end, he's just a man. Upon hearing Lily's remark, Nightingale was displeased and demanded that Lily refrains from speaking such nonsense. She explained that Roland was different from any other noble and that everyone would understand after living under his protection for some time. Wendy, with her always gentle smile, agreed with Nightingale. It was very late during the night, and Wendy advised everyone to go back to their room and get some sleep, she re-illustrated that His Highness had said that he wants all the witches in the territory to be able to live a normal and happy life. She giggled and said, His Highness will probably be asked them to start with filling out a contract first. As Wendy had surmised, the following morning, the maids summoned the witches downstairs for breakfast, and Prince Roland greeted them with exquisitely crafted parchment paper. Roland instructed the witches to practice and hone their abilities in accordance with their designated plans. Mysterious Moon expressed fear that she might lose control of her powers, recounting a near accident where she nearly struck Lily with a metal pan. Roland reassured her that everyone in the household would provide the necessary assistance. Before dismissing the group, Roland summoned Leaf, Soroya, and Scroll to his side. In Prince Roland's office, he pressed the survivors for details about the demonic beast that had led to the death of their mentor Hakura and left only seven of them alive. The girls had been plagued by terrible nightmares about the encounter. Leaf clenched her fist tightly and trembled as she spoke, correcting Roland's assumption that they had encountered a demonic beast. She revealed that they had faced demons from the gates of hell, towering creatures capable of controlling demonic beasts and wielding potent magical abilities, she hesitated for a moment, then said, just like us. Roland turned to Soroya and handed her a parchment, requesting that she illustrate the demon's appearance. Though visibly frightened, Soroya closed her eyes and accepted the paper before walking over to the nearby table. As she began to use her powers, the goose feather pen, which had been faintly visible, appeared in her hand. The tip of the pen glowed with a rainbow light as it flew out of her hand, moving rapidly across the paper. 
A vivid image gradually emerged on the paper, yet Saloya never opened her eyes. Roland approached the table and saw the incredibly lifelike image on the paper, no, he corrected himself, this wasn't a painting, but a real-time recording of the scene. Her power was like a camera, reproducing the massacre that had taken place in the wilderness from a first-person perspective. When the painting was finished, Saloya's forehead was covered in sweat. It was clear that this memory was like a nightmare to her. Everyone rushed to support her and check her well-being. Leaf pointed her finger to the painting, stating the two demons and their abilities, the one with the spear could throw spears faster than crossbow arrows, and the one in the back could summon lightning attacks and had powerful strength. She revealed that the tube underneath the helmet are a weak spot, Hakura's snake bite the tube and both of them perished together. Leaf used the same method and killed the other one with a crossbow. There seemed to be some red gas stored in their pipes, and they only died when the gas leaked out. Roland took a closer look at the painting, this thing looked like an oxygen tank, Roland was at a loss. He wasn't sure if these were aliens, but looking at the patched leather pipes and clothes made of animal skins they didn't seem much advanced in technology. Leaf then added that there was a floating city, but they could never get close to it, almost as if it was a mirage. Roland then requested Soraya to draw it out, Roland carefully examined the picture, but the blurry image didn't reveal much information if the city was indeed a mirage, then it at least meant that its true form was located somewhere in the savage lands. The blood mist that enveloped the city in the sky was the gas that the devils breathed. This explanation was much more plausible than the idea of aliens. Roland turned to scroll and posed his final question, inquiring about the ancient book that Hakra had discovered. He asked if Scroll had any knowledge of it. Scroll replied that no one was permitted to read the book, but she had managed to sneak a peek. The text within was both incomprehensible and remarkable. Roland requested that Scroll record everything she remembered from her glimpse of the book. Scroll used her ability. A book with gilded edges materialized in midair, its covers opening to reveal pages that fluttered before settling with a resounding thud in her hands. Scroll handed over the book and hoped that Roland is the only person who will read it, as she does not want her sisters to end up like Hakura. After the witches had departed from the office, Nightingale appeared silently beside the armchair. As was her custom, she lifted her robe and propped her feet up on the low table before beginning to munch on some dried fish, clearly having no interest in the book. Just like Scroll said, most of the content was difficult to comprehend, with a style of writing and grammar that did not make any sense it mentioned a blood-red moon and a massive stone door, but there was no reference to the holy mountain. To sum it up, Roland recognized each character, but couldn't make sense of them when strung together. Roland skipped over the lengthy passages and flipped to the back of the book. There was only content on the first few pages, with the rest of the pages completely blank. Starting from the final page, the handwriting suddenly changed, becoming sloppy and rushed, as if jotted down in haste. However, the content was clear and concise. The revelation jolted Roland from his seat, as his expression turned horrified and confused, the first line of text is written. We have failed, mortals cannot defeat demons. Roland had a million questions as he strode through the text. The god's punishment stone was powerless to stop their attacks. With their unmatched monstrous strength, they were formidable enemies even without using magic. The holy city of Takara has fallen, and we are scattered and fleeing. We crossed mountains and rivers, trying to get as far away from the gates of hell as possible, but where can we flee to next? But that's not something I need to worry about anymore, Natalia. The devil's power is corrupting me, and no medicine is working. I'm writing this down because I have something to ask of you. Akali's divine punishment army experiment is coming to an end, and it's been quite successful. Even ordinary warriors can hold their own against the devils. But she forgot that even if the Divine Punishment Army wins, it won't be a victory for us. Go stop her. Only you can do it. As Roland finished reading the passage, he closed his eyes and pondered over it, trying to put himself in Hakra's perspective. Assuming she didn't know about the existence of demons if the word demons is replaced with which in this passage, it would be easy for her to imagine that the church army was retreating under the attack of witches. 
Considering the widely spread rumors that witches are the minions of the devil and that their magic comes from the gate of hell, Hakura is likely to believe that the church wants to conceal the truth, that the so-called gate of hell is the entrance to the holy mountain, and for hundreds of years, the witches have continued to go to the holy mountain and obtain eternal life there. Therefore, the number of witches is increasing while the number of church warriors is decreasing. After minutes of rendering, however, this did not diminish his doubts, instead, it made the unknown questions more complex. He questioned when the church fought the demons, where exactly is Takira, and what is Divine Punishment Army. He scratched his head, the previous fourth prince had a small pea-sized brain, thus, Roland had no knowledge about anything. Roland turned his head and asked Nightingale if she knew where Hakura obtained this book, Nightingale wasn't one of the earliest members, but she said that Wendy had once told her that the association was created by a few witches met in Haifeng County. Among them were Wendy, Scroll, and Hakura, and not far from their meeting place, they found an underground relic. Hakura was the only person who went down to explore, and she claimed that she found the book inside. Roland knew Haifeng County was way up in the east, Thus he had to cease the investigation and focus on the development of his territory. Due to the increase of witches, Roland thought it a good time to recreate a new organization for the witches, in his vision, the organization did not require any manifesto or principles. It was created for the purpose of efficiently managing witches and allowing them to use their abilities reasonably. The regulations of the organization were kept as simple as possible, consisting of only two rules the use of abilities must not violate territorial laws, and the use of abilities must not be used to evade legal punishment. As for the name of the organization, Roland had already thought of it. This new collective would be called the Witch Alliance. In the Changu stronghold, Petrov is attending a banquet to celebrate someone's birthday. All of the guests were wealthy and famous nobles in the Changji stronghold, suddenly, someone hooked their arm around his neck from behind. It was no other than Ron, the second son of the family who held the banquet and also a good friend of Petrov. Ron complimented Petrov on being assigned ambassador by the Duke, he was assigned to join the guard to defend the new holy city, but he ended up catching a really bad cold, spent a week in a neighboring cold wind ridge. Not bad, you've improved a bit since last time, at least you've saved the guards some trouble, Petrov jokingly said. You're wrong this time. Ron suddenly chuckled mysteriously. Then switched to a serious expression. If I hadn't been lying on the cold wind ridge for a week, I would probably have been lying on the cold walls of the holy city forever. Petrov was shocked to hear this and asked why it was that. Ron leaned closer and whispered in a low voice, saying that the new holy city almost fell, the demonic beasts charged so far into the inner city, the holy city was saved by a secret army from the church, but the other four kingdoms suffered heavy losses, barely anyone made it back alive. As Petrov contemplated, he couldn't help but feel suspicious of the situation, he knew that Cold Wind Ridge border guards were mainly defending against the church's judgment army, and now with the leaders and soldiers of the four great kingdoms buried together, there seemed to be a hint of conspiracy. Ron then switched his tone, and with a quirky smile, he asked if Petrov happened to notice the handkerchief in the invitation, Petrov thought it was a prank from Ron, Ron laughed, and tapped him on the shoulder, he said that the handkerchief was sewed by her sister, who was turning 16 after today. Ron had the clear intention of helping out his best friend, after listening to the conversation, Ron's sister blushed heavily. Suddenly, a fierce debate broke out on one side of the hall, drawing everyone's gaze toward it. Petrov walked toward the table, one of the men stood up and bowed, explaining that they are talking about the lord from the border town, who confiscated the assets of the nobles from the Changji stronghold. The other man stood up explaining that his friend, Cornelius had his property demolished in the border town without any compensation and even claimed desertion charges against him. As Petrov pondered, the image of the young prince flashed in his mind, despite the widespread rumors tarnishing the prince's reputation, Petrov knew that the young prince was not an ordinary individual, the charges were used as an excuse to justify his punishment, the prince had never intended to reason with these people. Seems like the prince wants to cut all ties with the Changji stronghold. The other nobles were furious, asking for Ron and Petrov to bring them justice, Ron let out a smile and informed everyone that Duke Ryan have already had his eyes on the prince, who had recently ordered a formation of a coalition, and Ron himself will represent his family and join the coalition, the crowd roared in excitement. 
Petrov frowned his brows, Petrov was taken aback to learn that his friend was also gearing up for battle, he whispered in Ron's ears. Telling him to not attend, warning that Roland is a prince. Ron sneered and claimed that just a useless and ignorant prince, Ron laughed and said. The prince will probably piss his pants just seeing the coalition. Telling Petrov to not worry about him, then turned around to talk with the other nobles. Petrov parted his lips but refrained from muttering a word, he was worried about his friend's safety, even himself were skeptical about Roland being able to beat the coalition led by the famous Duke Ryan, but he had a bad feeling about this. Later in the night, Petrov returned to his home, his father asked him to gather a summary of their territory's production, population, and income, as his family will also be preparing for the battle and needed to send knights and mercenaries to fight the border town. Petrov hesitated and quietly questioned, how many did they need to send, sensing the odd behavior from his son. He opened a letter that was sitting on the table next to him, requiring them to provide at least 25 knights, accompanied by their appropriate retinue and horses. Forty mercenaries are required, fully equipped with weapons, and at least 100 freemen and serfs are armed with basic weaponry. Petrov pled to his father to avoid going to the battlefield, he hesitated for a moment before speaking up. What's the problem, son? The father asked, Petrov said he was concerned about his father's safety, his father burst out laughing, saying how dangerous could it be when an elephant stepped on some ants, the prince only had a few knights and less than 50 guards, and the coalition has ten times the size. Petrov then talked about the mud wall that Prince Roland built, which everyone expected to crumble down after a rainfall, and how they were able to defend the border town just with miners and survive the month of the demons. Enough! His father's hand slammed down on the table, his expression one of disappointment. He didn't mind his son's focus on business and wealth accumulation over knighthood in battle, but he was extremely displeased with his son's cowardice. Standing up, he walked over to the wall decorated with portraits of their ancestors, they all stood their ground in this land filled with beasts, refugees, and bandits thanks to their swords, bows, and arrows. Petrov clenched his fist tightly, shaking uncontrollably. He really wanted to tell his father that he was wrong. Looking at his father, who was only in his forties but bald, fat, and oily, with a double chin and a loose belt, Petrov wondered how he could compare himself to their ancestors with their robust and muscular figures. His father will most likely to picked up by the prince's chopsticks and eaten alive. Petrov shook his head, knowing that he can't convince his father today. On a bright and sunny afternoon, Roland fulfilled the promise and ennobled Tigu Pine as a viscount. Offering him a territory, turned out, Mr. Pine didn't care much, he just wants to spend his time with his daughter and hunting. Roland also conferred Brian as a knight, Brian chose to join the first army, and Roland had a great blueprint for land development. Soon, Soraya entered the room. Roland waved his hand and told Soraya to come closer. Roland questioned how was Soraya feeling about her work in the municipal hall, Soraya said everything was well. Turned out, Roland built a small room in the municipal hall, where he asked the residents from the border town to line up in front of the room, with the help of Soraya's ability, they were able to store the townspeople's information, with their basic information also a photograph of them. Roland called Soraya over today to ask her to create some entertainment props. Roland asked Soraya to draw a soldier holding a heavy crossbow on this sheet of paper. Then told her to add some circles and lines, then add a number and a shape in the circles. Thus, the first card of the new card game Gwent is created. After finishing all the cards, Soraya and Roland had fun playing a few rounds, but Soraya kept losing, Roland smiled and told Soraya to play with her sisters and introduce the game to them. Just then, a piece of cheerful and melodious music came from outside the window. It was no other than Echo, who had now mastered the song that Roland taught her. In the other room, Scroll knocked on the door, and Anna was sitting at the table by the window, flipping through thick books. The sunlight streamed in through the window, casting a long shadow on the woman. Her soft cheeks and neck were almost blindingly white in the light, and the linen-colored hair covering her shoulders was almost dyed a light gold. Scroll smiled and asked, did Anna check out the new card game? Anna smiled and said she wanted to read more books and complimented Echo's voice. Scroll pulled out the chair and sat facing Anna. 
Echo had told Scroll that out of all of the sisters, she envies Anna's ability the most. Scroll then talked about Echo's past. Echo came from the southern continent. The witch association saved her from a slave merchant, she was sold for a high price and suffered a lot, she had always wanted a strong ability. Maybe it could have changed her fate. Scroll then lightly patted Anna's head, saying that it was because of Anna and His Highness's encounter that changed the fate of everyone here. Scroll approached Anna and noticed that her hair had grown quite long. She offered to cut it for her, as she was a skilled hairdresser and had already cut the hair of most of the girls in the association. She quickly returned with a bundle of cloth in her hand and revealed her hair cutting tools, which she had saved from her previous job as a hairdresser in a tavern before joining the association. Scroll had saved up all the bronze she earned from cutting hair and used some for food, but gave most of it to an old captain with one leg. The old captain taught her how to read, until he died of old age, all of the folk stories that Anna read recently were from the tavern. Anna asked if the book she got from Scroll had a lot of stories, but it always ended with a similar ending. Anna hesitated. And asked will the prince always marry the princess as his wife? Scroll paused briefly, the storybook in question was not a true literary work, but rather a collection of folk tales that she had heard from sailors during her many years in the tavern. Scroll had intentionally carefully selected and edited the stories. Omitting those with a happy ending or where the prince did not end up with the princess, and compiled them into a single volume. Which now appeared before Anna as a magical source of reading material. Scroll then said, in some cases, sometime the prince will also marry a duke or famous noble's daughter. After speaking, Scroll sighed inwardly. Wendy had mentioned Nightingale's feelings to her before. Unlike the mature and calm Nightingale, she was more concerned about Anna getting too close to the prince. Anyone could see how important she was to his highness. Whenever Anna was present, Roland's gaze would always be more focused on her. Unfortunately, Roland was the fourth prince of Grey Castle, the future king whom the witches supported. Scroll couldn't remind the prince, so it had to come up with a way to hint to Anna. It didn't want to create a rift between the two, nor did it want to see a tragic outcome with no resolution. Anna pondered why will this happen, what if the prince doesn't like princesses or noble daughters? Scroll was not expecting this question, but she then told Anna that the prince is forced to marry them, because the prince may become a king in the future, in order to maintain stability among the powerful nobles on the far borders of the kingdom and for political stability, the most crucial factor was that the king must have an heir. There was a silence between the two, shortly after, the haircut was completed, and Scroll offered Anna a new book. Then walked out of the room, Anna thanked Scroll. And before she left, Anna said. Roland is not like the prince in the stories. Anna's voice was very certain, and not like she was trying to convince herself. He only does what he wants to do, and nothing else matters. Scroll turned around and looked puzzled. Anna let out a brilliant smile and said, if he were such a prince, he wouldn't have saved me. Oh my god this is too cute and too sweet. Stay tuned for the next video, we are getting real close to the actions. Following his supper, Roland proceeded back to his office where he continued to transcribe his foundational mathematical knowledge from his mind onto the paper. Roland proceeded to show Scroll the Pythagorean theorem, whenever Roland finished writing on a sheet of paper, he would allow Scroll to scan through it, anything that she looked at would be permanently saved in her memory. Unfortunately, Scroll's abilities were limited to memorization only, and she couldn't understand the basic high school level mathematical concepts on her own. Therefore, in his free time, Roland had to explain them to her. Unlike Scroll, Roland didn't have a photographic memory, and in fact, his memory would gradually weaken with time. Due to his engineering background, he often used subjects such as mathematics and physics, but other subjects like history, geography, biology, and chemistry had likely deteriorated to a rudimentary level. Regardless of whether or not it was needed, writing down the contents that he had not yet forgotten earlier could help him retain more knowledge. As Roland transcribed, he pondered what magic in this world truly was. The utilization of magic enabled all witches to manifest an array of inconceivable abilities. In the later half of his life, 
Einstein aspired to integrate the four fundamental forces of the universe into a single theoretical framework, known as the theory of everything. In a sense, what he did was search for the origin. Roland wondered, could there be a universal principle that applies to any universe? Regardless, Roland could only ponder about it, since with the current level of technology, he couldn't possibly analyze such a force. Therefore, his primary task was to advance industry and technology and promote the progress of civilization. Perhaps one day, he could truly understand this power. Your Highness? Scroll spoke up upon seeing the prince lost in thought and couldn't help but ask. Roland snapped out of his reverie and coughed twice, glancing at the almost burnt-out candle. Let's call it a day here. As she lowered her head to bow and leave, she unconsciously slowed her pace. Turned around hesitated for a moment before asking a question. He guessed that her question was probably something along the lines of. Why are you willing to shelter us? Aren't you afraid of the threat from the church? Nightingale and Wendy had asked him many times before. Is it possible for you to marry a witch? Scroll respectfully asked, Roland almost spat out the water he had in his mouth after hearing the question. Marriage to a witch? Roland's mind immediately conjured up the image of Anna, who had left a deep impression on him since their meeting in the cell. Her lake blue eyes had captivated him. Witches were women who possessed exceptional abilities, awakened from ordinary humans. They excelled in both appearance and physique, for sure making them the center of attention in modern society back on Earth. So why hesitate? He looked towards Scroll and replied with a smile. Why not? Rubbing her sore shoulders, Wendy returned to her room. After nearly a month of training, her wind-controlling abilities had greatly improved. When Wendy arrived, Nightingale had already finished bathing and was sitting on the bed in her pajamas, waiting for her. However, what surprised Wendy was the uncontrollable smile on Nightingale's face. Did something good happen, or maybe you joined the other for a game of Gwent? Wendy couldn't help but ask, but Nightingale shook her head and didn't say anything, just smiling a little deeper. Nightingale was concealed in the room when Scroll posed the question, her presence unbeknownst to all. As Roland began to speak, she listened intently, her heart racing with a mixture of astonishment and relief. Wendy smiled, saying that Nightingale must have gotten a really great card. Two weeks had passed since the month of the demons, after shedding its pure white veil, the trees on both sides of the river have sprouted fresh leaves and are now lush with greenery. The land outside the eastern edge of the town, which was once baked by Anna's scorching heat, has now been temporarily designated by His Highness as the training ground for the First Border Town Army. The majority of soldiers in the First Army are now armed with flintlocks, which Roland has equipped with bayonets. Axe and Carter oversee the training sessions, where soldiers practice thrusting and stabbing with their new weapons. Roland arrived to inspect the training session, accompanied by Echo. He asked Carter to gather all the soldiers together as he had an announcement to make. Seconds later. Hail, your highness! The soldiers exclaimed in unison, raising their hands to their foreheads. Roland nodded his head and walked over to the crowd, about to say something when a burly man suddenly broke out from the ranks. Carter furrowed his brows and stepped forward, placing his hand on his sword hilt to shield the prince behind him. Nightingale also appeared beside Roland, protecting him. The burly man who rushed out was none other than Axe. He did not run towards the prince, but instead knelt straight down in front of the woman. His whole body prostrated on the ground, head deeply buried between his arms. My chieftain! He called out. The training was forced to come to a halt, and everyone followed Roland back to his office. The story itself was not complicated. Echo was originally a member of the Proud Sand Clan from the Iron Sand City. Her real name was Drow Silvermoon, and her father was the chief of the Proud Sand Clan. The Sand People were not a unified group, and the population that the Iron Sand City could accommodate was limited. Therefore, every three years, each clan had to conduct a sacred battle in the Burning Land. Only the six winning clans could obtain the right to live in the city. Despite their proud and valiant efforts in battle, 
the Sand tribe was defeated through insidious means, leading to the tragic loss of their chieftain and Echo's brother. Adding to the tribe's devastation. After the defeat, due to her outstanding appearance, Echo was captured and sold as a slave. Axe, who was of mixed blood, faced discrimination from other Sand people who did not consider him a true Magan. Despite this, he did his best to protect Echo. Unfortunately, during one attempt to save her, he was struck on the back of the head and rendered unconscious. After Echo was sold as a top-quality slave to a trader in Blue Water Harbor, Axe spent years traveling across the southern region and visiting numerous slave markets in search of her. Despite his efforts, he was unable to gather any information about her whereabouts. Axe knelt down, swear on his life to serve Roland, and apologized for his earlier outburst. Roland told him to stand up. Roland paused for a moment and then continued, telling Echo and Axe that helping them to get revenge is not out of the question. Axe widened his eyes in disbelief. Echo didn't react much, indicating that she didn't hold much hope for returning to Iron Sand City. Roland pondered in his mind, when Axe described the southernmost region, he had heard some very interesting things. The land was hot and dry, with a strange and varied environment. In particular, there was a kind of orange flame that erupted from underground and could burn for decades without going out. Near the flames, there were often huge ground fissures with black underworld rivers flowing endlessly at the bottom. Hmm, sounds familiar? Isn't that oil? And it's even flowing on the surface. The importance of this black liquid for industry goes without saying. Half of the modern wars are fought over it, fluctuations in oil prices can affect the rise and fall of countries. And it can even change the world order. But the border town is too far from the Iron Sand City. Roland told Axe that he will seek justice for them when he ascend to the throne. Axe's actions today violated the first military rule. He was put into solitary confinement for two days. Roland wanted him to take this time to reflect on his behavior. A group of soldiers waited on the field, and one of the younger soldiers walked up to Brian, who is now a squad leader, and asked if His Highness would punish Axe for his earlier outburst. Shortly afterward, Roland, Carter, and Echo returned to the training field. Carter had already ordered everyone to form up in their assigned groups and stand in formation. Roland announced, stepping forward to address them. Roland informed that the woman standing behind him is a witch, who is a long-lost relative of Axe. Roland also notified the group that Axe was penalized with a two-day confinement for disrupting the formation and violating military discipline. Roland emphasized again that the most important qualities of a soldier are obedience and discipline. Roland introduced Echo's abilities informing that Echo will now be presenting a marching song, then ordered the men to march according to the beat, keep the formation on the same line. As everyone questioned what exactly is a marching song, Roland pointed toward Echo and made it very clear that Echo is the banner flag of the First Army and the soul of the Flintlock Squad, everyone must do everything possible to protect her. As the unfamiliar melody reverberated through the chamber, all of the men instantly grasped His Highness's intention. The rhythmical beat of the drums compelled them to move their feet, and the lively tune stirred their thirst for battle. This is what's known as a marching song, also known as a war song. That motivates and inspires soldiers to keep moving forward on the battlefield. Suddenly, in the midst of the night, a group of soldiers stood guard at the castle gate when a torrent of arrows rained down upon them. Before they could even react, the arrows pierced through their bodies, leaving them looking like porcupines. Timothy, the new king, turned around and saw the flagpoles being raised, the gray flags unfolding in the wind, Timothy finally arrived at the Eagle's Nest City. His army was immensely large, consisting primarily of his personal bodyguards, the royal knights, and the troops of Duke Francheret from the eastern province. Altogether, the three groups totaled up to 6,000 people, with a staggering 1,000 well-trained and well-equipped knights. Timothy had launched a surprise attack on his sister's army, the people on the city wall stood scattered and loosely, indicating that they were not fully prepared for defending the city. With a relaxed tone, Timothy handed the binoculars to Duke Fran and remarked, Looks like she wants to run. The Duke agreed with Timothy and complimented Timothy's brilliant tactic to attack during the night. 
Satisfied, Timothy gazed upon the easily captured Eagle's Nest City, realizing that everything had gone exactly as he had planned, if not better. Timothy ordered his army to charge, the army behind him surged forward, and several groups of soldiers emerged from the formation. Led by a handful of knights, they strode confidently toward Eagle's Nest City. Suddenly, in the distance, a banner was raised amidst the crowd, the green silk flag fluttered in the wind, bearing the emblem of a sailboat and a crown Timothy raised his binoculars, he scanned the enemy's formation. There, he spotted a blurred figure of a woman standing on a makeshift platform held by multiple men underneath, she held her hands aloft, seemingly shouting something at the top of her lungs. Meanwhile, to Duke Fran's surprise, the people who had originally stood guard on the city walls were nowhere to be seen. The entire perimeter was now unguarded and devoid of any activity. He could sense something was wrong. As the Duke passed through the city gates, he caught a whiff of a pungent odor. Little did he know, a black liquid was underneath their feet. The Duke headed toward the main castle, after touring the main's castle, Fran noticed that something was odd. The castle is too empty, he thought to himself not just of coins, but the entire basement is devoid of any cloth or grain stores. The entire castle has been stripped bare. Suddenly, thick black smoke began to rise from the northern gate. One of the knights reported that the fire cannot be put out. It not only couldn't be extinguished by water, but it also seemed to flow along the water. A female knight ran towards them from the direction of the city center, not even waiting to stop his horse before jumping off its back informing that the fire have now reached the inner city. The duke then shouted loudly, telling his men to not panic, claiming that this was the power of the witches, as long as everyone wears the god punishment stone, the fire will not hurt them. He then hopped on his horse and ordered his man to charge with him. Revised, as they approached the city walls, they were met with a fierce wall of flames that blocked their path. Without hesitation, he ordered his man to jump over the flame as the god's punishment stone will protect them. The duke leaped over the fire and turned to see if his knights had followed, but to his dismay, none of them made it through. The duke quickly realized that this was no witchcraft, but a deadly trap. His horse had suffered severe burns, and he struggled to pull himself out of the danger zone. As the city burned to ashes, the duke's soldiers fell one by one, leaving no survivors. Exhausted and battered, the duke knelt to the ground, only to be confronted by a towering figure wielding a one-handed axe. The duke recognized him as a sand person, with one swift swish, he felt his head leaving his body. The royal knights were like a silver blade, cutting into the rear of Garcia's army. The crowd suddenly became chaotic, and many people stumbled and were trampled to death by the galloping horses while trying to flee. Occasionally, someone drew their weapon to resist, but they were skillfully pierced by the spear of the knights. Garcia sat on her chair, surveying the entire battlefield. With a pointed finger, she ordered the rest of her army to charge. As Timothy's knights were about to charge into the enemy lines, large numbers of men and horses suddenly appeared on the eastern and western horizons. They emitted strange cries and galloped madly toward the center of the battlefield. They were tall and strong figures, with basic weaponry. There was no doubt that they were the sand people. Seeing the heavy casualties, he turned around and shouted loudly. Blow the horn, call the knights back. But it was too late, half an hour later, there were fewer and fewer knights still fighting. When the sand people turned their attention to the position where Timothy was standing, he gritted his teeth and issued the order to retreat. The group began to move north, and compared to the large army that arrived earlier, only 300 people remained by the new king's side. Back in the border town, Roland had already received intel about Duke Ryan and the Changji stronghold, he is confident that his army will be able to defeat the coalition, and he wondered if he should move to the Changji stronghold after his victory. Then he thought about the power structure is complex and intertwined. With a large number of nobles, and the territories are managed according to the feudal system. The border town had much more freedom, but he knew he could move the gold, resources, craftsmen, and labors from the Changji stronghold to the border town. At that moment, a yellow figure flew in through the window and landed straight toward Roland's stomach. It was lightning. Informing Roland that they are here. The mighty coalition marched slowly on the road toward the border town. 
At the forefront of the procession was the knight formed by the six major families of the stronghold. Duke Ryan looked satisfied as he gazed at this sharp and powerful force. There was no doubt that with their strength, no one in the West could stop him. Petrov's father remembered Petrov's warning and wanted to be more cautious since the border town managed to defend against the demonic beasts. Earl Moose ridiculed Roland and his army. Duke Ryan agreed with Earl Moose's comment and added that Hermes suffered a large-scale attack by the demonic beasts. And the holy city almost fell, he claimed that all of the beasts this year were targeting the holy city. And only a few slipped through toward here. Duke Ryan also knew that Timothy and Garcia had engaged in a fierce battle at the Eagle Nest City in the south, and Timothy had suffered large casualties. And this is his perfect chance to become a king and declare independence in the west. The duke grinned with satisfaction at the thought. He ordered to send out an envoy to persuade Prince Roland to surrender. Ron, who was responsible for leading the way for the army, rushed back to report that there were soldiers holding weapons not far from them. Duke Ryan raised his binoculars to observe Bordertown's formation. The troops in the lens appeared very peculiar. They held strange weapons that can only be assumed as wooden sticks and stood in two tightly packed rows. Duke Ryan let out a smirk and ordered his army to charge, as the enemy appeared in the distance. Vayner and the rest of the soldiers seeing the fully armed knights riding tall horses, dressed in shiny armor, slowly approaching the town. Now, with nearly a hundred knights appearing all at once, this sight made them gasp in surprise. Vayner felt his palms sweat again, just like when he first faced the mixed-breed demonic beasts on the city wall. But this time, he was facing his own kind. The Coalition Army of the Chang-Gi Stronghold Vayner took a deep breath, regaining his composure knowing that nowadays, under the governance of the prince, the border town has been improving day by day, and these changes are visible to everyone. Vayner assured his men that the coalition was nothing to be afraid of. Under the guidance of his highness, they had already triumphed over demonic beasts, and these knights were no match for their bravery. The morale of their troops soared as they chanted Roland's name. Behind the border town's defense, on a small mountain, Roland, Carter, and Axe surveyed the battlefield. Just then, lightning dashed towards the town's defenses, waving her arms and the yellow ribbons in her hands fluttering in the wind. The yellow signal indicated that the enemy had entered the cannon range, prompting everyone to turn their gaze to Roland. Taking a deep breath, Roland shouted. Fire! The first round of cannonballs made a loud sound but missed their target. Duke Ryan then ordered his men to charge. But before the coalition could react, the second round of shelling began. A cannonball soared through the sky, precisely landing in a squad of soldiers, taking them out in one fell swoop. The vulnerability and fragility of the human body were exposed under the heat of the weapons. Once grazed by an iron ball, it would result in an irreparable injury. Knights hit directly were not only dismembered but also sprayed with a cloud of blood. Only when the cannonballs hit the ground and ricocheted for the second time could one faintly see a blurry black specter ravaging the lives of its companions in the crowd. The Duke ordered his men to sound the horn of attack, the long-range weapons would be rendered useless if engaged in close combat. The cannon crew sprang into action, clearing the barrels and reloading ammunition, as well as relocating the cannons. At that moment, Lightning returned to the defensive line, and in her hand was a ribbon now colored red. A red signal indicated that the enemy had come within 500 meters. As the deafening roar subsided, he barely had time to observe the result of the attack before turning around and shouting at the ammunition delivery personnel. Send up the shotgun shells. As the iron barrel flew out of the cannon's muzzle, it ruptured due to the immense pressure differential, and the iron pellets inside scattered like raindrops toward the enemy. The knights who were fortunate enough not to be covered by the barrage finally approached the charging distance. They had only one thought in their minds to break through this thin defense line and slaughter the cowards who could only hide behind the line and operate evil weapons. The remaining knights lowered their bodies and urged their horses to the highest speed. However, these 150 meters seemed to be an unreachable distance. 
The last round of close-range shotgun blasts completely crushed the knight's fighting spirit. Within a hundred meters, the hard to deform iron pellets could penetrate two to three people. The cone-shaped area in front of the muzzle became the domain of death, and almost none of the twenty or so knights who charged at the forefront were spared, the only difference being how many pellets hit them. The soldiers collapsed, scattered in fear had no chance of being saved, turned around, and tried to flee the battlefield. The wave of defeat swept over Duke Ryan's coalition army, and the situation quickly became uncontrollable. The crowd rushed back, and people were trampled to death in the chaos. No one had time to care for others, only regretting why they didn't have two more legs. Two of the nobles seeing the chaos requested Duke Ryan to retreat first, Duke Ryan's expression soon changed, as he reached out for his sword and sliced through the solitor who dared to retreat, no matter how much he roared, he could not control his fleeing troops. Helpless, Duke Ryan had no choice but to retreat with the crowd. As the sun gradually sank behind the mountains, Carter gazed at the blood-red sky and the cawing of crows in the distant forest, and he suddenly felt a sense of desolation. The era of knights had come to an end. And the era of Roland had just begun. Duke Ryan still hasn't been able to come to his senses. He couldn't understand how he had been defeated. As nightfall arrived, the duke chose a spot near the riverbank to set up camp. The scattered knights and mercenaries eventually gathered around the torches, but a large portion of the group remained missing. Carter and Axe lead a group of musketeers closely following Duke Ryan and his defeated army. The witches had played a vital role in this triumph, and as Roland reminisced about his witch army, he couldn't help but feel elated to the point where his mouth started to water. Anna suddenly appeared behind Roland on the ship deck, and he was caught off guard. Roland began to panic, frantically waving his hands around, and insisting that he wasn't doing anything. Anna smiled and handed over her handkerchief. As it so happened, Roland found himself spending the night in the company of witches. As darkness descended, Nightingale nestled to his right, while Anna slumbered peacefully on his left. Despite the cozy company, Roland found it challenging to drift off to sleep. It appears that Roland wasn't the only one struggling to catch some shut-eye that night. In a moment of kindness, he taught Anna a simple trick for falling asleep, counting sheep. Nightingale, on the other hand, watched on as Roland shared his knowledge and then pretended to sleep. However, the morning brought with it some unexpected consequences. Anna, Nightingale, and Roland all awoke with dark circles under their eyes, evidence of a restless night spent counting sheep. It seemed that the trick hadn't worked quite as well as Roland had hoped. Inside the largest tent at the campsite, the five noble families had gathered together, their faces etched with worry and fear. All eyes were fixed on Duke Ryan, who appeared equally troubled and pale-faced. The atmosphere in the tent was tense, with a sense of unease hanging heavily in the air. Duke Ryan turned to Ron, who had been at the forefront of the battlefield and demanded answers. What the hell happened out there? He asked, his voice tense and urgent. The other nobles in the tent looked on, their eyes fixed on Ron, waiting for an explanation. It was clear that everyone was shaken by the events that had transpired on the battlefield. Ron remained seated, his face buried in his hands as he spoke. All I heard was a deafening continuous rumbling sound. He said, his voice heavy with distress. And then they fell, one after another, especially after that final blast. Ron shook his head as if struggling to find the words to describe what he had witnessed. The knight leading the charge seemed to hit an invisible wall. He continued, his voice trembling. I watched in horror as his body convulsed before his head and limbs were violently torn apart into five pieces. As Count Moose raised the possibility of witchcraft, Duke Ryan was quick to dismiss the idea. He pointed out that all of the knights had been equipped with God Punishment Stones, which were known to render witches powerless. Duke Ryan shared his plan with the other nobles. He proposed that they regroup their troops and return to the Changu stronghold. From there, they would cut off all supplies going into the border town, effectively starving the town into surrendering. As the nobles discussed their plan, they were interrupted by an unfamiliar melody that filled the air. The sound was coming from a location not far from their tent. 
Before they could react, a deafening explosion shook the ground beneath their feet, causing the tent to shudder and flap wildly. As Duke Ryan rushed out of the tent, he saw that everyone was running in panic. The ground shook with the force of the explosion, and dirt and blood sprayed through the air. Looking towards the west, he saw a line of militiamen in uniform armor, standing silently outside the camp. Duke, quickly, we need to leave. One of his guards brought him a horse and yelled urgently. It was then that Duke Ryan snapped out of his daze. He mounted the horse and rode eastward with his guard, but they had barely left the campsite when they came face to face with another identical army. The soldiers wore identical armor and held strange short sticks in their hands. They stood in perfect formation, with identical expressions on their faces. Then, Duke Ryan heard a rhythmic melody coming from the opposite direction. The army of princes men led by Axe marched towards them with a uniform step. The army came to a sudden stop, as if choreographed with perfect precision, standing before Ryan like an impenetrable barrier. Then, to his horror, he saw them raise their weapons, short wooden sticks that looked innocent enough until he heard the deafening series of thuds that followed. As the Duke fearlessly approached the wall of soldiers, the pounding sounds reverberated through his body like a thunderous drumbeat. He staggered back, feeling the impact of each blow on his chest and stomach. Suddenly, a paralyzing weakness consumed him, causing his body to convulse and collapse off his horse. Despite his valiant efforts to speak, no words escaped his lips. His throat burned with a thick, sweet, and bloody fluid, leaving him gasping for air. In the end, darkness took him, enveloping him in an eerie silence. After the successful assassination of Duke Ryan, Roland and his men made their way towards the Changu stronghold. To their surprise, they encountered little resistance and were able to easily take control of the fortress. Now came the most exciting part, the looting process. The group meticulously searched through every nook and cranny of the castle, pillaging everything in their path. As they approached the treasure room, their hearts raced with anticipation. Inside, they found stacks upon stacks of gleaming gold, a treasure trove beyond their wildest dreams. Shortly after, Carter informed Roland that Petrov is requesting to meet him, as Petrov made his way to the castle district in the east, he realized that half an hour had already elapsed. It was then that he came across a group of unfamiliar militia standing in front of the Lord's castle. These soldiers were unlike any he had ever seen before, they were not adorned in polished armor or embellished with cloaks and ribbons. Instead, they held peculiar-looking short sticks with pointed spears affixed to the top. Despite their unorthodox weaponry, their disciplined formation in two neat rows exuded an air of menace and intimidation. Petrov already had planned for the worst, as Petrov entered the hall, he saw the fourth prince seated at the head of the table, scribbling something down. When the prince looked up and saw Petrov, he paused for a moment before breaking into a smile. Roland motioned for Petrov to take a seat, and Petrov breathed a sigh of relief knowing that his father was unharmed, having been one of the first to surrender. Grateful for Roland's mercy, Petrov offered to pay any amount of ransom to secure his father's release. However, Roland shook his head, indicating that he had no interest in gold. I want livestock and people. He said. Petrov was taken aback by the request. It's simple. Roland explained, handing Petrov a scroll. I want masons, carpenters, farmers, and serfs. You can use the values on the scroll to calculate, but the total must be at least 3,000. He smiled slyly. Oh, and by the way, since your father is the highest-ranking captive we have, his value is also the highest. Petrov couldn't believe what he was hearing. He had expected Roland to demand a hefty ransom, but instead, he was asking for laborers and peasants. Petrov's eyes widened at the sheer amount of livestock and people Roland demanded as ransom. He quickly calculated in his head that the requested value of 3,000 meant he would need to provide either 1,000 cattle or 300 skilled masons to secure his father's release. Petrov, a shrewd noble who was no stranger to the world of trade, was presented with an intriguing problem. He was given a limited number of cows and stonemasons, and tasked with finding the optimal solution to meet a target of 3,000 points while keeping costs to a minimum. 
The challenge was not an easy one, the various combinations of cows and stonemasons available presented countless possibilities, and finding the best one would require careful analysis and calculation. Roland held up one finger, indicating that he is only willing to give Petrov one day to make the calculation, and a week to arrange since Roland will only be staying here for less than a week. Petrov pondered about the time frame, but suddenly the prince's words shocked him, did the prince say he is leaving? Petrov's mind started racing, he know for a fact that Duke Ryan have fallen in battle, and the stronghold now belonged to the prince, why would he want to leave? Was this magnificent fortress not good enough for him? But no, that wasn't the point. The real issue was, if the prince left, who would manage this grand city? Petrov's mind raced with questions and concerns. He couldn't believe the prince would just abandon his newfound stronghold and all the opportunities it presented. Surely there was more to the story than what was on the surface. And yet, the reality remained, if the prince left, there would be chaos in the stronghold. Petrov couldn't let that happen. He had to find a way to convince the prince to stay, or at the very least, to appoint someone who could manage the city in his absence. Suddenly, a thought sprang to Petrov's mind, one that he knew he couldn't suppress any longer. Your Highness. Petrov swallowed hard and whispered. May I ask, does redeeming the Chang Ge stronghold also have a numerical value? Roland gazed at Petrov with a keen interest and suddenly burst into laughter. You're the first person to ask me that question in such a way, he said, taking a sip of his drink and speaking in a relaxed tone. Roland is not asking for a ransom, but rather, what he called the agency fees. Every month, Roland will be demanding 30% of taxable income from the Chang Ge stronghold and 1,000 value of resources, and the rest will belong to the agent. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Petrov, and he was determined not to let it slip away. Before Roland allowed Petrov to respond, he asked what Petrov would do to those who opposed him, what his estimate was for monthly tax income, what his plans and measures were for developing trade and commerce, and how he could guarantee a value of 1,000 resources. Petrov racked his brain to answer each question in this series, while the expression on his highness face grew increasingly satisfied. Finally, he clapped his hands and said, well done, that will be all for today. Once you have determined the ransom amount of 3,000, you may come and redeem the count. Rest assured, I will take good care of him during these days. After the questions, Petrov's brain was fried, and Carter helped him leave the room. Roland looked at Nightingale who had just appeared beside him. Well, he's telling the truth for the most part, she shrugged. Roland was surprised to find such talent, he thought all of the nobles only knew how to fight on horses. He found the name of Petrov Helmon on the list and lightly circled it with a quill pen. He leaned back in his chair, and Nightingale came up behind him and voluntarily began to massage his shoulders with her hands. Your Highness, are you really only staying here for a week? Nightingale asked. What's the matter? Roland closed his eyes and enjoyed the tingling sensation in his shoulders. Isn't this the largest city in the western region? She whispered. Don't you want to stay in this more prosperous place compared to the border town? Roland's smile widened as he considered the question. He knew the power dynamics at play within the Changu stronghold were complex, making it difficult for him to affect any major changes. However, that wasn't the real reason he had chosen to focus his efforts elsewhere. As Roland thoughtfully gazed off into the distance, he reflected on the fact that the church had deeply influenced the people of the stronghold, making it difficult for them to accept witches. His vision was to create a haven where witches could freely walk on the streets and live like normal people, and he knew that only the border town could achieve that. With a nod of agreement, Nightingale chimed in. You've kept your promise, your highness. Nightingale suddenly turned her back and patted her chest, as if she is preparing for something, she could feel her heart pounding, and Roland was taken aback by Nightingale's sudden action. He had been so focused on his paperwork that he had not noticed her approach. Before he could react, she had pulled him closer and given him a quick kiss on the lips. Roland felt his face grow warm as Nightingale disappeared into thin air, leaving him alone and stunned in his seat. Roland was about to take a nap when the castle welcomed a special guest, the high priest tailor of the Changu Stronghold Church. 
Roland instantly lost his drowsiness but still had a light blush on his cheeks from the earlier incident. The high priest Taylor is a middle-aged man who wears a white and blue ceremonial robe typical of the church. He is around 40 years old, and both his attire and appearance are immaculate. His manner of speaking and behavior resemble those of a courteous and refined nobleman. After Taylor bowed in greeting, Roland invited him to take a seat and instructed his attendant to serve tea. With a smile on his face, Taylor congratulated Roland on becoming the ruler of the western border and appeared unfazed by Duke Ryan's demise, showing little interest in who holds power. In his defense, the church seldom interferes in secular affairs. Roland then got straight to the point and asked about the purpose of Taylor's visit. Taylor had come to both congratulate Roland and offer his cooperation. He had offered to lend a hand in expanding Roland's territory and influence. Roland's expression turned into a frown. Didn't you just say that the church rarely intervenes in secular disputes? The high priest replied calmly, rarely intervening doesn't mean never interfering, the ongoing conflict between Garcia and Timothy has made the lives of the southern residents miserable. As long as you can provide your people with stability and peace, the church will recognize you as a worthy and respected ruler. Roland was taken aback for a moment, realizing that Taylor's offer to help expand his territory and influence was a veiled attempt to support his claim to the throne. The high priest seemed to possess a great deal of knowledge about Roland and the border town. He commended Roland's bravery in defending the town and protecting his people. Roland didn't believe the high priest's reasons for offering his help, but at least his words confirmed that the church was keeping a watchful eye on this remote corner of the world, even during the long, isolated winter months when the border town was cut off from the outside world by heavy snow. The high priest took out a box with two pills from his pocket, one red and one black. He went on to explain that these were crafted by the church's alchemy workshop. The red pill could temporarily enhance the strength of Roland's subordinates, while the black pill could increase their endurance to pain, cold, and heat several times over. Before the priest left, he said that this was just the tip of the iceberg the pills are just the beginning, and the church can offer much more help. Nightingale wasn't able to use her ability to spot whether the priest was lying since the priest was wearing a god punishment stone, but when Nightingale took a closer look at the two pills, the two pills are sort of like a god punishment stone, the cavity wasn't circular, but rather like a series of black threads flowing through it, but it doesn't resemble the effect of a god punishment stone, Roland carefully wrapped the pills in a piece of paper and tucked them into his pocket. Roland had a strong hunch that the church had ulterior motives. On the surface, it appeared that they sought to expand their reach by garnering more followers and creating a stable country. However, something felt off. Instead of throwing their weight behind Timothy or Garcia, who was actively striving to unify the country, the church chose to support Roland particularly after Garcia's decisive victory. The church's motives seemed self-serving, and while accepting their support may appear tempting, it could potentially worsen the already tumultuous conflict between the two kings of Grey Castle. The aftermath of such a scenario would be catastrophic, a rapid decline in population, the loss of wealth, and the flames of war engulfing the entire nation. The dream of unification would be delayed, perhaps indefinitely. It begs the question, what could the church possibly gain from such a destructive outcome? Rather than expanding their influence, they would likely face the destruction of their precious churches and a decline in their followers. It seemed a short-sighted and reckless decision. Roland had finally emptied the castle and fortress library, and he set out on his journey home aboard the little town. Roland had assigned Petrov's family to be in charge of the Changji stronghold. As Roland approached the border town along the Red Water River, the scenery on both sides of the river had changed. On the opposite side of the town, many people were busy working. Judging by their attire, they were likely the serfs who had been sent ahead to the border town, on the side closer to the endless mountains, many makeshift wooden sheds had been built. Roland guessed that these were the homes of the serfs' families. These people had been bound to the land for generations, and even their children were born into serfdom. With little hope, most lived numbly, driven not by a genuine desire to work but by the whip and chains of their masters. Undoubtedly, slavery was an enemy of industrialized production and a system that had to be abolished. 
However, Roland had no intention of waving his hand and making all of them free citizens. Instead, he aimed to provide a pathway that would offer them a glimmer of hope for upward mobility and the chance to become free citizens. Closing into the shore of the border town, enjoying the last bit of salty ocean breeze, Roland took a deep breath, a very unpleasant odor mixed in the air, wait for a second, holy shit, it's shit, it's actually shit, Roland vomited into the ocean and planned the most important changes to the border town. Returning to his office, Roland barked an order while holding a blueprint in his hand, he want to construct toilets and bathrooms. Toilet? Carter pondered for a moment. He said that the villagers don't need such facilities, they can just relieve themselves outside, the same goes for the serfs, they usually dispose of their waste into the river, allowing the water to carry it away. Roland realized it would be difficult to explain to them, as this was the norm for the people in this world. Carl took a closer look at the blueprint and asked the purpose of the pool in the back, Roland didn't hesitate and said he need to collect excrement. Both Barov and Carter were shocked to hear that His Highness wants to collect stools for farming. Imagine this, collecting the filthy dumps into buckets, spraying them onto the crops, then having them delivered onto the table where you put them into your mouth. Just thinking about it made the two vomit, the people in this different world have very little knowledge about fertilizers, and the vast majority of them believe that feces are a filthy substance that is only used to disgust others. They have never thought about its potential usefulness. Roland was well aware of the difficulties in using human and animal waste as fertilizer, which is far less convenient than chemical fertilizers. However, he had no clue about chemical industrialization, so he had to resort to using this purely natural organic fertilizer. As Roland drifted off into slumber, Nightingale materialized from the mist and gently tended to his bed, tucking in the sheets and covering his bare arm. She stood by his bedside, silently observing him for a fleeting moment, before tiptoeing across the creaky floorboards and disappearing into the shadows of her own room. You're still awake? Nightingale was taken aback to find Wendy seated by the bedside, engrossed in a book. I'm afraid you'll do something wrong. Wendy glared at her, shooting her a sharp look. His Highness is not a child, is it necessary to watch over him until he falls asleep? Roland had already sent people to spread rumors of a witch organization in the border town, Nightingale wanted to make sure that no one is there to harm Roland, Nightingale picked up a damp towel and casually wiped her face. She then proceeded to untie the red belt, wrist armor, and clasp of her outfit, before finally taking off the white clothes. This outfit was the prince's latest design, the combination of a white hooded overcoat and a white suit seemed incredibly conspicuous, but he thought it was perfect for an assassin. After carefully hanging up her clothes and smoothing out every crease, Nightingale's alluring curves were enveloped in a light veil, with not a trace of excess flesh visible on her toned abdomen and thighs. Did you even listen to what I said to you last time? Wendy sighed. Veronica, we are witches. I know, Wendy. Nightingale nodded. We are witches. Nightingale scooped up some water in her hands, in the reflection. She sees herself, in her heart. She knew that His Highness the Prince will marry a witch, he said it himself, and, he didn't lie. She jumped onto the bed, and lifted her slender legs together, flipping her body over to Wendy's side. Nightingale told Wendy about the priest's visit today, and the two pills Priest Taylor brought in, wondering if Wendy still had any memories about the church, hearing that the high priest of the church came to visit His Highness and expressed his willingness to support Roland in his bid for the throne. Wendy's tone started shaking, sounding nervously, asking what was Roland's response. Nightingale shook her head and reassured Wendy that Roland had denied the invite. Wendy let out a sigh of relief, Wendy closed her eyes and spoke slowly. She recalled the memories she had in the church, she lived in a monastery located in the old holy city. The place was surrounded by high walls, and there was no view other than the sky. Her daily activities were limited to the confines of the monastery. Living in the convent, the girls can be divided into three categories. Some, like Wendy, were born and raised here and have no knowledge of their origins. Others were taken in from the streets or orphanages by different churches and sent here, and some were sold to the church by their parents. They were taught how to read and write, etiquette, choir, and oratory. 
girls of the oratory class are sent out of the monastery once they reach adulthood. During the first few years, the girls would often hear the girls from the choir and etiquette class screaming at night, and Wendy didn't understand what was happening. It wasn't until Wendy moved up to the choir class that she found out that the adults from the church would visit the dormitories at night and take away a few girls from their beds, only to return them in the morning. Sometimes, not all of them would come back. Nightingale had never heard Wendy talk in detail about her experiences in the monastery before, so this was the first time she had heard about these things. Nightingale tightened her lips, she certainly knew what Wendy's words meant. Seeing Wendy terrified by the horrible memories, Nightingale hugged her tightly and comforted her. Wendy then continued her story, this kind of thing happened once or twice every month, and when it was more frequent, it happened almost every other day. Then one day, Wendy was chosen, Farian, Wendy's teacher dragged her out of the room and took her to a hidden building in a corner of the courtyard, Farian threw her inside and told her to endure it, then locked the door behind her. The room was brightly lit, and on the wall was another girl from her class, that was being tortured by five men. It was clear that these men have done very disturbing things to the girl on the wall, Wendy was visibly scared, her body shaking uncontrollably, she had her back against the wall, watching the five men walking towards her. Wendy slammed the door and screamed for help, but no one answered her calls, one of the men grabbed Wendy's hair and slammed her onto the wall. Grabbing her neck and just as he is about to harm Wendy, Wendy heard a loud crunch behind her, the girl suddenly broke free from her shackles and grabbed the neck of the person closest to her, killing him like twisting off a chicken's neck. The other man quickly surrounded her, but it was no use, even with God punishment stones, she killed them one by one. One of them had his limbs torn apart by her. Before he died, his last words were super awakening. The guards were drawn by the noise and scream, and rushed into the room, alongside was Farian, one of the guards drew his sword and swung at the girl, the church's standard armor was like paper in front of her, as she had already pierced through the chest with her bare hands. She then leaped into the air and killed the other guard, then struck a sword into Farian's body, the room was filled with gore and blood, as reinforcement arrived, the girl picked up the weapon of the fallen guards, she also cleaved another guard in half, the blade broken into several pieces. All of the guards were chasing after the girl, and Wendy managed to escape during the chaotic scenes. Wendy then spent the next two years homeless, but during a winter, she awakened and became a witch, she heard that the church was burnt down to cover up the incident, and the girl that saved her was not sure of her whereabouts. Nightingale sighed deeply and embraced Wendy. Now you have us. Sleep, Wendy. Wiping off the tear on Wendy, and hugged her tightly onto her chest.